Preface to the Old Regime in Canada. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Old Regime in Canada by Francis Parkman, Jr. Preface Note to Revised Edition When this book was written, I was unable to gain access to certain indispensable papers relating to the rival claimants to Acadia, La Tour and Dornay, and therefore deferred all attempts to treat that subject. The papers having at length come to hand, the missing chapters are supplied in the present edition, which also contains some additional matter of less prominence. The title of The Old Regime in Canada is derived from the third and principal of the three sections into which the book is divided. June the 16th, 1893. Preface The physiognomy of a government, says de Tocqueville, can be best judged in its colonies, for there its characteristic traits usually appear larger and more distinct. When I wish to judge of the spirits and the faults of the administration of Louis the Fourteenth, I must go to Canada. Its deformity is there seen as through a microscope. The monarchical administrations of France, at the height of its power, and at the moment of its supreme triumph, stretched an arm across the atlantic and grasped the north american continent this volume attempts to show by what methods it strove to make good its hold why it achieved a certain kind of success and why it failed at last the political system which has fallen and the antagonistic system which has prevailed seem at first sight to offer nothing but contrasts yet out of the tomb of canadian absolutionism come voices not without suggestion even to us extremes meet and autocracy and democracy often touch hands at least in their vices the means of knowing the canada of the past are ample the pen was always busy in this outpost of the old monarchy. The king and the minister demanded to know everything, and officials of high and low degree, soldiers and civilians, friends and foes, poured letters, dispatches and memorials on both sides of every question into the lap of government. These masses of paper have in the main survived the perils of revolutions, and the incendiary torch of the commune add them to the voluminous records of the supreme council of quebec and numerous other documents preserved in the civil and ecclesiastical depositories of canada the governments of new york and canada have caused a large part of the papers in the french archives related to their early history to be copied and brought to america and valuable contributions of material from the same quarter have been made by the state of massachusetts and by private canadian investigators nevertheless a great deal has still remained in france uncopied and unexplored in the course of several visits to that country i have availed myself of these supplementary papers as well as of those which had before been copied sparing neither time nor pains to explore every part of the field with the help of a system of classified notes i have collated the evidence of the various writers and set down without reserve all the results of the examination whether favourable or unfavourable some of them are of a character which i regret since they cannot be agreeable to persons for whom i have a very cordial regard the conclusions drawn from the facts may be matter of opinion, but it will be remembered that the facts themselves can be overthrown only by overthrowing the evidence on which they rest, 
or bringing forward counter evidence of equal or greater strength and neither task will be found an easy one i have received most valuable aid in my inquiries from the great knowledge and experience of monsieur pierre margri chief of the archives of the marine and colonies at paris i beg also warmly to acknowledge the kind offices of abbe henri raymond casgrain and grand vicar cazot of quebec together with those of james le moyne esq monsieur eugene tache the honorable p j o chevaux and other eminent canadians and henry harris esq the few extracts from original documents which are printed in the appendix may serve as samples of the material out of which the work has been constructed in some instances their testimony might be multiplied twentyfold when the place of deposit of the documents cited in the margin is not otherwise indicated they will in nearly all cases be found in the archives of the marine and colonies in the present book we examine the political and social machine in the next volume of the series we shall see this machine in action boston july the first eighteen seventy four end of preface the old regime in canada by francis parkman jr chapter one of the old regime in canada by francis parkman this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the old regime in canada by francis parkman jr chapter one the old regime in canada section first the feudal chiefs of acadia chapter one la tour and d'aunay with the opening of the seventeenth century began that contest for the ownership of north america which was to remain undecided for a century and a half england claimed the continent through the discovery by the cabos in fourteen ninety seven and fourteen ninety eight and france claimed it through the voyage of verrazzano in fifteen twenty four each resented the claim of the other and each snatched such fragments of the prize as she could reach and kept them if she could in sixteen o four henry the fourth of france gave to de Monts all america from the fortieth to the forty-sixth degree of north latitude including the sites of philadelphia on the one hand and montreal on the other while eight years after louis the thirteenth gave to madame de gaucheville and the jesuits the whole continent from florida to the st lawrence that is the whole of the future british colonies again in sixteen twenty one james i of england made over a part of this generous domain to a subject of his own sir william alexander to whom he gave under the name of nova scotia the peninsula which is now so called together with a vast adjacent wilderness to be held for ever as a fief of the scottish crown sir william not yet satisfied soon got an additional grant of the river and gulf of canada along with a belt of land three hundred miles wide reaching across the continent thus the king of france gave to frenchmen the sites of boston new york and washington and the king of england gave to a scotchman the sites of quebec and montreal but while the seeds of international war were thus sown broadcast over the continent an obscure corner of the vast regions in dispute became the scene of an intestine strife 
like the bloody conflicts of two feudal chiefs in the depths of the middle ages after the lawless inroads of argal the french with young biencourt at their head still kept a feeble hold on acadia after the death of his father poutrincourt biencourt took his name by which thenceforth he is usually known in his distress he lived much like an indian roaming the woods with a few followers and subsisting on fish game roots and lichens he seems however to have found means to build a small fort among the rocks and fogs of cape sable he named it fort le Marin, and here he appears to have maintained himself for a time by fishing and the fur trade many years before a french boy of fourteen years charles saint etienne de la tour was brought to acadia by his father claude de la tour where he became attached to the service of biencourt poutrincourt and as he himself says served as his ensign and lieutenant he says further that biencourt on his death left him all his property in acadia it was thus it seems that la tour became owner of fort le Marin and its dependencies at cape sable whereupon he begged the king to give him help against his enemies especially the english who as he thought meant to seize the country and he begged also for a commission to command in acadia for his majesty in fact sir william alexander soon tried to dispossess him and seize his fort charles de la tour's father had been captured at sea by the privateer kirk and carried to england here being a widower he married a lady of honour of the queen and being a protestant renounced his french allegiance alexander made him a baronet of nova scotia a new title which king james had authorized sir william to confer on persons of consideration aiding him in his work of colonizing acadia alexander now fitted out two ships with which he sent the elder latour to cape sable on arriving the father says the story made the most brilliant offers to his son if he would give up fort le Marin to the english to which young latour is reported to have answered in a burst of patriotism that he would take no favours except from his sovereign the king of france on this the english are said to have attacked the fort and to have been beaten off as the elder latour could not keep his promises to deliver the place to the english they would have no more to do with him on which his dutiful son offered him an asylum under condition that he should never enter the fort a house was built for him outside the ramparts and here the trader nicholas dennis found him in sixteen thirty five it is dennis who tells the above story which he probably got from the younger latour and which as he tells it is inconsistent with the known character of its pretended hero who was no model of loyalty to his king being a chameleon whose principles took the colour of his interests denise says further that the elder latour had been invested with the order of the garter and that the same dignity was offered to his son which is absurd the truth is that sir william alexander thinking that the two latours might be useful to him made them both baronets of nova scotia young latour while begging louis the thirteenth for a commission to command in acadia got from sir william alexander not only the title of baronet but also a large grant of land at and near cape sable to be held as a fief of the scottish crown 
again he got from the french king a grant of land on the river st john and to make assurance doubly sure got leave from sir william alexander to occupy it this he soon did and built a fort near the mouth of the river not far from the present city of st john meanwhile the french had made a lodgment on the rock of quebec and not many years after all north america from florida to the arctic circle and from newfoundland to the springs of the st lawrence was given by king louis to the company of new france with richelieu at its head sir william alexander jealous of this powerful rivalry caused a private expedition to be fitted out under the brothers kirk it succeeded and the french settlements in acadia and canada were transferred by conquest to england england soon gave them back by the treaty of saint germain and claude de razilly a knight of malta was charged to take possession of them in the name of king louis full powers were given him over the restored domains together with grants of acadian lands for himself razilly reached port royal in august sixteen thirty two with three hundred men and the scotch colony planted there by alexander gave up the place in obedience to an order from the king of england unfortunately for charles de la tour razilly brought with him an officer destined to become la tour's worst enemy this was charles de menu d'aunay charnazay a gentleman of birth and character who acted as his commander's man of trust and who in razilly's name presently took possession of such other feeble english and scotch settlements as had been begun by alexander or the people of new england along the coasts of nova scotia and maine this placed the french crown and the company of new france in sole possession for a time of the region then called acadia when acadia was restored to france latour's english title to his lands at cape sable became worthless he hastened to paris to fortify his position and suppressing his dallyings with england and sir william alexander he succeeded not only in getting an extensive grant of lands at cape sable but also the title of lieutenant-general for the king in fort le Moron and its dependencies and commander at cape sable for the company of new france Razilli, who represented the king in acadia died in sixteen eighty five and left his authority to d'aunay charnizay his relative and second in command d'aunay made his headquarters at port royal and nobody disputed his authority except latour who pretended to be independent of him in virtue of his commission from the crown and his grant from the company hence rose dissensions that grew at last into war the two rivals differed widely in position and qualities charles de menu seigneur d'aunay charnizay came of an old and distinguished family of touraine and he prided himself above all things on his character of gentilhomme francais charles saint etienne de la tour was of less conspicuous lineage in fact his father claude de la tour is said by his enemies to have been at one time so reduced in circumstances that he carried on the trade of a mason in rue saint germain at paris the son however is called gentilhomme d'une naissance distingue both in papers of the court and in a legal document drawn up in the interest of his children as he came to acadia when a boy he could have had little education and both he and d'aunay carried on trade which in france would have derogated from their claims as gentlemen 
though in america the fur trade was not held inconsistent with noblesse of latour's little kingdom at cape sable with its rocks fogs and breakers its seal haunted islets and iron-bound shores guarded by fort le Meron, we have but dim and uncertain glimpses after the death of biencourt latour is said to have roamed the woods with eighteen or twenty men living a vagabond life with no exercise of religion he himself admits that he was forced to live like the indians as did biencourt before him better times had come and he was now commander of fort le Meron, as he called it fort latour with a few frenchmen and abundance of micmac indians his next neighbor was the adventurer nicholas dennis who with a view to the timber trade had settled himself with twelve men on a small river a few leagues distant here razili had once made him a visit and was entertained under attentive boughs with a sylvan feast of wild pigeons brant teal woodcock snipe and larks cheered by profuse white wine and claret and followed by a dessert of wild raspberries on the other side of the acadian peninsula d'aunay reigned at port royal like a feudal lord which in fact he was dennis who did not like him says that he wanted only to rule and treated his settlers like slaves but this even if true at the time did not always remain so d'aunay went to france in sixteen forty one and brought out at his own charge twenty families to people his seigneury he had already brought out a wife having espoused jeanne molin or motin daughter of the seigneur de courcelles what with old settlers and new about forty families were gathered at port royal and on the river annapolis and over these d'aunay ruled like a feudal robinson crusoe he gave each colonist a farm charged with a perpetual rent of one sou an arpent or french acre the houses of the settlers were log cabins and the manor-house of their lord was a larger building of the same kind the most pressing need was of defence and d'aunay lost no time in repairing and reconstructing the old fort on the point between allen's river and the annapolis he helped his tenants at their work and his confessor describes him as returning to his rough manor-house on a wet day drenched with rain and bespattered with mud but in perfect good humour after helping some of the inhabitants to mark out a field the confessor declares that during the eleven months of his acquaintance with him he never heard him speak ill of anybody whatever a statement which must probably be taken with allowance yet this proud scion of a noble stock seems to have given himself with good grace to the rough labours of the frontiersman while father ignace the capuchin friar praises him for the merit transcendent in clerical eyes of constant attendance at mass and frequent confession with his neighbours the micmac indians he was on the best of terms he supplied their needs and they brought him the furs that enabled him in some measure to bear the heavy charges of an establishment that could not for many years be self-supporting in a single year the indians are said to have brought three thousand moose skins to port royal besides beaver and other valuable furs yet from a commercial point of view d'aunay did not prosper he had sold or mortgaged his estates in france borrowed large sums built ships bought cannon levied soldiers and brought over immigrants he is reported to have had three hundred fighting men at his principal station and sixty cannon mounted on his ships and forts for besides port royal he had two or three smaller establishments 
Port Royal was a scene for an artist, with its fort, its soldiers in breastplate and morion, armed with pike, halberd, or matchlock, its manor-house of logs, and its seminary of like construction, its twelve capuchin friars, with cowled heads, sandaled feet, and the cord of St. Francis, the birch canoes of Micmac and Abenaki Indians lying along the strand, and their feathered and painted owners lounging about the place or dozing around their wigwam fires. It was medievalism married to primeval savagery. The friars were supported by a fund supplied by Richelieu, and their chief business was to convert the Indians into vassals of France, the church, and the Chevalier d'Aunay. Hard by was a wooden chapel where the seigneur dealt in dutiful observance of every rite, and where, under a stone chiselled with his ancient scutcheon, one of his children lay buried. In the fort he had not forgotten to provide a dungeon for his enemies. The worst of these was Charles de la Tour. Before the time of Razili and his successor Dornay, la Tour had felt himself the chief man in Acadia, but now he was confronted by a rival higher in rank, superior in resources and court influence, proud, ambitious, and masterful. He was bitterly jealous of Dornay, and, to strengthen himself against so formidable a neighbor, he got from the Company of New France the grant of a tract of land at the mouth of the River St. John, where he built a fort and called it after his own name, though it was better known as Fort St. Jean. Thither he moved from his old post at Cape Sable, and Fort St. John now became his chief station. It confronted its rival, Port Royal, across the intervening Bay of Fundy. Now began a bitter feud between the two chiefs, each claiming lands occupied by the other. The court interposed to settle the dispute, but in its ignorance of Acadian geography, its definitions were so obscure that the question was more embroiled than ever. While the domestic feud of the rivals was gathering to a head, foreign heretics had fastened their clutches on various parts of the Atlantic coast which France and the Church claimed as their own. English heretics had made lodgment in Virginia, and Dutch heretics at the mouth of the Hudson, while other sectaries of the most malignant type had kenneled among the sands and pine trees of Plymouth, and others, still slightly different but equally venomous, had ensconced themselves on or near the small peninsula of Shawmut, at the head of La Grande Bay, or the Bay of Massachusetts. As it was not easy to dislodge them, the French dissembled for the present, yielded to the logic of events, and bided their time. But the interlopers soon began to swarm northward and invade the soil of Acadia, sacred to God and the King. Small parties from Plymouth built trading houses at Machias and what is now Castine on the Penobscot. As they were competitors in trade, no less than foes of God and King Louis, and as they were too few to resist, both Latour and Dornay resolved to expel them, and in 1638 Latour attacked the Plymouth trading house at Machias killed two of the five men he found there, carried off the other three, and seized all the goods. Two years later, Dornay attacked the Plymouth trading station at Penobscot, the Pentigoet of the French, and took it in the name of King Louis. That he might not appear in the part of a pirate, he set a price on the goods of the traders, and then, having seized them, gave in return his promise to pay at some convenient time if the owners could come to him for the money. He had called on Latour to help him in this raid against Penobscot, but Latour, 
unwilling to recognize his right to command, had refused, and had hoped that Dornay, becoming disgusted with his Acadian venture, which promised neither honor nor profit, would give it up, go back to France, and stay there. About the year 1688, Dornay did in fact go to France, but not to stay, for in due time he reappeared, bringing with him his bride, Jean Motin, who had had the courage to share his fortunes, and whom he now installed at Port Royal, a sure sign, as his rival thought, that he meant to make his home there. Disappointed and angry, La Tour now lost patience, went to Port Royal, and tried to stir Dornay's soldiers to mutiny, then set on his Indian friends to attack a boat in which was one of Dornay's soldiers and a Capuchin friar, the soldier being killed, though the friar escaped. This was the beginning of a quarrel waged partly at Port Royal and St. Jean, and partly before the Admiralty Court of Guyenne and the Royal Council partly with bullets and cannon shot, and partly with edicts, decrees, and procès verhau. As Dornay had taken a wife, so too would Latour, and he charged his agent de Jardin to bring him one from France. The agent acquitted himself of his delicate mission, and shipped to Acadia one Marie Jacquelin, daughter of a barber of mons if we may believe the questionable evidence of his rival be this as it may marie jacquelin proved a prodigy of metal and energy espoused her husband's cause with passionate vehemence and backed his quarrel like the intrepid amazon she was she joined la tour at fort saint jean and proved the most strenuous of allies about this time Dornay heard that the English of Plymouth meant to try to recover Penobscot from his hands. On this he sent nine soldiers thither, with provisions and munitions. Latour seized them on the way, carried them to Fort St. Jean, and according to his enemies treated them like slaves. Dornay heard nothing of this till four months after when being told of it by Indians, he sailed in person to Penobscot with two small vessels, reinforced the place, and was on his way back to Port Royal, when La Tour met him with two armed pinnaces. A fight took place, and one of Dornay's vessels was dismasted. He fought so well, however, that Captain Germain, his enemy's chief officer, was killed, and the rest, including Latour with his new wife and his agent, Desjardins, were forced to surrender, and were carried prisoners to Port Royal. At the request of the Capuchin friars, Dornay set them all at liberty, after compelling Latour to sign a promise to keep the peace in future. Both parties now laid their cases before the French courts and whether from the justice of his cause or from superior influence, Dornay prevailed. Latour's commission was revoked, and he was ordered to report himself in France to receive the king's commands. Trusting to his remoteness from the seat of power, and knowing that the king was often ill-served and worse informed, he did not obey, but remained in Acadia, exercising his authority as before. Dornay's father, from his house in Rue Saint-Germain, watched over his son's interests, and took care that Latour's conduct should not be unknown at court. A decree was thereupon issued directing Dornay to seize his rival's forts in the name of the king, and place them in charge of trusty persons. The order was precise, but Dornay had not at the time force enough to execute it and the frugal king sent him only six soldiers. Hence he could only show the royal order to Latour, and offer him a passage to France in one of his vessels, if he had the discretion to obey. 
latour refused on which d'aunay returned to france to report his rival's contumacy at about the same time latour's french agent sent him a vessel with succors the king ordered it to be seized but the order came too late for the vessel had already sailed from rochelle bound to fort st jean when d'aunay reported the audacious conduct of his enemy the royal council ordered that the offender should be brought prisoner to france and d'aunay as the king's lieutenant-general in acadia was again required to execute the decree la tour was now in the position of a rebel and all legality was on the side of his enemy who represented royalty itself d'aunay sailed at once for acadia and in august sixteen forty two anchored at the mouth of the st jean before la tour's fort and sent three gentlemen in a boat to read to its owner the decree of the council and the order of the king la tour snatched the papers crushed them between his hands abused the envoys roundly put them and their four sailors into prison and kept them there above a year his position was now desperate as he had placed himself in open revolt alarmed for the consequences he turned for help to the heretics of boston true catholics detested them as foes of god and man but latour was neither true catholic nor true protestant and would join hands with anybody who could serve his turn twice before he had made advances to the boston malignants and sent to them first one rocher and then one lestang with proposals of trade and alliance the envoys were treated with courtesy but could get no promise of active aid latour's agent de jardin had sent him from rochelle a ship called the saint clement manned by a hundred and forty huguenots laden with stores and munitions and commanded by captain mouron in due time latour at his fort st jean heard that the saint clement lay off the mouth of the river unable to get in because d'aunay blockaded the entrance with two armed ships and a pinnace on this he had resolved to appeal in person to the heretics he ran the blockade in a small boat under cover of night and accompanied by his wife boarded the saint clement and sailed for boston end of chapter one chapter two of the old regime in canada by francis parkman jr this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two sixteen forty three to sixteen forty five la tour and the puritans on the twelfth of june sixteen forty eight the people of the infant town of boston saw with some misgiving a french ship entering their harbour it chanced that the wife of captain edward gibbons with her children was on her way in a boat to a farm belonging to her husband on an island in the harbour one of latour's party who had before made a visit to boston and had been the guest of gibbons recognized his former hostess and he with latour and a few sailors cast off from the ship and went to speak to her in a boat that was towed at the stern of the st clement mrs gibbons seeing herself chased by a crew of outlandish foreigners took refuge on the island where fort winthrop was afterwards built which was then known as the governor's garden as it had an orchard a vineyard and many other conveniences the islands in the harbour most of which were at that time well wooded seem to have been favourite places of cultivation as sheep and cattle were there safe from those pests of the mainland the wolves latour no doubt to the dismay of mrs gibbons and her children 
landed after them and was presently met by the governor himself who with his wife two sons and a daughter-in-law had apparently rowed over to their garden for the unwonted recreation of an afternoon's outing latour made himself known to the governor and after mutual civilities told him that a ship bringing supplies from france had been stopped by his enemy d'aunay and that he had come to ask for help to raise the blockade and bring her to his fort winthrop replied that before answering he must consult the magistrates as mrs gibbons and her children were anxious to get home the governor sent them to town in his own boat promising to follow with his party in that of latour who had placed it at his disposal meanwhile the people of boston had heard of what was taking place and were in some anxiety since in a truly british distrust of all frenchmen they feared lest their governor might be kidnapped and held for ransom some of them accordingly took arms and came in three boats to the rescue in fact remarks winthrop if latour had been ill-minded towards us he had such an opportunity as we hope neither he nor any other shall ever have the like again the castle or fort which was on another island hard by was defenceless its feeble garrison having been lately withdrawn and its cannon might easily have been turned on the town boston now in its thirteenth year was a straggling village with houses principally boards or logs gathered about a plain wooden meeting-house which formed the heart or vital organ of the place the rough peninsula on which the infant settlement stood was almost void of trees and was crowned by a hill split into three summits whence the name of tremont or trimount still retained by a street of the present city beyond the narrow neck of the peninsula were several smaller villages with outlying farms but the mainland was for the most part a primeval forest possessed by its original owners wolves bears and rattlesnakes these last undesirable neighbours made their favourite haunt on a high rocky hill called rattlesnake hill not far inland where down to the present generation they were often seen and where good specimens may occasionally be found to this day far worse than wolves or rattlesnakes were the piquot indians a warlike race who had boasted that they would wipe the whites from the face of the earth but who by hard marching and fighting had lately been brought to reason worse than wolves rattlesnakes and indians together were the theological quarrels that threatened to kill the colony in its infancy children are taught that the puritans came to new england in search of religious liberty the liberty they sought was for themselves alone it was the liberty to worship in their own way and to prevent all others from doing the like they imagined that they held a monopoly of religious truth and were bound in conscience to defend it against all comers their mission was to build up a western canaan ruled by the law of god to keep it pure from error and if need were purge it of heresy by persecution to which ends they set up one of the most detestable theocracies on record church and state were joined in one church members alone had the right to vote there was no choice but to remain politically a cipher or embrace or pretend to embrace the extremist dogmas of calvin never was such a premium offered to cant and hypocrisy yet in the early days hypocrisy was rare so intense and pervading was the faith of the founders of new england it was in the churches themselves the appointed sentinels and defenders of orthodoxy that heresy lifted its head and threatened the state with disruption 
where minds different in complexion and character were continually busied with subtle questions of theology unity of opinion could not long be maintained and innovation found a champion in one mrs hutchinson a woman of great controversial ability and inexhaustible fluency of tongue persons of a mystical turn of mind or a natural inclination to contrariety were drawn to her preachings and the church of boston with three or four exceptions went over to her in a body sanctification justification revelations the covenant of grace and the covenant of works mixed in furious battle with all the subtleties sophistries and venom of theological war while the ghastly spectre of antinomianism hovered over the fray carrying terror to the souls of the faithful the embers of the strife still burned hot when latour appeared to bring another firebrand as a papist or idolater though a mild one he was sorely prejudiced in puritan eyes while his plundering of the plymouth trading-house some years before and killing two of its five tenants did not tend to produce impressions in his favour but it being explained that all five were drunk and had begun the fray by firing on the french the ire against him cooled a little landing with winthrop he was received under the hospitable roof of captain gibbons whose wife had recovered from her fright at his approach he went to church on sunday and the gravity of his demeanour gave great satisfaction a solemn carriage being of itself a virtue in puritan eyes hence he was well treated and his men were permitted to come ashore daily in small numbers the stated training day of the boston militia fell in the next week and latour asked leave to exercise his soldiers with the rest this was granted and escorted by the boston trained band about forty of them marched to the muster field which was probably the common a large tract of pasture land in which was a marshy pool the former home of a colony of frogs perhaps not quite exterminated by the sticks and stones of puritan boys this pool cleaned paved and curbed with granite preserves to this day the memory of its ancient inhabitants and is still the frog pond though bereft of frogs the boston trained band in steel caps and buff coats went through its exercise and the visitors we are told expressed high approval when the drill was finished the boston officers invited latour's officers to dine while his rank and file were entertained in like manner by the puritan soldiers there were more exercises in the afternoon and this time it was the turn of the french who says winthrop were very expert in all their postures and motions a certain judicious minister in dread of popish conspiracies was troubled in spirit at this martial display and prophesied that a store of blood would be spilled in boston a prediction that was not fulfilled although an incident took place which startled some of the spectators the french suddenly made a sham charge sword in hand which the women took for a real one the alarm was soon over and as this demonstration ended the performance latour asked leave of the governor to withdraw his men to their ship the leave being granted they fired a salute and marched to the wharf where their boat lay escorted as before by the boston trained band during the whole of latour's visit he and winthrop went amicably to church together every sunday the governor being attended on these and all other occasions while the strangers were in town by a guard of honour of musketeers and halberd men latour and his chief officers had their lodging and meals in the houses of the principal townsmen and all seemed harmony and good will latour meanwhile had laid his request before the magistrates 
and produced among other papers the commission to moron captain of his ship dated in the last april and signed and sealed by the vice-admiral of france authorizing moron to bring supplies to latour whom the paper styled lieutenant-general for the king in acadia latour also showed a letter genuine or forged from the agent of the company of new france addressed to him as lieutenant-general and warning him to beware of d'aunay from all which the boston magistrates inferred that their petitioner was on good terms with the french government notwithstanding a letter sent them by d'aunay the year before assuring them that latour was a proclaimed rebel which in fact he was throughout this affair one is perplexed by the french official papers whose entanglements and contradictions in regard to the acadian rivals are past unravelling latour asked only for such help as would enable him to bring his own ship to his own fort and as his papers seemed to prove that he was a recognized officer of his king winthrop and the magistrates thought that they might permit him to hire such ships and men as were disposed to join him latour had tried to pass himself as a protestant but his professions were distrusted notwithstanding the patience with which he had listened to the long-winded sermon of the reverend john cotton as to his wife however there seemed to have been but one opinion she was approved as a sound protestant of excellent virtues and her denunciations of d'aunay no doubt fortified the prejudice which was already strong against him for his seizure of the plymouth trading-house at penobscot and for his aggressive and masterful character which made him an inconvenient neighbour with the permission of the governor and the approval of most of the magistrates latour now made a bargain with his host captain gibbons and a merchant named thomas hawkins they agreed to furnish him with four vessels to arm each of these with four to fourteen small cannon and man them with a certain number of sailors latour himself completing the crews with englishmen hired at his own charge hawkins was to command the whole the four vessels were to escort latour and his ship the st clement to the mouth of the st john in spite of d'aunay and all other opponents the agreement ran for two months and latour was to pay two hundred and fifty pounds sterling a month for the use of the four ships and mortgage to gibbon and hawkins his fort and all his acadian property as security winthrop would give no commissions to hawkins or to any others engaged in the expedition and they were all forbidden to fight except in self-defence but the agreement contained the significant clause that all plunder was to be equally divided according to rule in such enterprises hence it seems clear that the contractors had an eye to booty yet no means were used to hold them to their good behaviour now rose a brisk dispute and the conduct of winthrop was sharply criticised letters poured in upon him concerning great dangers sin upon the conscience and the like he himself was clearly in doubt as to the course he was taking and he soon called another meeting of magistrates in which the inevitable clergy were invited to join and they all fell to discussing the matter anew as every man of them had studied the bible daily from childhood up texts were the chief weapons of the debate doubts were advanced as to whether christians could lawfully help idolaters and jehoshaphat ahab and josias were brought forward as cases in point then solomon was cited to the effect that he that meddleth with the strife that belongs not to him takes a dog by the ear 
to which it was answered that the quarrel did belong to us seeing that providence now offered us the means to weaken our enemy d'aunay without much expense or trouble to ourselves besides we ought to help a neighbour in distress seeing that joshua helped the gibeonites and jehoshaphat helped jehoram against moab with the approval of elisha the opposing party argued that by aiding papists we advance and strengthen popery to which it was replied that the opposite effect might follow since the grateful papist touched by our charity might be won to the true faith and turned from his idols then the debate continued on the more worldly grounds of expediency and statecraft and at last winthrop's action was approved by the majority still there were many doubters and the governor was severely blamed john endicott wrote to him that latour was not to be trusted and that he and d'aunay had better be left to fight it out between them since if we help the former to put down his enemy he will be a bad neighbour to us presently came a joint letter from several chief men of the colony saltonstall bradstreet nathaniel ward john norton and others saying in substance we fear international law has been ill observed the merits of the case are not clear we are not called upon in charity to help latour see two chronicles nineteen two and proverbs twenty six seventeen this quarrel is for england and france and not for us if d'aunay is not completely put down we shall have endless trouble and he that loses his life in an unnecessary quarrel dies the devil's martyr this letter known as the ipswich letter touched winthrop to the quick he thought that it trenched on his official dignity and the asperity of his answer betrays his sensitiveness he calls the remonstrance an act of an exorbitant nature and says that it blows a trumpet to division and dissension if my neighbour is in trouble he goes on to say i must help him he maintains that there is great difference between giving permission to hire to guard or transport and giving commission to fight and he adds the usual bible text the fear of man bringeth a snare but whoso putteth his trust in the lord shall be safe in spite of winthrop's reply the ipswich letter had great effect and he and the boston magistrates were much blamed especially in the country towns the governor was too candid not to admit that he had been in fault though he limits his self-accusation to three points first that he had given latour an answer too hastily next that he had not sufficiently consulted the elders or ministers and lastly that he had not opened the discussions with prayer the upshot was that latour and his allies sailed on the fourteenth of july d'aunay's three vessels fled before them to port royal latour tried to persuade his puritan friends to join him in an attack but hawkins the english commander would give no order to that effect on which about thirty of the boston men volunteered for the adventure d'aunay's followers had ensconced themselves in a fortified mill whence they were driven with some loss after burning the mill and robbing a pinnace loaded with furs the puritans returned home having broken their orders and compromised their colony in the next summer latour expecting a serious attack from d'aunay who had lately been to france and was said to be on his way back with large reinforcements turned again to massachusetts for help the governor this time was john endicott of salem to salem the suppliant repaired and as endicott spoke french the conference was easy the rugged bigot 
had before expressed his disapproval of having anything to do with these idolatrous french but according to hubbard he was so moved with compassion at the woeful tale of his visitor that he called a meeting of magistrates and ministers to consider if anything could be done for him the magistrates had by this time learned caution and the meeting would do nothing but write a letter to dornay demanding satisfaction for his seizure of penobscot and other aggressions and declaring that the men who escorted latour to his fort in the last summer had no commission from massachusetts yet that if they had wronged him he should have justice though if he seized any new england trading vessels they would hold him answerable in short latour's petition was not granted Dornay, when in france had persuaded his litigation against his rival and the royal council had ordered that the contumacious latour should be seized his goods confiscated and he himself brought home a prisoner which decree Dornay was empowered to execute if he could he had returned to acadia the accredited agent of the royal will it was reported at boston that a biscayan pirate had sunk his ship on the way but the wish was farther to the thought and the report proved false dornay arrived safely and was justly incensed at the support given by the puritans in the last year to his enemy but he too had strong reasons for wishing to be on good terms with his heretic neighbours king louis moreover had charged him not to offend them since when they helped latour they had done so in the belief that he was commissioned as lieutenant-general for the king and therefore they should be held blameless hence dornay made overtures of peace and friendship to the boston puritans early in october sixteen forty four they were visited by one monsieur marie supposed said the chronicle to be a friar but habited like a gentleman he was probably one of the capuchins who formed an important part of dornay's establishment at port royal the governor and magistrates received him with due consideration and along with credentials from dornay he showed them papers under the great seal of france wherein the decree of the royal council was set forth in full latour condemned as a rebel and traitor and orders given to arrest both him and his wife henceforth there was no room to doubt which of the rival chiefs had the king and the law on his side the envoy while complaining of the aid given to latour offered terms of peace to the governor and magistrates who replied to his complaints with their usual subterfuge that they had given no commission to those who had aided latour declaring at the same time that they could make no treaty without the concurrence of the commissioners of the united colonies they then desired marie to set down his proposals in writing on which he went to the house of one mr fowl where he lodged and drew up in french his plan for a treaty adding the proposal that the postonians should join dornay against latour then he came back to the place of meeting and discussed the subject for half a day sometimes in latin with the magistrates and sometimes in french with the governor that old soldier being probably ill-versed in the classic tongues in vain they all urged that dornay should come to terms with latour marie replied that if latour would give himself up his life would be spared but that if he were caught he would lose his head as a traitor adding that his wife was worse than he being the mainspring of his rebellion endicott and the magistrates refused active alliance but the talk ended in a provisional treaty of peace duly drawn up in latin marie keeping one copy and the governor the other the agreement needed ratification by the commissioners of the united colonies on one part and by dornay on the other 
what is most curious in the affair is the attitude of massachusetts which from first to last figures as an independent state with no reference to the king under whose charter it was building up its theocratic republic and consulting none but the infant confederacy of the new england colonies of which it was itself the head as the commissioners of the confederacy were not then in session endicott and the magistrates took the matter provisionally into their own hands marie had made good dispatch for he reached boston on a friday and left it on the next tuesday having finished his business in about three days or rather two as one of the three was the sabbath he expressed surprise and gratification at the attention and courtesy with which he had been treated his hosts supplied him with horses and some of them accompanied him to salem where he had left his vessel and whence he sailed for port royal well pleased just before he came to boston that town had received a visit from madame de la tour who soon after her husband's successful negotiation with winthrop in the past year had sailed for france in the ship st clement she had labored strenuously in latour's case but the influence of d'aunay's partisans was far too strong and being charged with complicity in her husband's misconduct she was forbidden to leave france on pain of death she set the royal command at naught escaped to england took passage in a ship bound for america and after long delay landed at boston the english shipmaster had bargained to carry her to her husband at fort st jean but he broke his bond and was sentenced by the massachusetts courts to pay her two thousand pounds as damages she was permitted to hire three armed vessels then lying in the harbour to convey her to fort st jean where she arrived safely and rejoined la tour meanwhile d'aunay was hovering off the coast armed with the final and conclusive decree of the royal council which placed both husband and wife under the ban and enjoined him to execute its sentence but a resort to force was costly and of doubtful result and d'aunay resolved again to try the effect of persuasion approaching the mouth of the st john he sent to the fort two boats commanded by his lieutenant who carried letters from his chief promising to latour's men pardon for their past conduct and payment of all wages due them if they would return to their duty an adherent of d'aunay declares that they received those advances with insults and curses it was a little time before this that madame de la tour arrived from boston the same writer says that she fell into a transport of fury behaved like one possessed with a devil and heaped contempt on the catholic faith in the presence of her husband who approved everything she did and he further affirms that she so berated and reviled the recollect friars in the fort that they refused to stay and set out for port royal in the depth of winter taking with them eight soldiers of the fort who were too good catholics to remain in such a nest of heresy and rebellion they were permitted to go and were provided with an old pinnace and two barrels of indian corn with which, unfortunately for La Tour, they safely reached their destination. On her arrival from Boston, Madame de La Tour had given her husband a piece of politic advice. Her enemies say that she had some time before renounced her faith to gain the favour of the Puritans, but there is reason to believe that she had been a Huguenot from the first. She now advised La Tour to go to Boston declare himself a protestant ask for a minister to preach to his men and promise that if the bostonians would help him to master d'aunay and conquer acadia he would share the conquest with them latour admired the sagacious counsels of his wife and sailed for boston 
to put them in practice just before the friars and the eight deserters sailed for port royal thus leaving their departure unopposed at port royal both friars and deserters found a warm welcome d'aunay paid the eight soldiers their long arrears of wages and lodged the friars in the seminary with his capuchins then he questioned them and was well rewarded they told him that latour had gone to boston leaving his wife with only forty-five men to defend the fort here was a golden opportunity d'aunay called his officers to council all were of one mind he mustered every man about port royal and embarked them in the armed ship of three hundred tons that had brought him from france he then crossed the bay of fundy with all his force anchored in a small harbour a league from fort st john and sent the recollet pere andre to try to seduce more of latour's men an attempt which proved a failure d'aunay lay two months at his anchorage during which time another ship and a pinnace joined him from port royal then he resolved to make an attack meanwhile latour had persuaded a boston merchant to send one grafton to fort st john in a small vessel loaded with provisions and bringing also a letter to madame de la tour containing a promise from her husband that he would join her in a month when the boston vessel appeared at the mouth of the st john d'aunay seized it placed grafton and the few men with him on an island and finally supplied them with a leaky sailboat to make their way home as they best could d'aunay now landed two cannon to batter fort st john on the land side and on the seventeenth of april having brought his largest ship within pistol shot of the water rampart he summoned the garrison to surrender they answered with a volley of cannon shot then hung out a red flag and according to d'aunay's reporter shouted a thousand insults and blasphemies towards evening a breach was made in the wall and d'aunay ordered a general assault animated by their intrepid mistress the defenders fought with desperation and killed or wounded many of the assailants not without severe loss on their own side numbers prevailed at last all resistance was overcome the survivors of the garrison were made prisoners and the fort was pillaged madame de la tour her maid and another woman who were all of their sex in the place were among the captives also madame de la tour's son a mere child d'aunay pardoned some of his prisoners but hanged the greater part to serve as an example to posterity says his reporter nicholas dennis declares that he compelled madame de la tour to witness the execution with a halter about her neck but the more trustworthy accounts say nothing of this alleged outrage on the next day the eighteenth of april the bodies of the dead were decently buried an inventory was made of the contents of the fort and d'aunay set his men to repair it for his own use these labours occupied three weeks or more during a part of which madame de la tour was left at liberty till being detected in an attempt to correspond with her husband by means of an indian she was put into confinement on which according to d'aunay's reporter she fell ill with spite and rage and died within three weeks after as he tells us renouncing her heresy in the chapel of the fort end of chapter two chapter three of the old regime in canada by francis parkman jr this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three sixteen forty five to seventeen ten the victor vanquished having triumphed over his rival 
Dornay was left free to settle his accounts with the Massachusetts Puritans, who had offended him anew by sending provisions to Fort St. Jean, having always insisted that they were free to trade with either party. They, on their side, were no less indignant with him for his seizure of Grafton's vessel and harsh treatment of him and his men. After some preliminary negotiation and some rather sharp correspondence, Dornay, in September 1646, sent a pinnace to Boston bearing his former envoy, Marie, accompanied by his own secretary and one Monsieur Louis. It was Sunday, the Puritan Sabbath, when the three envoys arrived, and the pious inhabitants were preparing for the afternoon sermon. Marie and his two colleagues were met at the wharf by two militia officers, and conducted through the silent and dreary streets to the house of Captain, now Major Gibbons, who seems to have taken upon himself in an especial manner the office of entertaining strangers of consequence. All was done with much civility, but no ceremony, for the Lord's Day must be kept inviolate. Winthrop, who had again been chosen governor, now sent an officer with a guard of musketeers to invite the envoys to his own house. Here he regaled them with wine and sweetmeats, and then informed them of our manner that all men either come to our public meetings or keep themselves quiet in their houses. He then laid before them such books in Latin and French as he had, and told them that they were free to walk in his garden. Though the diversion offered was no doubt of the dullest, since the literary resources of the colony then included little beside arid theology, and the walk in the garden promised but moderate delights among the bitter pot-herbs provided against days of fasting, the victims resigned themselves with good grace, and as the governor tells us, gave no offence. Sunset came at last, and set the captives free. On Monday both sides fell to business. The envoys showed their credentials, but as the commissioners of the United Colonies were not yet in session, nothing conclusive could be done till Tuesday. Then, all being assembled, each party made its complaints of the conduct of the other, and a long discussion followed. Meals were provided for the three visitors at the ordinary, or inn, where the magistrates dined during the sessions of the general court. The governor, as their host, always sat with them at the board, and strained his Latin to do honour to his guests. They, on their part, that courtesies should be evenly divided, went every morning at eight o'clock to the governor's house, whence he accompanied them to the place of meeting, and at night he, or some of the commissioners in his stead, attended them to their lodgings at the house of Major Gibbons. Serious questions were raised on both sides, but as both wanted peace, explanations were mutually made and accepted. The chief difficulty lay in the undeniable fact that in escorting La Tour to his fort in 1643, the Massachusetts volunteered had chased Dawney to Port Royal, killed some of his men, burned his mill, and robbed his pinnace, for which wrongs the envoys demanded heavy damages. It was true that the governor and magistrates had forbidden acts of aggression on the part of the volunteers, but on the other hand they had had reason to believe that their prohibition would be disregarded, and had taken no measures to enforce it. The envoys clearly had good ground of complaint, and here, says Winthrop, they did stick two days. At last they yielded so far as to declare that what Dornay wanted was not so much compensation in money as satisfaction to his honour 
by an acknowledgment of their fault on the part of the massachusetts authorities and they further declared that he would accept a moderate present in token of such acknowledgment the difficulty now was to find such a present the representatives of massachusetts presently bethought themselves of a very fair new sedan which the viceroy of mexico had sent to his sister and which had been captured in the west indies by one captain cromwell a corsair who gave it to our governor winthrop to whom it was entirely useless gladly parted with it in such a cause and the sedan being graciously accepted ended the discussion the treaty was signed in duplicate by the commissioners of the united colonies and the envoys of Dornay, and peace at last was concluded. The conference had been conducted with much courtesy on both sides. One small cloud appeared, but soon passed away. The French envoys displayed the fleur-de-lis at the masthead of their pinnace as she lay in the harbour. The townsmen were incensed, and Monsieur Marie was told that to fly foreign colours in Boston Harbour was not according to custom. He insisted for a time, but at length ordered the offending flag to be lowered. On the 28th of September, the envoys bade farewell to Winthrop, who had accompanied them to their pinnace with a guard of honour. Five cannons saluted them from Boston five from the castle and three from charlestown a supply of mutton and a keg of sherry were sent on board their vessel and then after firing an answering salute from their swivels they stood down the bay till their sails disappeared among the islands latour had now no more to hope from his late supporters he had lost his fort and what was worse he had lost his indomitable wife. Throughout the winter that followed his disaster, he had been entertained by Samuel Maverick at his house on Noddle's Island. In the spring he begged hard for further help, and as he begged in vain, he sailed for Newfoundland to make the same petition to Sir David Kirk, who then governed that island. Kirk refused but lent him a pinnace and sent him back to boston here some merchants had the good nature or folly to entrust him with goods for the indian trade to the amount of four hundred pounds thus equipped he sailed for acadia in kirk's pinnace manned with his own followers and five new england men on reaching cape sable he conspired with the master of the pinnace and his own men to seize the vessel and set the new england sailors ashore which was done latour it is said shooting one of them in the face with a pistol it was winter and the outcasts roamed along the shore for a fortnight half frozen and half starved till they were met by micmac indians who gave them food and a boat in which by rare good fortune they reached boston where their story convinced the most infatuated that they had harboured a knave whereby solemnly observes the pious but much mortified winthrop who had been latour's best friend it appeared as the scripture saith that there is no confidence in an unfaithful or carnal man. When the capture of Fort St. John was known at court, the young king was well pleased, and promised to send Dornay the gift of a ship, but he forgot to keep his word, and requited his faithful subject with the less costly reward of praises and honours. After a preamble reciting his merits, and especially his care courage and valour in taking by our express order and reducing again under our authority the fort on the st john which latour had rebelliously occupied with the aid of foreign sectaries the king 
confirms Dornay's authority in Acadia and extends it on paper from the St. Lawrence to Virginia, empowering him to keep for himself such parts of this broad domain as he might want and grant out the rest to others who were to hold of him as vassals he could build forts and cities at his own expense command by land and sea make war or peace within the limits of his grant appoint officers of government justice and police and in short exercise sovereign power with the simple reservation of homage to the king and a tenth part of all gold silver and copper to the royal treasury a full monopoly of the fur trade throughout his dominion was conferred on him and any infringement of it was to be punished by confiscation of ships and goods and thirty thousand livres of damages on his part he was enjoined to establish the name power and authority of the king subject the nations to his rule and teach them the knowledge of the true god and the light of the christian faith acadia in short was made a hereditary fief and dornay and his heirs became lords of a domain as large as a european kingdom dornay had spent his substance in the task of civilizing a wilderness the king had not helped him and though he belonged to a caste which held commerce in contempt he must be a fur trader or a bankrupt latour's fort st jean was a better trading station than port royal and it had woefully abridged dornay's profits hence an ignoble competition in beaver skins had greatly embittered their quarrel all this was over fort st jean the best trading stand in acadia was now in its conqueror's hands and his monopoly was no longer a mere name but a reality everything promised a thriving trade and a growing colony when the scene was suddenly changed on the twenty fourth of may sixteen fifty a dark and stormy day dornay and his valet were in a birch canoe in the basin of port royal not far from the mouth of the annapolis perhaps neither master nor man was skilled in the management of the treacherous craft that bore them the canoe overset dornay and the valet clung to it and got astride of it one at each end there they sat sunk to the shoulders the canoe though under water having buoyancy enough to keep them from sinking farther so they remained an hour and a half and at the end of that time dornay was dead not from drowning but from cold for the water still retained the chill of winter the valet remained alive and in this condition they were found by indians and brought to the north shore of the annapolis where their father ignace the superior of the capuchins went to find the body of his patron brought it to the fort and buried it in the chapel in presence of his wife and all the soldiers and inhabitants the father superior highly praises the dead chief and is astonished that the earth does not gape and devour the slanderers who say that he died in desperation as one abandoned of god he admits that in former times cavillers might have found wherewith to accuse him but declares that before his death he had amended all his faults this is the testimony of a capuchin whose fraternity he had always favoured the recollets on the other hand whose patron was latour complained that dornay had ill-used them and demanded redress he seems to have been a favourable example of his class loyal to his faith and his king tempering pride with courtesy and generally true to his cherished ideal of the gentilhomme francais in his qualities as in his birth 
he was far above his rival and his death was the ruin of the only french colony in acadia that deserved the name as the news of his enemy's fate a new hope possessed latour he still had agents in france interested to serve him while the father of d'aunay who acted as his attorney was feeble with age and his children were too young to defend their interests there is an extraordinary document bearing date february sixteen fifty one or less than a year after d'aunay's death it is a complete reversal of the decree of 1647 in his favour. Latour suddenly appears as the favourite of royalty, and all the graces before lavished on his enemy are now heaped upon him. The lately proscribed rebel and traitor is confirmed as governor and lieutenant-general in New France, his services to God and the King are rehearsed as of our certain knowledge, and he is praised with the same emphasis used towards Dornay in the decree of 1647, and almost in the same words. The paper goes on to say that he, Latour, would have converted the Indians and conquered Acadia for the King if Dornay had not prevented him unless this document is a fabrication in the interest of latour as there is some reason to believe it suggests strange reflections on colonial administration during the minority of louis the fourteenth genuine or not latour profited by it and after a visit to france which proved a successful and fruitful one he returned to acadia with revived hopes the widow of D'Aunay had eight children, all minors, and their grandfather, the octogenarian René de Menou, had been appointed their guardian. He sent an incompetent and faithless person to Port Royal to fulfil the wardship of which he was no longer capable. The unfortunate widow and her children needed better help. D'Aunay had employed as his agent one Le Bourne, a merchant of Rochelle, who now succeeded in getting the old man under his influence, and induced him to sign an acknowledgment said to be false, that Dornay's heirs owed him two hundred and sixty thousand livres. Le Bourne next came to Port Royal to push his schemes and here he inveigled or frightened the widow into signing a paper to the effect that she and her children owed him two hundred and five thousand two hundred and eighty six livres it was fortunate for his unscrupulous plans that he had to do with the soft and tractable madame d'aunay and not with the high-spirited and intelligent amazon madame latour Le Bourne now seized on Port Royal as security for the alleged debts, while Latour, on his return from his visit to France, induced the perplexed and helpless widow to restore to him Fort St. Jean, conquered by her late husband. Madame Dornay, beset with insidious enemies, saw herself and her children in danger of total ruin, she applied to the duc de vendome grand master chief and superintendent of navigation and offered to share all her acadian claims with him if he would help her in her distress but from the first vendome looked more to his own interests than to hers latour was not satisfied with her concessions to him and perplexing questions rose between them touching land claims and the fur trade to end these troubles she took a desperate step and on the twenty fourth of february sixteen fifty eight married her tormentor the foe of her late husband who had now been dead not quite three years her chief thought seems to have been for her children whose rights are guarded though to little purpose in the marriage contract 
she and latour took up their abode at fort st john of the children of her first marriage four were boys and four were girls they were ruined at last by the harpies leagued to plunder them and sought refuge in france where the boys were all killed in the wars of louis the fourteenth and at least three of the girls became nuns now following complicated disputes without dignity or interest and turning chiefly on the fur trade le borne and his son in virtue of their claims on the estate of dornay which were sustained by the french courts got a lion's share of acadia a part fell also to latour and his children by his new wife while nicholas dennis kept a feeble hold on the shore of the gulf of st lawrence as far north as cape rosiers war again broke out between france and england and in sixteen fifty four major robert sedgwick of charlestown massachusetts who had served in the civil war as a major general of cromwell led a small new england force to acadia under a commission from the protector captured fort st jean port royal and all the other french stations and conquered the colony for england it was restored to france by the treaty of breda and captured again in sixteen ninety by sir william phipps the treaty of ryswick again restored it to france till in seventeen ten it was finally seized for england by general nicholson when after sedgwick's expedition the english were in possession of acadia latour not for the first time tried to fortify his claims by a british title and jointly with thomas temple and william crown obtained a grant of the colony from cromwell though he soon after sold his share to his co-partner temple he seems to have died in sixteen sixty six descendants of his were living in acadia in eighteen eighty and some may probably still be found there as for dornay no trace of his blood is left in the land where he gave wealth and life for france and the church End of chapter three Chapter Four, Part One of the Old Regime in Canada, by Francis Parkman Jr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section Second, Canada A Mission, Chapter Four, Part One, sixteen fifty three to sixteen fifty eight, the Jesuits at Onondaga. In the summer of sixteen fifty three, all Canada turned to fasting and penance processions vows and supplications the saints and the virgin were beset with unceasing prayer the wretched little colony was like some puny garrison starving and sick compassioned with inveterate foes supplies cut off and succor hopeless at montreal the advance guard of the settlements a sort of castle dangerous held by about fifty frenchmen and said by a pious writer of the day to exist only by a continuous miracle some two hundred iroquois fell upon twenty-six frenchmen the christians were outmatched eight to one but says the chronicle the queen of heaven was on their side and the son of mary refuses nothing to his holy mother through her intercession the iroquois shot so wildly that at their first fire every bullet missed its mark and they met with a bloody defeat the palisaded settlement of three rivers though in position less exposed than that of montreal was in no less jeopardy a noted war chief of the mohawk iroquois had been captured here the year before and put to death and his tribe swarmed out like a nest of angry hornets to revenge him not content with defeating and killing the commandant 
du plessis beauchart they encamped during the winter in the neighboring forest watching for an opportunity to surprise the place hunger drove them off but they returned in the spring infesting every field and pathway till at length some six hundred of their warriors landed in secret and lay hidden in the depths of the woods silently biding their time having failed however in an artifice designed to lure the frenchmen out of their defences they showed themselves on all sides plundering burning and destroying up to the palisades of the fort of the three settlements which with their feeble dependencies then comprised the whole of canada quebec was least exposed to indian attacks being partially covered by montreal and three rivers nevertheless there was no safety this year even under the cannon of fort st louis at cap rouge a few miles above the Jesuit Poncet saw a poor woman who had a patch of corn beside her cabin, but could find nobody to harvest it. The father went to seek aid, met one Mathurin Franchito, whom he persuaded to undertake the charitable task, and was returning with him when they both fell into an ambuscade of Iroquois, who seized them and dragged them off thirty-two men embarked in canoes at quebec to follow the retreating savages and rescue the prisoners pushing rapidly up the st lawrence they approached the three rivers found it beset by the mohawks and bravely threw themselves into it to the great joy of its defenders and discouragement of the assailants meanwhile the intercession of the virgin wrought new marvels at montreal and a bright ray of hope beamed forth from the darkness and the storm to cheer the hearts of her votaries it was on the twenty sixth of june that sixty of the onondaga iroquois appeared in sight of the fort shouting from a distance that they came on an errand of peace and asking for safe conduct for some of their number guns scalping knives tomahawks were all laid aside and with a confidence truly astonishing a deputation of chiefs naked and defenceless came into the middle of those whom they had betrayed so often the french had a mind to seize them and pay them in kind for past treachery but they refrained seeing in this wondrous change of heart the manifest hand of heaven nevertheless it can be explained without a miracle the iroquois or at least the western nations of their league had just become involved in a war with their neighbors the eries and one war at a time was the sage maxim of their policy all was smiles and blandishment in the fort at montreal presents were exchanged and the deputies departed beaming home golden reports of the french at oneida deputations soon followed but the enraged mohawks still infested montreal and the beleaguered three rivers till one of their principal chiefs and four of their best warriors were captured by a party of christian hurons then seeing themselves abandoned by the other nations of the league and left to wage the war alone they too made overtures for peace a grand council was held at quebec speeches were made and wampum belts exchanged the iroquois left some of their chief men as pledges of sincerity and two young soldiers offered themselves as reciprocal pledges on the part of the french the war was over at last canada had found a moment to take breath for the next struggle the fur trade was restored again with promise of plenty for the beaver profiting by the quarrels of their human foes had of late greatly multiplied it was a change from death to life for canada lived on the beaver and robbed of this her only sustenance had been dying slowly since the strife began yesterday writes father le mercier all was dejection and gloom 
Today all is smiles and gaiety. On Wednesday, massacre, burning, and pillage. On Thursday, gifts and visits as among friends. If the Iroquois have their hidden designs, so too has God. On the day of the visitation of the Holy Virgin, the chief, Aon Tarazati, so regretted by the Iroquois, was taken prisoner by our Indians, instructed by our fathers, and baptized. And on the same day, being put to death, he ascended to heaven. I doubt not that he thanked the Virgin for his misfortune and the blessing that followed, and that he prayed to God for his countrymen. The people of Montreal made a solemn vow to celebrate publicly the fate of this mother of all blessings, whereupon the Iroquois come to ask for peace. It was on the day of the assumption of this queen of angels and of men that the Hurons took at Montreal that other famous Iroquois chief, whose capture caused the Mohawks to seek our alliance. On the day when the church honors the nativity of the Holy Virgin, the Iroquois granted Father Ponset his life, and he, rather the Holy Virgin and the Holy Angels, labored so well in the work of peace, that on St. Michael's Day it was resolved in a council of the elders that the father should be conducted to Quebec, and a lasting treaty made with the French. Happy as was this consummation, Father Ponset's path to it had been a thorny one. He has left us his own rueful story, written in obedience to the command of his superior. He and his companion in misery had been hurried through the forests, from Cap Rouge on the St. Lawrence to the Indian towns on the Mohawk. He tells us how he slept among dank weeds, dropping with the cold dew, how frightful colics assailed him as he waded waist-deep through a mountain stream, how one of his feet was blistered and one of his legs benumbed, how an Indian snatched away his reliquary and lost the precious contents. I had, he says, a picture of St. Ignatius with Our Lord bearing the cross, and another of Our Lady of Pity surrounded by the five wounds of her son. They were my joy and my consolation, but I hid them in a bush, lest the Indians should laugh at them. He kept, however, a little image of the crown of thorns, in which he found great comfort, as well as in communion with his patron saints, St. Raphael, St. Martha, and St. Joseph. On one occasion he asked these celestial friends for something to soothe his thirst, and for a bowl of broth to revive his strength. Scarcely had he framed the petition when an Indian gave him some wild plums, and in the evening, as he lay fainting on the ground, another brought him the coveted broth. Weary and forlorn, he reached at last the lower Mohawk town where, after being stripped and with his companion forced to run the gauntlet, he was placed on a scaffold of bark, surrounded by a crowd of grinning and mocking savages. As it began to rain, they took him into one of the lodges and amused themselves by making him dance, sing, and perform various fantastic tricks for their amusement. He seems to have done his best to please them, but adds the chronicler, I will say in passing that as he did not succeed to their liking in these buffooneries, singeries, they would have put him to death if a young Huron prisoner had not offered himself to sing, dance, and make wry faces in place of the father who had never learned the trade. Having sufficiently amused themselves, they left him for a time in peace, when an old, one-eyed Indian approached, took his hands, examined them, selecting the left forefinger, and calling a child four or five years old, gave him a knife and told him to cut it off. 
which the imp proceeded to do his victim meanwhile singing the vexilla regis after this preliminary they would have burned him like franchetot his unfortunate companion had not a squaw happily adopted him in place as he says of a deceased brother he was installed at once in the lodge of his new relatives where bereft of every rag of christian clothing and attired in leggings moccasins and a greasy shirt the astonished father saw himself transformed into an iroquois but his deliverance was at hand a special agreement providing for it had formed a part of the treaty concluded at quebec and he now learned that he was to be restored to his countrymen after a march of almost intolerable hardship he saw himself once more among christians heaven as he modestly thinks having found him unworthy of martyrdom at last he writes we reached montreal on the twenty first of october the nine weeks of my captivity being accomplished in honour of saint michael and all the holy angels on the sixth of november the iroquois who conducted me made their presence to confirm the peace and thus on a sunday evening eighty and one days after my capture that is to say nine times nine days this great business of the peace was happily concluded the holy angels showing by this number nine which is specially dedicated to them the part they bore in this holy work this incessant supernaturalism is the key to the early history of new france peace was made but would peace endure there was little chance of it and this for several reasons first the native fickleness of the iroquois who astute and politic to a surprising degree were in certain respects like all savages mere grown-up children next their total want of control over their fierce and capricious young warriors any one of whom could break the peace with impunity whenever he saw fit and above all the strong probability that the iroquois had made peace in order under cover of it to butcher or kidnap the unhappy remnant of the hurons who were living under french protection on the island of orleans immediately below quebec i have already told the story of the destruction of this people and of the jesuit missions established among them the conquerors were eager to complete their bloody triumph by seizing upon the refugees of orleans killing the elders and strengthening their own tribes by the adoption of the women children and youths the mohawks and the onondagas were competitors for the prize each coveted the huron colony and each was jealous lest his rival should pounce upon it first when the mohawks brought home ponce they covertly gave wampum belts to the huron chiefs and invited them to remove to their villages it was the wolf's invitation to the lamb the hurons aghast with terror went secretly to the jesuits and told them that demons had whispered in their ears an invitation to destruction so helpless were both the hurons and their french supporters that they saw no recourse but dissimulation the hurons promised to go and only sought excuses to gain time the onondagas had a deeper plan their towns were already full of huron captives former converts of the jesuits cherishing their memory and constantly repeating their praises hence their tyrants conceived the idea that by placing at onondaga a colony of frenchmen under the direction of these beloved fathers the hurons of orleans disarmed of suspicion might readily be led to join them 
other motives as we shall see tended to the same end and the onondaga deputies begged or rather demanded that a colony of frenchmen should be sent among them here was a dilemma was not this like the mohawk invitation to the hurons an invitation to butchery on the other hand to refuse would probably kindle the war afresh the jesuits had long nursed a project bold to temerity their great huron mission was ruined but might not another be built up among the authors of this ruin and the iroquois themselves tamed by the power of the faith be annexed to the kingdoms of heaven and of france thus would peace be restored to canada a barrier of fire opposed to the dutch and english heretics and the power of the jesuits vastly increased yet the time was hardly ripe for such an attempt before thrusting a head into the tiger's jaws it would be well to try the effect of thrusting in a hand they resolved to compromise with the danger and before risking a colony at onondaga to send thither an envoy who could soothe the indians confirm them in pacific designs and pave the way for more decisive steps the choice fell on father simon le moyne the errand was mainly a political one and this sagacious and able priest versed in indian languages and customs was well suited to do it on the second day of the month of july the festival of the visitation of the most holy virgin ever favourable to our enterprises father simon le moyne set out from quebec for the country of the onondaga iroquois in these words does father le mercier chronicle the departure of his brother jesuit scarcely was he gone when a band of mohawks under a doubtable half-breed known as the flemish bastard arrived at quebec and when they heard that the envoy was to go to the onondagas without visiting their tribe they took the imagined slight in high dudgeon displaying such jealousy and ire that a letter was sent after le moyne directing him to proceed to the mohawk towns before his return but he was already beyond reach and the angry mohawks were left to digest their wrath at montreal le moyne took a canoe a young frenchman and two or three indians and began the tumultuous journey of the upper st lawrence nature or habit had taught him to love the wilderness life he and his companions had struggled all day against the surges of la chine and were bivouacked at evening by the lake of st louis when a cloud of mosquitoes fell upon them followed by a shower of warm rain the father stretched under a tree seems clearly to have enjoyed himself it is a pleasure he writes the sweetest and most innocent imaginable to have no other shelter than trees planted by nature since the creation of the world sometimes during their journey this primitive tent proved insufficient and they would build a bark hut or find a partial shelter under their inverted canoe now they glided smoothly over the sunny bosom of the calm and smiling river and now strained every nerve to fight their slow way against the rapids dragging their canoe upward in the shallow water by the shore as one leads an unwilling horse by the bridle or shouldering it and bearing it through the forest to the smoother current above game abounded and they saw great herds of elk quietly defiling between the water and the woods with little need of men who in that perilous region found employment enough in hunting one another at the entrance of lake ontario they met a party of iroquois fishermen who proved friendly and guided them on their way ascending the onondaga they neared their destination 
and now all misgivings as to their reception at the iroquois capital were dispelled the inhabitants came to meet them bringing roasting ears of the young maize and bread made of its pulp than which they knew no luxury more exquisite their faces beamed welcome le moyne was astonished i never he says saw the like among indians before they were flattered by his visit and for the moment were glad to see him they hoped for great advantages from the residence of frenchmen among them and having the eerie war on their hands they wished for peace with canada one would call me brother writes le moyne another uncle another cousin i never had so many relations he was overjoyed to find that many of the huron converts who had long been captives at onondaga had not forgotten the teachings of their jesuit instructors such influence as they had with their conquerors was sure to be exerted in behalf of the french deputies of the senecas cayugas and oneidas at length arrived and on the tenth of august the criers passed through the town summoning all to hear the words of onontio the naked dignitaries sitting squatting or lying at full length thronged the smoky hall of council the father knelt and prayed in a loud voice invoking the aid of heaven cursing the demons who are spirits of discord and calling on the tutelar angels of the country to open the ears of his listeners then he opened a packet of presents and began his speech i was full two hours he says in making it speaking in the tone of a chief and walking to and fro after their fashion like an actor on a theatre not only did he imitate the prolonged accents of the iroquois orators but he adapted and improved their figures of speech and addressed them in turn by their respective tribes bands and families calling their men of note by name as if he had been born among them they were delighted and their ejaculations of approval ho 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 came thick and fast at every pause of his harangue especially were they pleased with the eighth ninth tenth and eleventh presents whereby the reverend speaker gave to the four upper nations of the league four hatchets to strike their new enemies the eries while by another present he metaphorically daubed their faces with the war-paint however it may have suited the character of a christian priest to hound on these savage hordes to a war of extermination which they had themselves provoked it is certain that as a politician le moyne did wisely since in the war with the eries lay the best hope of peace for the french the reply of the indian orator was friendly to overflowing he prayed his french brethren to choose a spot on the lake of onondaga where they might dwell in the country of the iroquois as they dwelt already in their hearts le moyne promised and made two presents to confirm the pledge then his mission fulfilled he set out on his return attended by a troop of indians as he approached the lake his escort showed him a large spring of water possessed as they all told him by a bad spirit le moyne tasted it then boiled a little of it and produced a quantity of excellent salt he had discovered the famous salt springs of onondaga fishing and hunting the party pursued their way till at the noon of the seventh of september le moyne reached montreal when he reached quebec his tidings cheered for a while the anxious hearts of its tenants but an unwonted incident soon told them how hollow was the ground beneath their feet le moyne accompanied by two onondagas and several hurons and algonquins
was returning to montreal when he and his companions were set upon by a war party of mohawks the hurons and algonquins were killed one of the onondagas shared their fate and the other with le moyne himself was seized and bound fast the captive onondaga however was so loud in his threats and denunciations that the mohawks released both him and the jesuit there was a foreshadowing of civil war mohawk against onondaga iroquois against iroquois the quarrel was patched up but fresh provocations were imminent the mohawks took no part in the erie war and hence their hands were free to fight the french and the tribes allied with them reckless of their promises they began a series of butcheries fell upon the french at isle aux oy killed a lay brother of the jesuits at sillery and attacked montreal here being roughly handled they came for a time to their senses and offered terms promising to spare the french but declaring that they would still wage war against the hurons and algonquins these were allies whom the french were pledged to protect but so helpless was the colony that the insolent and humiliating proffer was accepted and another peace ensued as hollow as the last the indefatigable Le Moyne was sent to the Mohawk towns to confirm it. So far, says the chronicle, as it is possible to confirm a peace made by infidels backed by heretics. The Mohawks received him with great rejoicing, yet his life was not safe for a moment. A warrior feigning madness raved through the town with uplifted hatchet, howling for his blood but the saints watched over him and balked the machinations of hell he came off alive and returned to montreal spent with famine and fatigue meanwhile a deputation of eighteen onondaga chiefs arrived at quebec there was a grand council the onondagas demanded a colony of frenchmen to dwell among them Lauzon, the governor, dared neither to consent nor to refuse. A middle course was chosen, and two Jesuits, Chaumineau and Dablon, were sent, like Le Moyne, partly to gain time, partly to reconnoitre, and partly to confirm the Onondagas in such good intentions as they might entertain. Chaumineau was a veteran of the Huron mission, who, miraculously, as he himself supposed, had acquired a great fluency in the huron tongue which is closely allied to that of the iroquois dablon a newcomer spoke as yet no indian their voyage up the st lawrence was enlivened by an extraordinary bear hunt and by the antics of one of their indian attendants who having dreamed that he had swallowed a frog roused the whole camp by the gymnastics with which he tried to rid himself of the intruder on approaching onondaga they were met by a chief who sang a song of welcome a part of which he seasoned with touches of humour apostrophizing the fish in the river onondaga naming each sort great or small and calling on them in turn to come into the nets of the frenchmen and sacrifice life cheerfully for their behoof hereupon there was much laughter among the indian auditors an unwonted cleanliness reigned in the town the streets had been cleared of refuse and the arched roofs of the long houses of bark were covered with red-skinned children staring at the entry of the black robes crowds followed behind and all was jubilation the dignitaries of the tribe met them on the way and greeted them with a speech of welcome a feast of bear's meat awaited them but unhappily it was friday and the fathers were forced to abstain on monday the fifteenth of november at nine in the morning after having secretly sent to paradise a dying infant by the waters of baptism all the elders and the people having assembled 
we opened the council by public prayer thus writes father dablon his colleague chaumonot a frenchman bred in italy now rose with a long belt of wampum in his hand and proceeded to make so effective a display of his rhetorical gifts that the indians were lost in admiration and their orators put to the blush by his improvements on their own metaphors if he had spoken all day said the delighted auditors we should not have had enough of it the dutch added others have neither brains nor tongues if they never tell us about paradise and hell on the contrary they lead us into bad ways on the next day the chiefs returned their answer the council opened with a song or chant which was divided into six parts and which according to dablon was exceedingly well sung the burden of the fifth part was as follows farewell war farewell tomahawk we have been fools till now henceforth we will be brothers yes we will be brothers then came four presents the third of which enraptured the fathers it was a belt of seven thousand beads of wampum but this says dablon was as nothing to the words that accompanied it it is the gift of the faith said the orator it is to tell you that we are believers it is to beg you not to tire of instructing us have patience seeing that we are so dull in learning prayer push it into our heads and our hearts then he led chaumono into the midst of the assembly clasped him in his arms tied the belt about his waist and protested with a suspicious redundancy of words that as he clasped the father so would he clasp the faith what had wrought this sudden change of heart the eagerness of the onondagas that the french should settle among them had no doubt a large share in it for the rest the two jesuits saw abundant signs of the fierce uncertain nature of those with whom they were dealing eerie prisoners were brought in and tortured before their eyes one of them being a young stoic of about ten years who endured his fate without a single outcry huron women and children taken in war and adopted by their captors were killed on the slightest provocation and sometimes from mere caprice for several days the town was in an uproar with the crazy follies of the dream feast and one of the fathers nearly lost his life in this indian bedlam end of chapter four part one Chapter Four, Part Two of the Old Regime in Canada, by Francis Parkman Jr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four, Part Two. One point was clear: the French must make a settlement at Onondaga, and that speedily. Or, despite their professions of brotherhood, the Onondagas would make war their attitude became menacing from urgency they passed to threats and the two priests felt that the critical posture of affairs must at once be reported at quebec but here a difficulty arose it was the beaver hunting season and eager as were the indians for a french colony not one of them would offer to conduct the jesuits to quebec in order to fetch one it was not until nine masses had been said to st john the baptist that a number of indians consented to forego their hunting and escort father dablon home chaumonot remained at onondaga to watch his dangerous hosts and soothe their rising jealousies it was the second of march when dablon began his journey his constitution must have been of iron or he would have succumbed to the appalling hardships of the way 
it was neither winter nor spring the lakes and streams were not yet open but the half-thawed ice gave way beneath the foot one of the indians fell through and was drowned swamp and forest were clogged with sodden snow and ceaseless rains drenched them as they toiled on knee-deep in slush happily the st lawrence was open they found an old wooden canoe by the shore embarked and reached montreal after a journey of four weeks dablon descended to quebec there was a long and anxious council in the chambers of fort st louis the jesuits had information that if the demands of the onondagas were rejected they would join the mohawks to destroy canada but why were they so eager for a colony of frenchmen did they want them as hostages that they might attack the hurons and algonquins without risk of french interference or would they massacre them and then like tigers mad with the taste of blood turn upon the helpless settlements of the st lawrence an abyss yawned on either hand lauzon the governor was in an agony of indecision but at length he declared for the lesser and remoter peril and gave his voice for the colony the jesuits were of the same mind though it was they and not he who must bear the brunt of danger the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church said one of them and if we die by the fires of the iroquois we shall have won eternal life by snatching souls from the fires of hell preparation was begun at once the expense fell on the jesuits and the outfit is said to have cost them seven thousand livres a heavy sum for canada at that day a pious gentleman zachary dupoy major of the fort of quebec joined the expedition with ten soldiers and between thirty and forty other frenchmen also enrolled themselves impelled by devotion or destitution four jesuits le mercier the superior with dablon menard and fremin besides two lay brothers of the order formed as it were the pivot of the enterprise the governor made them the grant of a hundred square leagues of land in the heart of the iroquois country a preposterous act which had the iroquois known it would have rekindled the war but lauzon had a mania for land grants and was himself the proprietor of vast domains which he could have occupied only at the cost of his scalp embarked in two large boats and followed by twelve canoes filled with hurons onondagas and a few senecas lately arrived they set out on the seventeenth of may to attack the demons as le mercier writes in their very stronghold with shouts tears and benedictions priests soldiers and inhabitants waved farewell from the strand they passed the bare steeps of cape diamond and the mission house nestled beneath the heights of sillery and vanished from the anxious eyes that watched the last gleam of their receding oars meanwhile three hundred mohawk warriors had taken the war-path bent on killing or kidnapping the hurons of orleans when they heard of the departure of the colonists for onondaga their rage was unbounded for not only were they full of jealousy towards their onondaga confederates but they had hitherto derived great profit from the control which their local position gave them over the traffic between this tribe and the dutch of the hudson upon whom the onondagas in common with all the upper iroquois had been dependent for their guns hatchets scalping knives beads blankets and brandy these supplies would now be furnished by the french and the mohawk speculators saw their occupation gone nevertheless they had just made peace with the french 
and for the moment were not quite in the mood to break it to wreak their spite they took a middle course crouched in ambush among the bushes at point st croix ten or twelve leagues above quebec allowed the boats bearing the french to pass unmolested and fired a volley at the canoes in the rear filled with onondagas senecas and hurons then they fell upon them with a yell and after wounding a lay brother of the jesuits who was among them bound and flogged such of the indians as they could seize the astonished onondagas protested and threatened whereupon the mohawks feigned great surprise declared that they had mistaken them for hurons called them brothers and suffered the whole party to escape without further injury the three hundred marauders now paddled their large canoes of elm bark stealthily down the current passed quebec undiscovered in the dark night of the nineteenth of may landed in early morning on the island of orleans and ambushed themselves to surprise the hurons as they came to labor in their cornfields they were tolerably successful killed six and captured more than eighty the rest taking refuge in their fort where the mohawks dared not attack them at noon the french on the rock of quebec saw forty canoes approaching from the island of orleans and defiling with insolent parade in front of the town all crowded with the mohawks and their prisoners among whom were a great number of huron girls their captors as they passed forced them to sing and dance the hurons were the allies or rather the wards of the french who were in every way pledged to protect them yet the cannon of fort st louis were silent and the crowd stood gaping in bewilderment and fright had an attack been made nothing but a complete success and the capture of many prisoners to serve as hostages could have prevented the enraged mohawks from taking their revenge on the onondaga colonists the emergency demanded a prompt and clear-sighted soldier the governor lauzon was a gray-haired civilian who however enterprising as a speculator in wild lands was in no way matched to the desperate crisis of the hour some of the mohawks landed above and below the town and plundered the houses from which the scared inhabitants had fled not a soldier stirred and not a gun was fired the french bullied by a horde of naked savages became an object of contempt to their own allies the mohawks carried their prisoners home burned six of them and adopted or rather enslaved the rest meanwhile the onondaga colonists pursued their perilous way at montreal they exchanged their heavy boats for canoes and resumed their journey with a flotilla of twenty of these sylvan vessels a few days after the indians of the party had the satisfaction of pillaging a small band of mohawk hunters in vicarious reprisal for their own wrongs on the twenty sixth of june as they neared lake ontario they heard a loud and lamentable voice from the edge of the forest whereupon having beaten their drum to show that they were frenchmen they beheld a spectral figure lean and covered with scars which proved to be a pious huron one joachim ondacote captured by the mohawks in their descent on the island of orleans five or six weeks before they had carried him to their village and begun to torture him after which they tied him fast and lay down to sleep thinking to resume their pleasure on the morrow his cuts and burns being only on the surface he had the good fortune to free himself from his bonds and naked as he was to escape to the woods he held his course northwestward through regions even now a wilderness gathered wild strawberries to sustain life 
and in fifteen days reached the st lawrence nearly dead with exhaustion the frenchman gave him food and a canoe and the living skeleton paddled with a light heart for quebec the colonists themselves soon began to suffer from hunger their fishing failed on lake ontario and they were forced to content themselves with cranberries of the last year gathered in the meadows of their indians all but five deserted them the father superior fell ill and when they reached the mouth of the oswego many of the starving frenchmen had completely lost heart weary and faint they dragged their canoes up the rapids when suddenly they were cheered by the sight of a stranger canoe swiftly descending the current the onondagas aware of their approach had sent it to meet them laden with indian corn and fresh salmon two more canoes followed freighted like the first and now all was abundance till they reached their journey's end the lake of onondaga it lay before them in the july sun a glittering mirror framed in forest verdure they knew that chaumonot with a crowd of indians was awaiting them at a spot on the margin of the water which he and dablon had chosen as the site of their settlement landing on the strand they fired to give notice of their approach five small cannon which they had brought in their canoes waves woods and hills resounded with the thunder of their miniature artillery then re-embarking they advanced in order four canoes abreast towards the destined spot in front floated their banner of white silk embroidered in large letters with the name of jesus here were dupois and his soldiers with the picturesque uniforms and quaint weapons of their time their mercier and his jesuits in robes of black hunters and bushrangers indians painted and feathered for a festal day as they neared the place where a spring bubbling from the hillside is still known as the jesuits well they saw the edge of the forest dark with the muster of savages whose yells of welcome answered the salvo of their guns happily for them a flood of summer rain saved them from the harangues of the onondaga orators and forced white men and red alike to seek such shelter as they could find their hosts with hospitable intent would fain have sung and danced all night but the frenchmen pleaded fatigue and the courteous savages squatting around their tents chanted in monotonous tones to lull them to sleep in the morning they woke refreshed sang te deum reared an altar and with a solemn mass took possession of the country in the name of jesus three things which they saw or heard of in their new home excited their astonishment the first was the vast flight of wild pigeons which in spring darkened the air around the lake of onondaga the second was the salt springs of salina the third was the rattlesnakes which le mercier describes with excellent precision adding that as he learns from the indians their tails are good for toothache and their flesh for fever these reptiles for reasons best known to themselves haunted the neighbourhood of the salt springs but did not intrude their presence into the abode of the french on the seventeenth of july le mercier and chaumonot escorted by a file of soldiers set out for onondaga scarcely five leagues distant they followed the indian trail under the leafy arches of the woods by hill and hollow still swamp and gurgling brook till through the opening foliage they saw the iroquois capital compassed with cornfields and girt with its rugged palisade as the jesuits like black spectres issued from the shadows of the forest followed by the plumed soldiers with the shouldered arquebuses the red-skinned population swarmed out like bees 
and they defiled to the town through grazing and admiring throngs all conspired to welcome them feast followed feast throughout the afternoon till what with harangues and songs bear's meat beaver tails and venison beans corn and grease they were well nigh killed with kindness if after this they murder us writes le mercier it will be from fickleness not premeditated treachery but the jesuits it seems had not sounded the depth of iroquois dissimulation there was one exception to the real or pretended joy some mohawks were in the town and their orator was insolent and sarcastic but the ready tongue of chamonot turned the laugh against him and put him to shame here burned the council fire of the iroquois and at this time the deputies of the five tribes were assembling the session opened on the twenty fourth in the great council house on the earthen floor and the broad platforms beneath the smoke begrimed concave of the bark roof stood sat or squatted the wisdom and valor of the confederacy mohawks oneidas onondagas cayugas and senecas sachems councillors orators warriors fresh from eerie victories tall stalwart figures limbed like grecian statues the pressing business of the council over it was chamonot's turn to speak but first all the frenchmen kneeling in a row with clasped hands sang the veni creator amid the silent admiration of the auditors then chaumonot rose with an immense wampum belt in his hand and said it is not trade that brings us here do you think that your beaver skins can pay us for all our toils and dangers keep them if you like or if any fall into our hands we shall use them only for your service we seek not the things that perish it is for the faith that we have left our homes to live in your hovels of bark and eat food which the beasts of our country would scarcely touch we are the messengers whom god has sent to tell you that his son became a man for the love of you that this man the son of god is the prince and master of men that he has prepared in heaven eternal joys for those who obey him and kindled the fires of hell for those who will not receive his word if you reject it whoever you are onondaga seneca mohawk cayuga or oneida know that jesus christ who inspires my heart and my voice will plunge you one day into hell avert this ruin be not the authors of your own destruction accept the truth listen to the voice of the omnipotent such in brief was the pith of the father's exhortation as he spoke indian like a native and as his voice and gestures answered to his words we may believe what le mercier tells us that his hearers listened with mingled wonder admiration and terror the work was well begun the jesuits struck while the iron was hot built a small chapel for the mass installed themselves in the town and preached and catechized from morning till night the frenchmen at the lake were not idle the chosen site of their settlement was the crown of a hill commanding a broad view of waters and forests the axemen fell to their work and a ghastly wound soon gaped in the green bosom of the woodland here among the stumps and prostrate trees of the unsightly clearing the blacksmith built his forge saw and hammer plied their trade palisades were shaped and beams squared in spite of heat mosquitoes and fever at one time twenty men were ill and lay gasping under a wretched shed of bark 
but they all recovered and the work went on till at length a capacious house large enough to hold the whole colony rose above the ruin of the forest a palisade was set around it and the mission of saint mary of Ganenta was begun france and the faith were entrenched on the lake of onondaga how long would they remain there the future alone could tell the mission it must not be forgotten had a double scope half ecclesiastical half political the jesuits had essayed a fearful task to convert the iroquois to god and to the king thwart the dutch heretics of the hudson save souls from hell avert ruin from canada and thus raise their order to a place of honour and influence both hard earned and well earned the mission at lake onondaga was but a base of operations long before they were lodged and fortified here chaumineau and menard set out for the cayugas whence the former proceeded to the senecas the most numerous and powerful of the five confederate nations and in the following spring another mission was begun among the oneidas their reception was not unfriendly but such was the reticence and dissimulation of these inscrutable savages that it was impossible to foretell results the women proved as might be expected far more impressible than the men and in them the fathers placed great hope since in this the most savage people of the continent women held a degree of political influence never perhaps equalled in any civilized nation but while infants were baptized and squalls converted the crosses of the mission were many and great the devil bestirred himself with more than his ordinary activity for as one of the fathers writes when in sundry nations of the earth men are rising up in strife against us the jesuits then how much more the demons on whom we continually wage war it was these infernal sprites as the priests believed who engendered suspicion and calumnies in the dark and superstitious minds of the iroquois and prompted them in dreams to destroy the apostles of the faith whether the foe was of earth or hell the jesuits were like those who tread the lava crust that palpitates with the throes of the coming eruption while the molten death beneath their feet glares white-hot through a thousand crevices yet with a sublime enthusiasm and a glorious constancy they toiled and they hoped though the skies around were black with portent in the year in which the colony of onondaga was begun the mohawks murdered the jesuit garot on his way up the ottawa in the following spring a hundred mohawk warriors came to quebec to carry more of the hurons into slavery though the remnant of that unhappy people since the catastrophe of the last war had sought safety in a palisaded camp within the limits of the french town and immediately under the ramparts of fort st louis here one might think they would have been safe but chamy son and successor of lauzon seems to have been even more imbecile than his father and listened meekly to the threats of the insolent strangers who told him that unless he abandoned the hurons to their mercy both they and the french should feel the weight of mohawk tomahawks they demanded further that the french should give them boats to carry their prisoners but as there were none at hand this last humiliation was spared the mohawks were forced to make canoes in which they carried off as many as possible of their victims when the onondagas learned this last exploit of their rivals their jealousy knew no bounds and a troop of them descended to quebec to claim their share in the human plunder deserted by the french the despairing hurons abandoned themselves to their fate 
and about fifty of those whom the mohawks had left obeyed the behest of their tyrants and embarked for onondaga they reached montreal in july and thence proceeded towards their destination in company with the onondaga warriors the jesuit ragono bound also for onondaga joined them five leagues above montreal the warriors left him behind but he found an old canoe on the bank in which after abandoning most of his baggage he contrived to follow with two or three frenchmen who were with him there was a rumour that a hundred mohawk warriors were lying in wait among the thousand islands to plunder the onondagas of their huron prisoners it proved a false report a speedier catastrophe awaited these unfortunates towards evening on the third of august after the party had landed to encamp an onondaga chief made advances to a christian huron girl as he had already done at every encampment since leaving montreal being repulsed for the fourth time he split her head with his tomahawk it was the beginning of a massacre the onondagas rose upon their prisoners killed seven men all christians before the eyes of the horrified jesuit and plundered the rest of all they had when ragano protested they told him with insolent mockery that they were acting by direction of the governor and the superior of the jesuits the priest himself was secretly warned that he was to be killed that night and he was surprised in the morning to find himself alive on reaching onondaga some of the christian captives were burned including several women and their infant children the confederacy was a hornet's nest buzzing with preparation and fast pouring out its wrathful swarms the indomitable le moyne had gone again to the mohawks whence he wrote that two hundred of them had taken the war-path against the algonquins of canada and a little later that all were gone but women children and old men a great war party of twelve hundred iroquois from all the five cantons was to advance into canada in the direction of the ottawa the settlements on the st lawrence were infested with prowling warriors who killed the indian allies of the french and plundered the french themselves whom they treated with an insufferable insolence for they felt themselves masters of the situation and knew that the onondaga colony was in their power near montreal they killed three frenchmen they approach like foxes writes a jesuit attack like lions and disappear like birds charny fortunately had resigned the government in despair in order to turn priest and the brave soldier d'alaboust had taken his place he caused twelve of the iroquois to be seized and held as hostages this seemed to increase their fury an embassy came to quebec and demanded the release of the hostages but were met with a sharp reproof and a flat refusal at the mission on lake onondaga the crisis was drawing near the unbridled young warriors whose capricious lawlessness often set at naught the monitions of their crafty elders killed wantonly at various times thirteen christian hurons captives at onondaga ominous reports reached the ears of the colonists they heard of a secret council at which their death was decreed again they heard that they were to be surprised and captured that the iroquois in force were then to descend upon canada lay waste to the outlying settlements and torture them the colonists in sight of their countrymen by which they hoped to extort what terms they pleased at length a dying onondaga recently converted and baptized confirmed the rumours and revealed the whole plot it was to take effect before the spring opened but the hostages in the hands of de alaboust embarrassed the conspirators and caused delay messengers were sent in haste to call in the priests from the detached missions 
and all the colonists fifty-three in number were soon gathered at their fortified house on the lake their situation was frightful fate hung over them by a hair and escape seemed hopeless of dupois ten soldiers nine wished to desert but the attempt would have been fatal a throng of onondaga warriors were day and night on the watch bivouacked around the house some of them had built their huts of bark before the gate and here with calm impassive faces they lounged and smoked their pipes or wrapped in their blankets strolled about the yards and outhouses attentive to all that passed their behaviour was very friendly the jesuits themselves adepts in dissimulation were amazed at the depth of their duplicity for the conviction had been forced upon them that some of the chiefs had nursed their treachery from the first in this extremity dupois and the jesuits showed an admirable coolness and among them devised a plan of escape critical and full of doubt but not devoid of hope first they must provide means of transportation next they must contrive to use them undiscovered they had eight canoes all of which combined would not hold half their company over the mission house was a large loft or garret and here the carpenters were secretly set at work to construct two large and light flatboats each capable of carrying fifteen more the task was soon finished the most difficult part of their plan remained there was a beastly superstition prevalent among the hurons the iroquois and the other tribes it consisted of a medicine or mystic feast in which it was essential that the guests should devour everything set before them however inordinate in quantity unless absolved from duty by the person in whose behalf the solemnity was ordained he on his part taking no share in the banquet so grave was the obligation and so strenuously did the guests fulfil it that even their ostrich digestion was sometimes ruined past redemption by the excess of this benevolent gluttony these festins à manger tout had been frequently denounced as diabolical by the jesuits during their mission among the hurons but now with the pliancy of consequence as excusable in this case as in any other they resolved to set aside their scruples though judged from their point of view they were exceedingly well founded among the french was a young man who had been adopted by an iroquois chief and who spoke the language fluently he now told his indian father that it had been revealed to him in a dream that he would soon die unless the spirits were appeased by one of these magic feasts dreams were the oracles of the iroquois and woe to those who slighted them a day was named for the sacred festivity the fathers killed their hogs to meet the occasion and that nothing might be wanted they ransacked their stores for all that might give piquancy to the entertainment it took place in the evening of the twentieth of march apparently in a large enclosure outside the palisade surrounding the mission house here while blazing fires or glaring pine knots shed their glow on the wild assemblage frenchmen and iroquois joined in the dance or vied with each other in games of agility and skill the politic fathers offered prizes to the winners and the indians entered with zest into the sport the better perhaps to hide their treachery and hoodwink their intended victims for they little suspected that a subtlety deeper this time than their own was at work to countermine them here too were the french musicians and drum trumpet and cymbal lent their clangour to the din of shouts and laughter thus the evening wore on till at length the serious labours of the feast began the kettles were brought in and their steaming contents ladled into the wooden bowls which each provident guest had brought with him 
seated gravely in a ring they fell to their work it was a point of high conscience not to flinch from duty on these solemn occasions and though they might burn the young man to-morrow they would gorge themselves like vultures in his behoof to-day meanwhile while the musicians strained their lungs and their arms to drown all other sounds a band of anxious frenchmen in the darkness of the cloudy night with cautious tread and bated breath carried the boats from the rear of the mission house down to the border of the lake it was near eleven o'clock the miserable guests were choking with repletion they prayed the young frenchman to dispense them from further surfeit will you suffer me to die he asked in piteous tones they bent to their task again but nature soon reached her utmost limit and they sat helpless as a conventicle of gorged turkey buzzards without the power possessed by those unseemly birds to rid themselves of the burden that will do said the young man you have eaten enough my life is saved now you can sleep till we come in the morning to waken you for prayers and one of his companions played soft airs on a violin to lull them to repose soon all were asleep or in a lethargy akin to sleep the few remaining frenchmen now silently withdrew and cautiously descended to the shore where their comrades already embarked lay on their oars anxiously awaiting them snow was falling fast as they pushed out upon the murky waters the ice of the winter had broken up but recent frost had glazed the surface with a thin crust the two boats led the way and the canoes followed in their wake while men in the bows of the foremost boat broke the ice with clubs as they advanced they reached the outlet and rowed swiftly down the dark current of the oswego when day broke lake onondaga was far behind and around them was the leafless lifeless forest when the indians woke in the morning dull and stupefied from their nightmare slumbers they were astonished at the silence that reigned in the mission house they looked through the palisade nothing was stirring but a bevy of hens clucking and scratching in the snow and one or two dogs imprisoned in the house and barking to be set free the indians waited for some time then climbed the palisade burst in the doors and found the house empty their amazement was unbounded how without canoes could the french have escaped by water and how else could they escape the snow which had fallen during the night completely hid their footsteps a suspicious awe seized the iroquois they thought that the black robes and their flock had flown off through the air meanwhile the fugitives pushed their flight with the energy of terror passed in safety the rapids of the oswego crossed lake ontario and descended the st lawrence with the loss of three men drowned in the rapids on the third of april they reached montreal and on the twenty-third arrived at quebec they had saved their lives but the mission of onondaga was a miserable failure End of chapter four part two chapter five of the old regime in canada by francis parkman jr this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five sixteen forty three to sixteen sixty one the holy wars of montreal on the second of july sixteen sixty nine the ship st andre lay in the harbour of rochelle crowded with passengers for canada she had served two years as a hospital for marines and was infected with a contagious fever including the crew some two hundred persons were on board more than half of whom were bound for montreal most of these were sturdy laborers artisans and soldiers together with a troop of young women 
their present or future partners a portion of the company set down on the old record as sixty virtuous men and thirty-two pious girls there were two priests also vignal and le maitre both destined to a speedy death at the hands of the iroquois but the most conspicuous among these passengers for montreal were two groups of women in the habit of nuns under the direction of marguerite bourgois and jean mance marguerite bourgois whose kind womanly face bespoke her fitness for the task was foundress of the school for female children at montreal her companion a tall austere woman worn with suffering and care was directress of the hospital both had returned to france for aid and were now on their way back each with three recruits three being the mystic number as a type of the holy family to whose worship they were especially devoted amid the bustle of departure the shouts of sailors the rattling of cordage the flapping of sails the tears and the embracings an elderly man with heavy plebeian features sallow with disease and in a sober half-clerical dress approached mademoiselle mance and her three nuns and turning his eyes to heaven spread his hands over them in benediction it was le royer de la Deversière, founder of the sisterhood of st joseph to which the three nuns belonged now o lord he exclaimed with the look of one whose mission on earth is fulfilled permit thou thy servant to depart in peace sister maillet who had charge of the meagre treasury of the community thought that something more than a blessing was due from him and asked where she should apply for payment of the interest of the twenty thousand livres which mademoiselle mance had placed in his hands for investment de versiere changed countenance and replied with a troubled voice my daughter god will provide for you place your trust in him he was bankrupt and had used the money of the sisterhood to pay a debt of his own leaving the nuns penniless i have related in another place how an association of devotees inspired as they supposed from heaven had undertaken to found a religious colony at montreal in honour of the holy family the essentials of the proposed establishment were to be a seminary of priests dedicated to the virgin a hospital to saint joseph and a school to the infant jesus while a settlement was to be formed around them simply for their defence and maintenance this pious purpose had in part been accomplished it was seventeen years since mademoiselle mance had begun her labours in honour of saint joseph marguerite bourgois had entered upon hers more recently yet even then the attempt was premature for she found no white children to teach in time however this want was supplied and she opened her school in a stable which answered to the stable of bethlehem lodging with her pupils in the loft and instructing them in roman catholic christianity with such rudiments of mundane knowledge as she and her advisers thought fit to impart mademoiselle mance found no lack of hospital work for blood and blows were rife at montreal where the woods were full of iroquois and not a moment was without its peril though years began to tell upon her she toiled patiently at her dreary task till in the winter of sixteen fifty seven she fell on the ice of the st lawrence broke her right arm and dislocated the wrist bonchard the surgeon of montreal set the broken bones but did not discover the dislocation the arm in consequence became totally useless 
and her health wasted away under incessant and violent pain. Maisonneuve, the civil and military chief of the settlement, advised her to go to France for assistance in the work to which she was no longer equal. And Marguerite Bourgois, whose pupils, white and red, had greatly multiplied, resolved to go with her for a similar object. They set out in September 1658, landed at Rochelle, and went thence to Paris. Here they repaired to the seminary of St. Sulpice, for the priests of this community were joined with them in the work at Montreal, of which they were afterwards to become the feudal proprietors. Now ensued a wonderful event if we may trust the evidence of sundry devout persons. Olier, the founder of St. Sulpice, had lately died, and the two pilgrims would fain pay their homage to his heart, which the priests of his community kept as a precious relic, enclosed in a leaden box. The box was brought when the thought inspired Mademoiselle Mance to try its miraculous efficacy, and invoke the intercession of the departed founder. She did so, touching her disabled arm gently with the leaden casket. Instantly a grateful warmth pervaded the shriveled limb, and from that hour its use was restored. It is true that the Jesuits ventured to doubt the Sulpitian miracle, and even to ridicule it but the Sulpitians will show to this day the attestation of Mademoiselle Mance herself, written with the fingers once paralyzed and powerless. Nevertheless, the cure was not so thorough as to permit her again to take charge of her patients. Her next care was to visit Madame de Bouillon, a devout lady of great wealth who was usually designated at montreal as the unknown benefactress because though her charities were the mainstay of the feeble colony and though the source from which they proceeded was well known she affected in the interest of humility the greatest secrecy and required those who profited by her gifts to pretend ignorance whence they came. Overflowing with zeal for the pious enterprise, she received her visitor with enthusiasm, lent an open ear to her recital, responded graciously to her appeal for aid, and paid over to her the sum, munificent at that day, of twenty-two thousand francs. Thus far successful, Mademoiselle Mance repaired to the town of La Fèche to visit Le Royer de la Deversière. It was this wretched fanatic who, through visions and revelations, had first conceived the plan of a hospital in honour of St. Joseph at Montreal. He had found in Mademoiselle Mance a zealous and efficient pioneer, but the execution of his scheme required a community of hospital nuns, and therefore he had laboured for the last eight years to form one at La Fleche, meaning to dispatch its members in due time to Canada. The time at length was come. Three of the nuns were chosen, sisters Brezolet, Marseille, and Maillet and sent under the escort of certain pious gentlemen to rochelle their exit from la fleche was not without its difficulties delversier was in ill odour not only from the multiplicity of his debts but because in his character of agent of the association of montreal he had at various times sent thither those whom his biography describes as the most virtuous girls to be found at la fleche intoxicating them with religious excitement and shipping them for the new world against the will of their parents it was noised through the town that he had kidnapped and sold them and now the report spread abroad 
that he was about to crown his iniquity by luring away three young nuns a mob gathered at the convent gate and the escort were forced to draw their swords to open a way for the terrified sisters of the twenty-two thousand francs which she had received mademoiselle mance kept two thousand for immediate needs and confided the rest to the hands of dauphersier who hard pressed by his creditors used it to pay one of his debts and then to his horror found himself unable to replace it racked by the gout and tormented by remorse he betook himself to his bed in a state of body and mind truly pitiable one of the miracles so frequent in the early annals of montreal was vouchsafed in answer to his prayer and he was enabled to journey to rochelle and bid farewell to his nuns it was but a brief respite he returned home to become the prey of a host of maladies and to die at last a lingering and painful death while mademoiselle mance was gaining recruits in la fleche marguerite bourgois was no less successful in her native town of troyes and she rejoined her companions at rochelle accompanied by sisters chatel crollo and Razine, her destined assistants at the school in montreal meanwhile the sulpitians and others interested in the pious enterprise had spared no effort to gather men to strengthen the colony and young women to serve as their wives and all were now mustered at rochelle waiting for embarkation their waiting was a long one laval bishop at quebec was allied to the jesuits and looked on the colonists of montreal with more than coldness sulpitian writers say that his agents used every effort to discourage them and that certain persons at rochelle told the master of the ship in which the emigrants were to sail that they were not to be trusted to pay their passage money hereupon ensued a delay of more than two months before means could be found to quiet the scruples of the prudent commander at length the anchor was weighed and the dreary voyage begun the woe-begone company crowded in the filthy and infected ship were tossed for two months more on the relentless sea buffeted by repeated storms and wasted by a contagious fever which attacked nearly all of them and reduced mademoiselle mance to extremity eight or ten died and were dropped overboard after a prayer from the two priests at length land hove in sight the piney odours of the forest regaled their languid senses as they sailed up the broad estuary of the st lawrence and anchored under the rock of quebec high aloft on the brink of the cliff they saw the fleur-de-lis waving above the fort of st louis and beyond the cross on the tower of the cathedral traced against the sky the houses of the merchants on the strand below and boats and canoes drawn up along the bank the bishop and the jesuits greeted them as co-workers in a holy cause with an unction not wholly sincere though a unit against heresy the pious founders of new france were far from unity among themselves to the thinking of the jesuits montreal was a government within a government a wheel within a wheel this rival sulpitian settlement was in their eyes an element of disorganization adverse to the disciplined harmony of the canadian church which they would fain have seen with its focus at quebec radiating light unrefracted to the uttermost parts of the colony that is to say they wished to control it unchecked through their ally the bishop the emigrants then were received with a studious courtesy which veiled but thinly a stiff and persistent opposition 
the bishop and the jesuits were especially anxious to prevent the la flesche nuns from establishing themselves at montreal where they would form a separate community under sulpitian influence and in place of the newly arrived sisters they wished to substitute nuns from the hotel dieu of quebec which would be under their own control that which most strikes the non-catholic reader through this affair is the constant reticence and dissimulation practised not only between jesuits and montrealists but among the montrealists themselves their self-devotion great as it was was fairly matched by their disingenuousness all difficulties being overcome the montrealists embarked in boats and ascended the st lawrence leaving quebec infected with the contagion they had brought the journey now made in a single night cost them fifteen days of hardship and danger at length they reached their new home the little settlement lay before them still gasping betwixt life and death in a puny precarious infancy some forty small compact houses were ranged parallel to the river chiefly along the line of what is now st paul's street on the left there was a fort and on a rising ground at the right a massive windmill of stone enclosed with a wall or palisade pierced for musketry and answering the purpose of a redoubt or blockhouse fields studded with charred and blackened stumps between which crops were growing stretched away to the edges of the bordering forest and the green shaggy back of the mountain towered over all there were at this time a hundred and sixty men at montreal about fifty of whom had families or at least wives they greeted the newcomers with a welcome which this time was as sincere as it was warm and bestirred themselves with alacrity to provide them with shelter for the winter as for the three nuns from la flesche a chamber was hastily made for them over two low rooms which had served as mademoiselle mance's hospital this chamber was twenty-five feet square with four cells for the nuns and a closet for stores and clothing which for the present was empty as they had landed in such destitution that they were forced to sell all their scanty equipment to gain the bare necessities of existence little could be hoped from the colonists who were scarcely less destitute than they such was their poverty thanks to de versiere's breach of trust that when their clothes were worn out they were unable to replace them and were forced to patch them with such material as came to hand maisonneuve the governor and the pious madame d'alleboust being once on a visit to the hospital amused themselves with trying to guess of what stuff the habits of the nuns had originally been made and were unable to agree on the point in question their chamber which they occupied for many years being hastily built of ill-seasoned planks let in the piercing cold of the canadian winter through countless cracks and chinks and the driving snow sifted through in such quantities that they were sometimes obliged the morning after a storm to remove it with shovels their food would freeze on the table before them and their coarse brown bread had to be thawed on the hearth before they could cut it these women had been nurtured in ease if not in luxury one of them judith de bressols had in her youth by advice of her confessor run away from parents who were devoted to her and immured herself in a convent leaving them in agonies of doubt as to her fate she now acted as superior of the little community one of her nuns records of her that she had a fervent devotion for the infant jesus and that along with many more spiritual graces he inspired her with so transcendent a skill in cookery 
that with a small piece of lean pork and a few herbs she could make soup of a marvellous relish sister mace was charged with the care of the pigs and hens to whose wants she attended in person though she too had been delicately bred in course of time the sisterhood was increased by additions from without though more than twenty girls who entered the hospital as novices recoiled from the hardship and took husbands in the colony among a few who took the vows sister jumeau should not pass unnoticed such was her humility that though of a good family and unable to divest herself of the marks of good breeding she pretended to be the daughter of a poor peasant and persisted in repeating the pious falsehood till the merchant Le Beur told her flatly that he did not believe her the sisters had great need of a man to do the heavy work of the house and garden but found no means of hiring one when an incident in which they saw a special providence excellently supplied the want there was a poor colonist named joanneau to whom a piece of land had been given at some distance from the settlement had he built a cabin upon it his scalp would soon have paid the forfeit but being bold and hardy he devised a plan by which he might hope to sleep in safety without abandoning the farm which was his only possession among the stumps of his clearing there was one hollow with age under this he dug a sort of cave the entrance of which was a small hole carefully hidden by brushwood the hollow stump was easily converted into a chimney and by creeping into his burrow at night or when he saw signs of danger he escaped for some time the notice of the iroquois but though he could dispense with a house he needed a barn for his hay and corn and while he was building one he fell from the ridge of the roof and was seriously hurt he was carried to the hotel dieu where the nuns showed him every attention until after a long confinement he at last recovered being of a grateful nature and enthusiastically devout he was so touched by the kindness of his benefactors and so moved by the spectacle of their piety that he conceived the wish of devoting his life to their service to this end a contract was drawn up by which he pledged himself to work for them as long as strength remained and they on their part agreed to maintain him in sickness or old age the stout-hearted retainer proved invaluable though had a guard of soldiers been added it would have been no more than the case demanded montreal was not palisaded and at first the hospital was as much exposed as the rest the iroquois would skulk at night among the houses like wolves in a camp of sleeping travellers on the prairies though the human foe was of the two incomparably the bolder fiercer and more bloodthirsty more than once one of these prowling savages was known to have crouched all night in a rank growth of wild mustard in the garden of the nuns vainly hoping that one of them would come out within reach of his tomahawk during summer a month rarely passed without a fight sometimes within sight of their windows a burst of yells from the ambushed marksmen followed by a clatter of musketry would announce the opening of the fray and promise the nuns an addition to their list of patients on these occasions they bore themselves according to their several natures sister morin who had joined their number three years after their arrival relates that sister Brezoles and she used to run to the belfry and ring the tocsin to call the inhabitants together from our high station she writes we could sometimes see the combat which terrified us extremely so that we came down again as soon as we could trembling with fright and thinking that our last hour was come when the tocsin sounded my sister maillet would become faint 
with excess of fear and my sister mace as long as the alarm continued would remain speechless in a state pitiable to see they would both get into a corner of the rude loft before the holy sacrament so as to be prepared for death or else go into their cells as soon as i heard that the iroquois were gone i went to tell them which comforted them and seemed to restore them to life my sister Brezol's was stronger and more courageous her terror which she could not help did not prevent her from attending the sick and receiving the dead and wounded who were brought in the priests of st sulpice who had assumed the entire spiritual charge of the settlement and who were soon to assume its entire temporal charge also had for some years no other lodging than a room at the hospital adjoining those of the patients they caused the building to be fortified with palisades and the houses of some of the chief inhabitants were placed near it for mutual defence they also built two fortified houses called saint marie and saint gabriel at the two extremities of the settlement and lodged in them a considerable number of armed men whom they employed in clearing and cultivating the surrounding lands the property of their community all other outlying houses were also pierced with loopholes and fortified as well as the slender means of their owners would permit the laborers always carried their guns to the field and often had need to use them a few incidents will show the state of montreal and the character of its tenants in the autumn of sixteen fifty seven there was a truce with the iroquois under cover of which three or four of them came to the settlement nicholas godet and jean st pierre were on the roof of their house laying thatch when one of the visitors aimed his arquebus at st pierre and brought him to the ground like a wild turkey from a tree now ensued a prodigy for the assassins having cut off his head and carried it home to their village were amazed to hear it speak to them in good iroquois scold them for their perfidy and threaten them with the vengeance of heaven and they continued to hear its voice of admonition even after scalping it and throwing away the skull this story circulated at montreal on the alleged authority of the indians themselves found believers among the most intelligent men of the colony another miracle which occurred several years later deserves to be recorded Le Maitre, one of the two priests who had sailed from france with mademoiselle mance and her nuns being one day at the fortified house of st gabriel went out with the laborers in order to watch while they were at their work in view of a possible enemy he had girded himself with an earthy sword but seeing no sign of danger he presently took out his breviary and while reciting his office with eyes bent on the page walked into an ambuscade of iroquois who rose before him with a yell he shouted to the laborers and drawing his sword faced the whole savage crew in order probably to give the men time to snatch their guns afraid to approach the iroquois fired and killed him then rushed upon the working party who escaped into the house after losing several of their number the victors cut off the head of the heroic priest and tied it in a white handkerchief which they took from a pocket of his cassock it is said that on reaching their villages they were astonished to find the handkerchief without the slightest stain of blood but stamped indelibly with the features of its late owner so plainly marked that none who had known him could fail to recognize him this not very original miracle though it found eager credence at montreal was received coolly like other montreal miracles at quebec and sulpitian writers complain that the bishop in a long letter which he wrote to the pope made no mention of it whatever <laughs>
Le Maitre, on the voyage to Canada, had been accompanied by another priest, Willam de Vignal, who met a fate more deplorable than that of his companion, though unattended by any recorded miracle. Le Maitre had been killed in August. In the October following, Vignal went with thirteen men in a flatboat and several canoes to Isle à la Pierre, nearly opposite Montreal, to get stone for the seminary which the priests had recently begun to build. With him was a pious and valiant gentleman named Claude de Brigiac, who, but thirty years of age, had come as a soldier to Montreal in the hope of dying in defence of the true church, and thus reaping the reward of a martyr. Vignal and three or four men had scarcely landed when they were set upon by a large band of Iroquois who lay among the bushes waiting to receive them. The rest of the party, who were still in their boats, with a cowardice rare at Montreal, thought only of saving themselves. Claude de Brigiac alone leapt ashore and ran to aid his comrades. Vignal was soon mortally wounded. Brigiac shot the chief dead with his arquebus, and then, pistol in hand, held the whole troop for an instant at bay. But his arm was shattered by a gunshot, and he was seized along with Vignal, René Collerière, and Jacques Dufresne, crossing to the main shore immediately opposite Montreal. The Iroquois made, after their custom, a small fort of logs and branches, in which they ensconced themselves, and then began to dress the wounds of their prisoners. Seeing that Vignal was unable to make the journey to their villages, they killed him, divided his flesh, and roasted it for food. Brigiac and his fellows in misfortune spent a woeful night in this den of wolves, and in the morning their captors, having breakfasted on the remains of Vignal, took up their homeward march, dragging the Frenchmen with them. On reaching Oneida, Brigiac was tortured to death with the customary atrocities. Coulerier, who was present, declared that they could wring from him no cry of pain, and that throughout he ceased not to pray for their conversion. The witness himself expected the same fate, but an old squaw happily adopted him and thus saved his life. He eventually escaped to Albany and returned to Canada by the circuitous but comparatively safe route of New York and Boston. In the following winter Montreal suffered an irreparable loss in the death of the brave Major Kloss a man whose intrepid coolness was never known to fail in the direst emergency. Going to the aid of a party of laborers attacked by the Iroquois, he was met by a crowd of savages eager to kill or capture him. His servant ran off, he snapped a pistol at the foremost assailant, but it missed fire. His remaining pistol served him no better, and he was instantly shot down. He died, writes Dollier de Casson, like a brave soldier of Christ and the King. Some of his friends, once remonstrating with him on the temerity with which he exposed his life, he replied, Messieurs, I came here only to die in the service of God, and if I thought I could not die here, I would leave this country to fight the Turks, that I might not be deprived of such a glory. The fortified house of St. Marie, belonging to the priests of St. Sulpice, was the scene of several hot and bloody fights. Here, too, occurred the following nocturnal adventure. A man named Levine, who had lately returned from captivity among the Iroquois, chancing to rise at night and looking out of the window, saw by the bright moonlight a number of naked warriors stealthily gliding round a corner and crouching near the door in order to kill the first frenchman who should go out in the morning he silently woke his comrades and having the rest of the night for consultation 
they arranged their plans so well that some of them sallying from the rear of the house came cautiously round upon the iroquois placed them between two fires and captured them all the summer of sixteen sixty one was marked by a series of calamities scarcely paralleled even in the annals of this disastrous epoch early in february thirteen colonists were surprised and captured next came a fight between a large band of laborers and two hundred and sixty iroquois in the following month ten more frenchmen were killed or taken and thenceforth till winter closed the settlement had scarcely a breathing space these hobgoblins writes the author of the relation of this year sometimes appeared at the edge of the woods assailing us with abuse sometimes they glided stealthily into the midst of the fields to surprise the men at work sometimes they approached the houses harassing us without ceasing and like importunate harpies or birds of prey swooping down on us whenever they could take us unawares speaking of the disasters of this year the soldier priest dolier de casson writes god who afflicts the body only for the good of the soul made a marvellous use of these calamities and terrors to hold the people firm in their duty towards heaven vice was then almost unknown here and in the midst of war religion flourished on all sides in a manner very different from what we now see in time of peace the war was in fact a war of religion the small redoubts of logs scattered about the skirts of the settlement to serve as points of defence in case of attack bore the names of saints to whose care they were commended there was one placed under a higher protection called the redoubt of the infant jesus chaumedy de maisonneuve the pious and valiant governor of montreal to whom its successful defence is largely due resolved in view of the increasing fury and persistency of the iroquois attacks to form among the inhabitants a military fraternity to be called soldiers of the holy family of jesus mary and joseph and to this end he issued a proclamation of which the following is the characteristic beginning we paul de chomedy governor of the island of montreal and lands thereon dependent on information given us from diverse quarters that the iroquois have formed the design of seizing upon this settlement by surprise or force have thought it our duty seeing that this island is the property of the holy virgin to invite and exhort though zealous for her service to unite together by squads each of seven persons and after choosing a corporal by a plurality of voices to report themselves to us for enrolment in our garrison and in this capacity to obey our orders to the end that the country may be saved twenty squads numbering in all one hundred and forty men whose names appended to the proclamation may still be seen on the ancient records of montreal answered the appeal and enrolled themselves in the holy cause the whole settlement was in a state of religious exaltation as the iroquois were regarded as actual myrmidons of satan in his malign warfare against mary and her divine son who died in fighting them were held to merit the reward of martyrs assured of a seat in paradise and now it remains to record one of the most heroic feats of arms ever achieved on this continent that it may be rated as it merits it will be well to glance for a moment at the condition of canada under the portentous cloud of war which constantly overshadowed it End of chapter five Chapter six of the Old Regime in Canada by Francis Parkman, Jr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter six, sixteen sixty to sixteen sixty one. The Heroes of the Long Sote. 
Canada had writhed for twenty years with little respite under the scourge of Iroquois war. During a great part of this dark period, the entire French population was less than three thousand. What then saved them from destruction? In the first place, the settlements were grouped around three fortified posts, Quebec, Three Rivers, and Montreal, which in time of danger gave asylum to the fugitive inhabitants. Again, their assailants were continually distracted by other wars, and never, except at a few spasmodic intervals, were fully in earnest to destroy the French colony. Canada was indispensable to them. The four upper nations of the League soon became dependent on her for supplies, and all the nations alike appear, at a very early period, to have conceived the policy on which they afterwards distinctly acted, of balancing the rival settlements of the Hudson and the St. Lawrence, the one against the other. They would torture, but not kill. It was but rarely that, in fits of fury, they struck their hatchets at the brain, and thus the bleeding and gasping colony lingered on in torment. The Seneschal of New France, son of the governor Lauzon, was surprised and killed on the island of Orléans, along with seven companions. About the same time, the same fate befell the son of Godefroy, one of the chief inhabitants of Quebec. Outside the fortifications there was no safety for a moment. A universal terror seized the people. A comet appeared above Quebec, and they saw in it a herald of destruction. Their excited imaginations turned natural phenomena into portents and prodigies. A blazing canoe sailed across the sky. Confused cries and lamentations were heard in the air, and a voice of thunder sounded from mid-heaven. The Jesuits despaired for their scattered and persecuted flocks. Everywhere, writes their superior, we see infants to be saved for heaven, sick and dying to be baptized, adults to be instructed, but everywhere we see the Iroquois. They haunt us like persecuting goblins. They kill our new-made Christians in our arms. If they meet us on the river, they kill us. If they find us in the huts of our Indians, they burn us and them together. And he appeals urgently for troops to destroy them, as a holy work inspired by God and needful for his service. Canada was still a mission, and the influence of the church was paramount and pervading. At Quebec, as at Montreal, the war with the Iroquois was regarded as a war with the hosts of Satan. Of the settlers' cabins scattered along the shores above and below Quebec, many were provided with small iron cannon, made probably by blacksmiths in the colony. But they had also other protectors. In each was an image of the Virgin or some patron saint, and every morning the pious settler knelt before the shrine to beg the protection of a celestial hand in his perilous labours of the forest or the farm. When, in the summer of 1658, the young Vicomte d'Argenson came to assume the thankless task of governing the colony, the Iroquois War was at its height. On the day after his arrival, he was washing his hands before seating himself at dinner in the hall of the Chateau St. Louis, when cries of alarm were heard, and he was told that the Iroquois were close at hand. In fact, they were so near that their war whoops and the screams of their victims could plainly be heard. Argenson left his guests, and with such a following as he could muster at the moment, hastened to the rescue, but the assailants were too nimble for him. The forests which grew at that time around Quebec favoured them both in attack and retreat. After a year or two of experience, he wrote urgently to the court 
for troops he adds that what with the demands of the harvest and the unmilitary character of many of the settlers the colony could not furnish more than a hundred men for offensive operations a vigorous aggressive war he insists is absolutely necessary and this not only to save the colony but to save the only true faith for to borrow his own words it is this colony alone which has the honour to be in the communion of the holy church everywhere else reigns the doctrine of england or holland to which i can give no other name because there are as many creeds as there are subjects who embrace them they do not care in the least whether the iroquois and the other savages of this country have or have not a knowledge of the true god or else they are so malicious as to inject the venom of their errors into souls incapable of distinguishing the truth of the gospel from the falsehoods of heresy and hence it is plain that religion has its sole support in the french colony and that if this colony is in danger religion is equally in danger among the most interesting memorials of the time are two letters written by Françoise Hertel, a youth of eighteen, captured at Three Rivers, and carried to the Mohawk towns in the summer of 1661. He belonged to one of the best families of Canada, and was the favourite child of his mother, to whom the second of the two letters is addressed. The first is to the Jesuit Le Moyne, who had gone to Onondaga, in july of that year to effect the release of french prisoners in accordance with the terms of a truce both letters were written on birch bark my reverend father the very day when you left three rivers i was captured at about three in the afternoon by four iroquois of the mohawk tribe i would not have been taken alive if to my sorrow i had not feared that I was not in a fit state to die. If you came here, my father, I could have the happiness of confessing to you, and I do not think they would do you any harm, and I think that I could return home with you. I pray you to pity my poor mother, who is in great trouble. You know, my father, how fond she is of me. I have heard from a Frenchman who was taken at Three Rivers on the 1st of August, that she is well and comforts herself with the hope that i shall see you there are three of us frenchmen alive here i commend myself to your good prayers and particularly to the holy sacrifice of the mass i pray you my father to say a mass for me i pray you give my dutiful love to my poor mother and console her if it pleases you my father I beg your blessing on the hand that writes to you which has one of the fingers burned in the bowl of an Indian pipe, to satisfy the majesty of God which I have offended. The thumb of the other hand is cut off, but do not tell my mother of it. My father, I pray you to honour me with a word from your hand in reply, and tell me if you shall come here before winter your most humble and most obedient service, Françoise Hertel. The following is a letter to his mother, sent probably with the other to the charge of Le Moyne. My most dear and honoured mother, I know very well that my capture must have distressed you very much. I ask you to forgive my disobedience. It is my sins that have placed me where I am i owe my life to your prayers and those of monsieur de st quentin and of my sisters i hope to see you again before winter i pray to tell you the good brethren of notre dame to pray to god and the holy virgin for me dear mother and for you and all my sisters your poor fanchon this no doubt was the name by which she had called him familiarly when a child and who was this fanchon this devout and tender son of a fond mother new england can answer to her cost 
when twenty-nine years later a band of french and indians issued from the forest and fell upon the fort and settlement of salmon falls it was Francoise hertel who led the attack and when the retiring victors were hard pressed by an overwhelming force it was he who sword in hand held the pursuers in check at the bridge of worcester river and covered the retreat of his men he was ennobled for his services and died at the age of eighty the founder of one of the most distinguished families of canada to the new england of old he was the abhorred chief of popish malignants and murdering savages the new england of to-day will be more just to the brave defender of his country and his faith in may sixteen sixty a party of french algonquins captured a wolf or mohegan indian naturalized among the iroquois brought him to quebec and burned him there with their usual atrocity of torture a modern catholic writer says that the jesuits could not save him but this is not so their influence over the consciences of the colonists was at that time unbounded and their direct political power was very great a protest on their part and that of the newly arrived bishop who was in their interest could not have failed of effect the truth was they did not care to prevent the torture of prisoners of war not solely out of that spirit of compliance with the savage humour of indian allies which stains so often the pages of french american history but also and perhaps chiefly from motives purely religious torture in their eyes seems to have been a blessing in disguise they thought it good for the soul and in case of obduracy the surest way of salvation we have very rarely indeed writes one of them seen the burning of an iroquois without feeling sure that he was on the path to paradise and we never knew one of them to be surely on the path to paradise without seeing him pass through this fiery punishment so they let the wolf burn but first having instructed him after their fashion they baptized him and his savage soul flew to heaven out of the fire is it not pursues the same writer a marvel to see a wolf changed at one stroke into a lamb and enter into the fold of christ which he came to ravage before he died he requited their spiritual cares with a startling secret he told them that eight hundred iroquois warriors were encamped below montreal that four hundred more who had wintered on the ottawa or on the point of joining them and that the united force would swoop upon quebec kill the governor lay waste to the town and then attack three rivers and montreal this time at least the iroquois were in deadly earnest quebec was wild with terror the ursulines and the nuns of the hotel dieu took refuge in the strong and extensive building which the Jesuits had just finished, opposite the parish church. Its walls and palisades made it easy of defence, and in its yards and court were lodged the terrified Hurons, as well as the fugitive inhabitants of the neighbouring settlements. Others found asylum in the fort, and others in the convent of the Ursulines, which in place of nuns was occupied by twenty-four soldiers, who fortified it with redoubts and barricaded the doors and windows similar measures of defence were taken at the hotel dieu and the streets of the lower town were strongly barricaded everybody was in arms and the qui vive of the sentries and patrols sounded all night several days passed and no iroquois appeared the refugees took heart and began to return to their deserted farms and dwellings among the rest was a family consisting of an old woman her daughter her son-in-law and four small children living near st anne some twenty miles below quebec on reaching home the old woman and the man went to their work in the fields 
while the mother and the children remained in the house. Here they were pounced upon and captured by eight renegade Hurons, Iroquois by adoption, who placed them in their large canoe and paddled up the river with their prize. It was Saturday, a day dedicated to the Virgin, and the captive mother prayed to her for aid, feeling, writes a Jesuit, a full conviction that in passing before Quebec on a Saturday she would be delivered by the power of this Queen of Heaven. In fact, as the marauders and their captives glided in the darkness of night by Point Levi, under the shadow of the shore, they were greeted with a volley of musketry from the bushes, and a band of French and Algonquins dashed into the water to seize them. Five of the eight were taken, and the rest shot or drowned. The governor had heard of the descent at St. Anne, and dispatched a party to lie in ambush for the authors of it. The Jesuits, it is needless to say, saw a miracle in the result. The Virgin had answered the prayer of her votary. Though it is true, observes the father who records the marvel, that in the volley she received a mortal wound. The same shot struck the infant in her arms. The prisoners were taken to Quebec, where four of them were tortured with even more ferocity than had been shown in the case of the unfortunate wolf. Being questioned, they confirmed his story and expressed great surprise that the Iroquois had not come, adding that they must have stopped to attack Montreal or Three Rivers. Again all was terror, and again days passed and no enemy appeared. Had the dying converts, so charitably dispatched to heaven through fire, sought an unhallowed consultation in scaring the abettors of their torture with a lie? Not at all. Bating a slight exaggeration, they had told the truth. Where, then, were the Iroquois? As one small point of steel disarms the lightning of its terrors, so did the heroism of a few intrepid youths divert this storm of war and save Canada from a possible ruin. In the preceding April, before the designs of the Iroquois were known, a young officer named Daulac, commandant of the garrison of Montreal, asked leave of Maisonneuve, the governor, to lead a party of volunteers against the enemy. His plan was bold to desperation. It was known that Iroquois warriors in great numbers had wintered among the forests of the Ottawa. De Lac proposed to waylay them on their descent of the river and fight them without regard to disparity of force. The settlers of Montreal had hitherto acted solely on the defensive, for their numbers had been too small for aggressive war. Of late, their strength had been somewhat increased and Maisonneuve, judging that a display of enterprise and boldness might act as a check on the audacity of the enemy, at length gave his consent. Adam Dolac, or Dollard, Sieur des Ormeaux, was a young man of good family who had come to the colony three years before, at the age of twenty-two. He had held some military command in France, though in what rank does not appear. It is said that he had been involved in some affair which made him anxious to wipe out the memory of the past by a noteworthy exploit, and he had been busy for some time among the young men of Montreal, inviting them to join him in the enterprise he meditated. Sixteen of them caught his spirit, struck hands with him, and pledged their word. They bound themselves by oath to accept no quarter, and having gained Maisonneuve's consent, they made their wills, confessed, and received the sacraments. As they knelt for the last time before the altar in the chapel of the Hotel Dieu, that sturdy little population of pious Indian fighters gazed on them with enthusiasm, not unmixed with an envy which had in it nothing ignoble. Some of the chief men of Montreal, with the brave Charles Le Moyne at their head, 
begged them to wait till the spring sowing was over that they might join them but daulac refused he was jealous of the glory and the danger and he wished to command which he could not have done had le moyne been present the spirit of the enterprise was purely medieval the enthusiasm of honour the enthusiasm of adventure and the enthusiasm of faith were its motive forces daulac was a knight of the early crusades among the forests and savages of the new world yet the incidents of this exotic heroism are definite and clear as a tale of yesterday the names ages and occupations of the seventeen young men may still be read on the ancient register of the parish of montreal and the notarial acts of that year preserved in the records of the city contain minute accounts of such property as each of them possessed the three eldest were of twenty-eight thirty and thirty-one years respectively the age of the rest varied from twenty-one to twenty-seven they were of various callings soldiers armourers locksmiths lime burners or settlers without trades the greater number had come to the colony as part of the reinforcement brought by Maisonneuve in sixteen fifty eight. After a solemn farewell, they embarked in several canoes well supported with arms and ammunition. They were very indifferent canoemen, and it is said they lost a week in vain attempts to pass the swift current of St. Anne at the head of the island of Montreal at length they were more successful and entering the mouth of the ottawa crossed the lake of two mountains and slowly advanced against the current meanwhile forty warriors of that remnant of the hurons who in spite of iroquois persecutions still lingered at quebec had set out on a war party led by the brave and wily etienne anahotaha their most noted chief they stopped by the way at three rivers where they found a band of christian algonquins under a chief named mituvameg anahota challenged him to a trial of courage and it was agreed that they should meet at montreal where they were likely to find a speedy opportunity of putting their mettle to the test thither accordingly they repaired the algonquin with three followers and the huron with thirty-nine it was not long before they learned of the departure of daulac and his companions for observes the honest dolière de casson the principal fault of our frenchmen is to talk too much the wish seized them to share the adventure and to that end the huron chief asked the governor for a letter to daulac to serve as credentials maisonneuve hesitated his faith in huron valour was not great and he feared the proposed alliance nevertheless he at length yielded so far as to give anahotaha a letter in which daulac was told to accept or reject the proffered reinforcement as he should see fit the hurons and algonquins now embarked and paddled in pursuit of the seventeen frenchmen they meanwhile had passed with difficulty the swift current at carillon and about the first of may reached the foot of the more formidable rapid called the long soot where a tumult of waters foaming among ledges and boulders barred the onward way it was needless to go farther the Iroquois were sure to pass the Sault, and could be fought here as well as elsewhere. Just below the rapid, where the forests sloped gently to the shore, among the bushes and stumps of the rough clearing made in constructing it, stood a palisade fort, the work of an Algonquin war party in the past autumn. It was a mere enclosure of trunks of small trees planted in a circle and was already ruinous such as it was the frenchmen took possession of it their first care one would think should have been to repair and strengthen it but this they seem not to have done 
possibly in the exaltation of their minds they scorned such precaution they made their fires and slung their kettles on the neighbouring shore and here they were soon joined by the hurons and algonquins daulac it seems made no objection to their company and they all bivouacked together morning and noon and night they prayed in three different tongues and when at sunset the long reach of forests on the farther shore basked peacefully in the level rays the rapids joined their hoarse music to the notes of their evening hymn in a day or two their scouts came in with tidings that two iroquois canoes were coming down the soak Dulac had time to set his men in ambush along the bushes at a point where he thought the strangers likely to land. He judged aright. The canoes bearing five Iroquois approached and were met with a volley fired with such precipitation that one or more of them escaped the shot, fled into the forest, and told their mischance to their main body, two hundred in number, on the river above a fleet of canoes suddenly appeared bounding down the rapids filled with warriors eager for revenge the allies had barely time to escape to their fort leaving their kettles still slung over the fires the iroquois made a hasty and desultory attack and were quickly repulsed they next opened a parley hoping no doubt to gain some advantage by surprise failing in this they set themselves after their custom on such occasions to building a rude fort of their own in the neighbouring forest this gave the french a breathing time and they used it for strengthening their defences being provided with tools they planted a row of stakes within their palisade to form a double fence and filled the intervening space with earth and stones to the height of a man leaving some twenty loopholes at each of which three marksmen were stationed their work was still unfinished when the iroquois were upon them again they had broken to pieces the birch canoes of the french and their allies and kindling the bark rushed up to pile it blazing against the palisade but so brisk and steady a fire met them that they recoiled and at last gave way they came on again and again were driven back leaving many of their number on the ground among them the principal chief of the senecas some of the french dashed out and covered by the fire of their comrades hacked off his head and stuck it on the palisade while the iroquois howled in a frenzy of helpless rage they tried another attack and were beaten off a third time this dashed their spirits and they sent a canoe to call to their aid five hundred of their warriors who were mustered near the mouth of the richelieu these were the allies whom but for this untoward check they were on their way to join for a combined attack in quebec three rivers and montreal it was maddening to see their grand project thwarted by a few french and indians ensconced in a paltry redoubt scarcely better than a cattle pen but they were forced to digest the affront as best they might meanwhile crouched behind trees and logs they beset the fort harassing its defenders day and night with a spattering fire and a constant menace of attack thus five days passed hunger thirst and want of sleep wrought fatally on the strength of the french and their allies who pent up together in their narrow prison fought and prayed by turns deprived as they were of water they could not swallow the crushed indian corn or hominy which was their only food some of them under cover of a brisk fire ran down to the river and filled such small vessels as they had but this pittance only tantalized their thirst they dug a hole in the fort and were rewarded at last by a little muddy water oozing through the clay 
among the assailants were a number of hurons adopted by the iroquois and fighting on their side these renegades now shouted to their countrymen in the fort telling them that a fresh army was close at hand that they would soon be attacked by seven or eight hundred warriors and that their only hope was in joining the iroquois who would receive them as friends anahotaha's followers half dead with thirst and famine listened to their seducers took the bait and one two or three at a time climbed the palisade and ran over to the enemy amid the hootings and execrations of those whom they deserted their chief stood firm and when he saw his nephew la mouche join the other fugitives he fired his pistol at him in a rage the four algonquins who had no mercy to hope for stood fast with the courage of despair on the fifth day an uproar of unearthly yells from seven hundred savage throats mingled with a clattering salute of musketry told the frenchmen that the expected reinforcement had come and soon in the forest and on the clearing a crowd of warriors mustered for the attack knowing from the huron deserters the weakness of their enemy they had no doubt of an easy victory they advanced cautiously as was usual with the iroquois before their blood was up screeching leaping from side to side and firing as they came on but the french were at their posts and every loophole darted its tongue of fire besides muskets they had heavy musketoons of large calibre which scattering scraps of lead and iron among the throng of savages often maimed several of them at one discharge the iroquois astonished at the persistent vigour of the defence fell back discomfited the fire of the french who were themselves completely under cover had told upon them with deadly effect three days more wore away in a series of futile attacks made with little concert or vigour and during all this time daulac and his men reeling with exhaustion fought and prayed as before sure of a martyr's reward the uncertain vacillating temper common to all indians now began to declare itself some of the iroquois were for going home others revolted at the thought and declared that it would be an eternal disgrace to lose so many men at the hands of so paltry an enemy and yet fail to take revenge it was resolved to make a general assault and volunteers were called for to lead the attack after the custom on such occasions bundles of small sticks were thrown upon the ground and those picked them up who dared thus accepting the gauge of battle and enrolling themselves in the forlorn hope no precaution was neglected large and heavy shields four or five feet high were made by lashing together three split logs with the aid of crossbars covering themselves with these mantelets the chosen band advanced followed by the motley throng of warriors in spite of a brisk fire they reached the palisade and crouching below the range of shot hewed furiously with their hatchets to cut their way through the rest followed close and swarmed like angry hornets around the little fort hacking and tearing to get in daulac had crammed a large musketoon with powder and plugged up the muzzle lighting the fuse inserted in it he tried to throw it over the barrier to burst like a grenade among the crowd of savages without but it struck the ragged top of one of the palisades fell back among the frenchmen and exploded killing and wounding several of them and nearly blinding others in the confusion that followed the iroquois got possession of the loopholes and thrusting in their guns fired on those within in a moment more they had torn a breach in the palisade but nerved with the energy of desperation daulac and his followers sprang to defend it another breach was made and then another daulac was struck dead but the survivors kept up the fight with a sword or a hatchet in one hand and a knife in the other they threw themselves among the throng of enemies 
striking and stabbing with the fury of madmen till the iroquois despairing of taking them alive fired volley after volley and shot them down all was over and a burst of triumphant yells proclaimed the dear-bought victory searching the pile of corpses the victors found four frenchmen still breathing three had scarcely a spark of life and as no time was to be lost they burned them on the spot the fourth less fortunate seemed likely to survive and they reserved him for future torments as for the huron deserters their cowardice profited them little the iroquois regardless of their promises fell upon them burned some at once and carried the rest to their villages for a similar fate five of the number had the good fortune to escape and it was from them aided by admissions made long afterwards by the iroquois themselves that the french of canada derived all their knowledge of this glorious disaster to the colony it proved a salvation the iroquois had had fighting enough if seventeen frenchmen four algonquins and one huron behind a picket fence could hold seven hundred warriors at bay so long what might they expect from many such fighting behind walls of stone for that year they thought no more of capturing quebec and montreal but went home dejected and amazed to howl over their losses and nurse their dashed courage for a day of vengeance End of chapter six Chapter Seven of the Old Regime in Canada by Francis Parkman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven, sixteen sixty seven to sixteen sixty eight. The Disputed Bishopric. Domestic Strife, Jesuit and Sulpician, Abbe Quelus, Francoise de Laval, the Zealots of Caen gallican and ultramontane the rival claimants storm at quebec laval triumphant canada gasping under the iroquois tomahawk might one would suppose have thought her cup of tribulation full and sated with inevitable woe have sought consolation from the wrath without in a holy calm within not so however for while the heathen raged at the door discord rioted at the hearthstone her domestic quarrels were wonderful in number diversity and bitterness there was the standing quarrel of montreal and quebec the quarrels of priests with one another of priests with the governor and of the governor with the intendant besides ceaseless wranglings of rival traders and rival peculators some of these disputes were local and of no special significance while others are very interesting because on a remote and obscure theatre they represent sometimes in striking forms the contending passions and principles of a most important epoch of history to begin with one which even to this day has left a root of bitterness behind it the association of pious enthusiasts who had founded montreal was reduced in sixteen fifty seven to a remnant of five or six persons whose ebbing zeal and overtaxed purses were no longer equal to the devout but arduous enterprise they begged the priests of the seminary of st sulpice to take it off their hands the priests consented and though the conveyance of the island of montreal to these its new proprietors did not take effect till some years later four of the sulpician fathers quelus soart galinet and allay came out to the colony and took it in charge thus far canada had had no bishop 
and the Sulpicians now aspired to give it one from their own brotherhood. Many years before, when the Recollets had a foothold in the colony, they too, or at least some of them, had cherished the hope of giving Canada a bishop of their own. As for the Jesuits, who for nearly thirty years had of themselves constituted the Canadian Church, they had been content thus far to dispense with the bishop, for having no rivals in the field, they had felt no need of episcopal support. The Sulpicians put forward Quailus as their candidate for the new bishopric. The assembly of French clergy approved, and Colonel Mazarin himself seemed to sanction the nomination. The Jesuits saw that their time of action was come. It was they who had borne the heat and burden of the day, the toils, privations, and martyrdoms, while as yet the Sulpicians had done nothing and endured nothing. If any body of ecclesiastics was to have the nomination of a bishop, it clearly belonged to them, the Jesuits. Their might, too, matched their right. They were strong at court. Mazarin withdrew his assent, and the Jesuits were invited to name a bishop to their liking. Meanwhile the Sulpicians, despairing of the bishopric, had sought their solace elsewhere. Ships bound for Canada had usually sailed from ports within the jurisdiction of the Archbishop of Rouen, and the departing missionaries had received their ecclesiastical powers from him, till he had learned to regard Canada as an outlying section of his diocese. Not unwilling to assert his claims, he now made Quelus his vicar-general for all Canada, thus clothing him with episcopal powers, and placing him over the heads of the Jesuits. Quelus, in effect, though not in name a bishop, left his companion, Suart, in the spiritual charge of Montreal, came down to Quebec, announced his new dignity, and assumed the curacy of the parish. The Jesuits received him at first with their usual urbanity, an exercise of self-control rendered more easy by their knowledge that one more potent than Quelus would soon arrive to supplant him. The vicar of the Archbishop of Rouen was a man of many virtues, devoted to good works as he understood them. Rich, for the Sulpicians were under no vow of poverty, generous in almsgiving, busy, indefatigable, overflowing with zeal, vivacious in temperament and excitable in temper, impatient of opposition, and as it seems incapable, like his destined rival, of seeing any way of doing good but his own. Though the Jesuits were outwardly courteous, their partisans would not listen to the new cure's sermons, or listened only to find fault, and germs of discord grew vigorously in the parish of Quebec. Prudence was not among the virtues of Quelus. He launched two sermons against the Jesuits, in which he likened himself to Christ and then to the Pharisees, who, he supposed them to say, is this Jesus, so beloved of the people, who comes to cast discredit on us, who for thirty or forty years have governed church and state here, with no one to dispute us. He denounced such of his hearers as came to pick flaws in his discourse, and told them it would be better for their souls if they lay in bed at home, sick of a good quartan fever. His ire was greatly kindled by a letter of the Jesuit Pijart, which fell into his hands through a female adherent, the pious Madame de Alboust, and in which that father declared that he, Quailus, was waging war on him and his brethren more savagely than the Iroquois. 
he was as crazy at sight of a jesuit writes an adverse biographer as a mad dog at sight of water he cooled however on being shown certain papers which proved that his position was neither so strong nor so secure as he had supposed and that the governor argenson at length persuaded him to retire to montreal the queen mother anne of austria always inclined to the jesuits had invited father lejeune who was then in france to make choice of a bishop for canada it was not an easy task no jesuit was eligible for the sage policy of loyola had excluded members of the order from the bishopric the signs of the times portended trouble for the canadian church and there was need of a bishop who would assert her claims and fight her battles such a man could not be made an instrument of the jesuits therefore there was double need that he should be one with them in sympathy and purpose they made a sagacious choice lejeune presented to the queen mother the name of Françoise xavier de laval montmorency abbe de montmorency laval for by this name he was thenceforth known belonged to one of the proudest families of europe and churchman as he was there is much in his career to remind us that in his veins ran the blood of the stern constable of france anne de montmorency nevertheless his thoughts from childhood had turned towards the church or as his biographers will have it all his aspirations were heavenward he received the tonsure at the age of nine the jesuit bagot confirmed and moulded his youthful predilections and at a later period he was one of a band of young zealots formed under the auspices of bernier de Louvigny, royal treasurer at caen who though a layman was reputed almost a saint it was bernier's who had borne the chief part in the pious fraud of the pretended marriage through which madame de la peltrie escaped from her father's roof to become foundress of the ursulines of quebec he had since renounced the world and dwelt at caen in a house attached to an ursuline convent and known as the hermitage here he lived like a monk in the midst of a community of young priests and devotees who looked to him as their spiritual director and whom he trained in the maxims and practices of the most extravagant or as his admirers say the most sublime ultramontane piety the conflict between the jesuits and the jansenists was then at its height the jansenist doctrines of election and salvation by grace which sapped the power of the priesthood and impugned the authority of the pope himself in his capacity of holder of the keys of heaven were to the jesuits an abomination while the rigid morals of the jansenists stood in stern contrast to the pliancy of jesuit casuistry berniers and his disciples were zealous not to say fanatical partisans of the jesuits there is a long account of the hermitage and its inmates from the pen of the famous jansenist nicole an opponent it is true but one whose qualities of mind and character give weight to his testimony in this famous hermitage says nicole the late sieur de berniers brought up a number of young men to whom he taught a sort of sublime and transcendental devotion called passive prayer because in it the mind does not act at all but merely receives the divine operation and this devotion is the source of all those visions and revelations in which the hermitage is so prolific in short he and his disciples were mystics of the most exalted type nicole pursues 
after having thus subtilized their minds and almost sublimed them into vapor he rendered them capable of detecting jansenists under any disguise insomuch that some of his followers said that they knew them by the scent as dogs know their game but the aforesaid sieur de berniers denied that they had so subtle a sense of smell and said that the mark by which he detected jansenists was their disapproval of his teachings or their opposition to the jesuits the zealous band at the hermitage was aided in its efforts to extirpate error by a sort of external association in the city of cain consisting of merchants priests officers petty nobles and others all inspired and guided by berniers they met every week at the hermitage or at the houses of one another similar associations existed in other cities of france besides a fraternity in the rue st dominique at paris which was formed by the jesuit Begaud, and seems to have been the parent in a certain sense of the others they all acted together when any important object was in view berniers and his disciples felt that god had chosen them not only to watch over doctrine and discipline in convents and in families but also to supply the prevalent deficiency of zeal in bishops and other dignities of the church they kept too a constant eye on the humbler clergy and whenever a new preacher appeared in cain two of their number were deputed to hear his sermon and report upon it if he chanced to let a word fall concerning the grace of god they denounced him for jansenistic heresy such commotion was once raised in caen by charges of sedition and jansenism brought by the hermitage against priests and laymen hitherto without a taint that the bishop of bayeux thought it necessary to interpose but even he was forced to pause daunted by the insinuations of berniers that he was in secret sympathy with the obnoxious doctrines thus the hermitage and its affiliated societies constituted themselves a sort of inquisition in the interests of the jesuits for what asks nicole might not be expected from persons of weak minds and atrabilious dispositions dried up by constant fasts vigils and other austerities besides meditations of three or four hours a day and told continually that the church is in imminent danger of ruin through the machinations of the jansenists who are represented to them as persons who wished to break up the foundations of the christian faith and subvert the mystery of the incarnation who believe neither in transubstantiation the invocation of saints nor indulgences who wish to abolish the sacrifice of the mass and the sacrament of penitence oppose the worship of the holy virgin deny free will and substitute predestination in its place and in fine conspire to overthrow the authority of the supreme pontiff among other anecdotes nicole tells the following one of the young zealots of the hermitage took it into his head that all caen was full of jansenists and that the cures of the place were in league with them he inoculated four others with this notion and they resolved to warn the people of their danger they accordingly made the tour of the streets without hats or collars and with coats unbuttoned though it was a cold winter day stopping every moment to proclaim in a loud voice that all the cures except two whom they named were abettors of the jansenists a mob was soon following at their heels and there was great excitement the magistrates chanced to be in session 
and hearing of the disturbance they sent constables to arrest the authors of it being brought to the bar of justice and questioned by the judge they answered that they were doing the work of god and were ready to die in the cause that cain was full of jansenists and that the cures had declared in their favour inasmuch as they denied any knowledge of their existence four of the five were locked up for a few days tried and sentenced to a fine of a hundred livres with a promise of further punishment should they again disturb the peace the fifth being pronounced out of his wits by the physicians was sent home to his mother at a village near argentan where two or three of his fellow zealots presently joined him among them they persuaded his mother who had hitherto been devoted to household cares to exchange them for a life of mystical devotion these three or four persons says nicole attracted others as imbecile as themselves among these recruits were a number of women and several priests after various acts of fanaticism two or three days before the last pentecost proceeds the narrator they all set out men and women for argentan the priests had drawn the skirts of their cassocks over their heads and tied them about their necks with twisted straw some of the women had their heads bare and their hair streaming loose over their shoulders they picked up filth on the road and rubbed their faces with it and the most zealous ate it saying that it was necessary to mortify the taste some held stones in their hands which they knocked together to draw the attention of the passers-by they had a leader whom they were bound to obey and when this leader saw any mud hole particularly deep and dirty he commanded some of the party to roll themselves in it which they did forthwith after this fashion they entered the town of argentan and marched two by two through all the streets crying with a loud voice that the faith was perishing and that whoever wished to save it must quit the country and go with them to canada whither they were soon to repair it is said that they still hold this purpose and that their leaders declare it revealed to them that they will find a vessel ready at the first port to which providence directs them the reason why they chose canada for an asylum is that monsieur de montigny laval bishop of betraya who lived at the hermitage a long time where he was instructed in mystical theology by monsieur de Beners, exercises episcopal functions there and that the jesuits who are their oracles reign in that country this adventure like the other ended in a collision with the police the priests adds nicole were arrested and are now waiting trial and the rest were treated as mad and sent back with shame and confusion to the places whence they had come though these pranks took place after laval had left the hermitage they served to characterize the school in which he was formed or more justly speaking to show its most extravagant side that others did not share the views of the celebrated jansenist may be gathered from the following passage of the funeral oration pronounced over the body of laval half a century later the humble abbe was next transported into the terrestrial paradise of monsieur de berniers it is thus that i call as it is fitting to call it that famous hermitage of caen where the seraphic author of the christian interior berniers transformed into angels all those who had the happiness to be the companions of his solitude and of his spiritual exercises it is there that during four years the fervent abbe drank the living and abounding waters of grace which have since flowed so benignly over this land of canada in this celestial abode 
his ordinary occupations were prayer mortification instruction of the poor and spiritual readings or conference his recreations were to labor in the hospitals wait upon the sick and poor make their beds dress their wounds and aid them in their most repulsive needs in truth laval's zeal was boundless and the exploits of self-humiliation recorded of him were unspeakably revolting berniers himself regarded him as a light by which to guide his own steps in ways of holiness he made journeys on foot about the country disguised penniless begging from door to door and courting scorn and opprobrium in order says his biographer that he might suffer for the love of god yet though living at this time in a state of habitual religious exaltation he was by nature no mere dreamer and in whatever heights his spirit might wander his feet were always planted on the solid earth his flaming zeal had for its servants a hard practical nature perfectly fitted for the battle of life a narrow intellect a stiff and persistent will and as his enemies thought the love of domination native to his blood two great parties divided the catholics of france the gallican or national party and the ultramontane or papal party the first resting on the scriptural injunction to give tribute to caesar held that to the king the lord's anointed belonged the temporal and to the church the spiritual power it held also that the laws and customs of the church of france could not be broken at the bidding of the pope the ultramontane party on the other hand maintained that the pope christ's vice-regent on earth was supreme over earthly rulers and should of right hold jurisdiction over the clergy of all christendom with powers of appointment and removal hence they claimed for him the right of nominating bishops in france this had anciently been exercised by assemblies of the french clergy but in the reign of francis i the king and the pope had combined to wrest it from them by the concordat of bologna under this compact which was still in force the pope appointed french bishops on the nomination of the king a plan which displeased the gallicans and did not satisfy the ultramontanes the jesuits then as now were the most forcible exponents of ultramontane principles the church to rule the world the pope to rule the church the jesuits to rule the pope such was and is the simple program of the order of jesus and to it they have held fast except on a few rare occasions of misunderstanding with the vice-regent of christ in the question of papal supremacy as in most things laval was of one mind with them those versed in such histories will not be surprised to learn that when he received the royal nomination humility would not permit him to accept it nor that being urged he at length bowed in resignation still protesting his unworthiness nevertheless the royal nomination did not take effect the ultramontanes outflanked both the king and the gallicans and by adroit strategy made the new prelate completely a creature of the papacy instead of appointing him bishop of quebec in accordance with the royal initiative the pope made him his vicar apostolic for canada thus evading the king's nomination and affirming that canada a country of infidel savages was excluded from the concordat and under his the pope's jurisdiction pure and simple the gallicans were enraged the archbishop of rouen 
vainly opposed and the parliaments of rouen and of paris vainly protested the papal party prevailed the king or rather mazarin gave his consent subject to certain conditions the chief of which was an oath of allegiance and laval grand vicar apostolic decorated with the title of bishop of petrea sailed for his wilderness diocese in the spring of sixteen sixty nine he was but thirty-six years of age but even when a boy he could scarcely have seemed young quaelus for a time seemed to accept the situation and tacitly admit the claim of laval as his ecclesiastical superior but stimulated by a letter from the archbishop of rouen he soon threw himself into an attitude of opposition in which the popularity which his generosity to the poor had won for him gave him an advantage very annoying to his adversary the quarrel it will be seen was three-sided gallican against ultramontane sulpician against jesuit montreal against quebec to montreal the recalcitrant abbe after a brief visit to quebec had again retired but even here girt with his sulpician brethren and compassed with partisans the arm of the vicar apostolic was long enough to reach him by temperament and conviction laval hated a divided authority and the very shadow of a schism was an abomination in his sight the young king who though abundantly jealous of his royal power was forced to conciliate the papal party had sent instructions to argenson the governor to support laval and prevent divisions in the canadian church these instructions served as the pretext of a procedure sufficiently summary a squad of soldiers commanded it is said by the governor himself went up to montreal brought the indignant quaylus to quebec and shipped him thence for france by these means writes father lalemont order reigned for a season in the church it was but for a season quaylus was not a man to bide his defeat in tranquillity nor were his brother sulpicians disposed to silent acquiescence laval on his part was not a man of half measures he had an agent in france and partisans strong at court fearing to borrow the words of a catholic writer that the return of quaylus to canada would prove injurious to the glory of god he bestirred himself to prevent it the young king then at aix on his famous journey to the frontiers of spain to marry the infanta was induced to write to quaylus ordering him to remain in france quaylus however repaired to rome but even against this movement provision had been made accusations of jansenism had gone before him and he met a cold welcome nevertheless as he had powerful friends near the pope he succeeded in removing these adverse impressions and even in obtaining certain bulls relating to the establishment of the parish of montreal and favourable to the sulpicians provided with these he set at naught the king's letter embarked under an assumed name and sailed to quebec where he made his appearance on the third of august sixteen sixty one to the extreme wrath of laval a ferment ensued laval's partisans charred the sulpicians with jansenism and opposition to the will of the pope a preacher more zealous than the rest denounced them as priests of antichrist and as to the bulls in their favour it was affirmed that quaylus had obtained them by fraud from the holy father laval at once issued a mandate forbidding him to proceed to montreal till ships should arrive with instructions from the king at the same time he demanded of the governor that he should interpose the civil power to prevent quaylus 
from leaving quebec as argenson who wished to act as peacemaker between the belligerent fathers did not at once take the sharp measures required of him laval renewed his demand on the next day calling on him in the name of god and the king to compel quaelus to yield the obedience due to him the vicar apostolic at the same time he sent another to the offending abbe threatening to suspend him from priestly functions if he persisted in his rebellion the incorrigible quaelus who seemed to have lived for some months in a simmer of continual indignation set at naught the vicar apostolic as he had set at naught the king took a boat that very night and set out for montreal under cover of darkness great was the ire of laval when he heard the news in the morning he dispatched a letter after him declaring him suspended ipso facto if he did not instantly return and make his submission this letter like the rest failed of the desired effect but the governor who had received a second mandate from the king to support laval and prevent a schism now reluctantly interposed the secular arm and quaelus was again compelled to return to france his expulsion was a sulpician defeat laval always zealous for unity and centralization had some time before taken steps to repress what he regarded as a tendency to independence at montreal in the preceding year he had written to the pope there are some secular priests sulpicians at montreal whom the abbe de quaelus brought out with him in sixteen sixty seven and i have named for the functions of cure the one among them whom i thought the least disobedient the bulls which quaelus had obtained from rome related to this very curacy and greatly disturbed the mind of the vicar apostolic he accordingly wrote again to the pope i pray your holiness to let me know your will concerning the jurisdiction of the archbishop of rouen Monsieur l'abbe de quaelus who has come out this year as vicar of this archbishop has tried to deceive us by surreptitious letters and has obeyed neither our prayers nor our repeated commands to desist but he has received orders from the king to return immediately to france to render an account of his disobedience and he has been compelled by the governor to conform to the will of his majesty what i now fear is that on his return to france by using every kind of means employing new artifices and falsely representing our affairs he may obtain from the court of rome powers which may disturb the peace of our church for the priests whom he brought with him from france and who live at montreal are animated with the same spirit of disobedience and division and i fear with good reason that all belonging to the seminary of st sulpice who may come hereafter to join them will be of the same disposition if what is said is true that by means of fraudulent letters the right of patronage of the pretended parish of montreal has been granted to the superior of this seminary and the right of appointment to the archbishop of rouen then is altar reared against altar in our church of canada for the clergy of montreal will always stand in opposition to me the vicar apostolic and to my successors these dismal forebodings were never realized the holy see annulled the obnoxious bulls the archbishop of rouen renounced his claims and quaelus found his position untenable seven years later when laval was on a visit to france a reconciliation was brought about between them the former vicar of the archbishop of rouen made his submission to the vicar of the pope and returned to canada as a missionary laval's triumph was complete to the joy of the jesuits 
silent if not idle spectators of the tedious and complex quarrel end of chapter seven chapter eight of the old regime in canada by francis parkman jr this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight sixteen fifty nine to sixteen sixty laval and argenson we are touching delicate ground to many excellent catholics of our own day laval is an object of veneration the catholic university of quebec glories in bearing his name and certain modern ecclesiastical writers rarely mention him in terms less reverent than the virtuous prelate or the holy prelate nor are some of his contemporaries less emphatic in eulogy mother juchereau de saint denis superior of the hotel dieu wrote immediately after his death he began in his tenderest years the study of perfection and we have reason to think that he reached it since every virtue which saint paul demands in a bishop was seen and admired in him and on his first arrival in canada mother marie de la incarnation superior of the ursulines wrote to her son that the choice of such a prelate was not of man but of god i will not she adds say that he is a saint but i may say with truth that he lives like a saint and an apostle and she describes his austerity of life how he had but two servants a gardener whom he lent on occasion to his needy neighbours and a valet how he lived in a small hired house saying that he would not have one of his own if he could build it for only five sous and how in his table furniture and bed he showed the spirit of poverty even as she thinks to excess his servant a lay brother named hussart testified after his death that he slept on a hard bed and would not suffer it to be changed even when it became full of fleas and what is more to the purpose that he gave fifteen hundred or two thousand francs to the poor every year hussart also gives the following specimen of his austerities i have seen him keep cooked meat five six seven or eight days in the heat of summer and when it was all mouldy and wormy he washed it in warm water and ate it and told me that it was very good the old servant was so impressed by these and other proofs of his master's sanctity that i determined he says to keep everything i could that had belonged to his holy person and after his death to soak bits of linen in his blood when his body was opened and take a few bones and cartilage from his breast cut off his hair and keep his clothes and such things to serve as most precious relics these pious cares were not in vain for the relics proved greatly in demand several portraits of laval are extant a drooping nose of portentous size a well-formed forehead a brow strongly arched a bright clear eye scanty hair half hidden by a black skull-cap thin lips compressed and rigid betraying a spirit not easy to move or convince features of that indescribable cast which marks the priestly type such is laval as he looks grimly down on us from the dingy canvas of two centuries ago he is one of those concerning whom protestants and catholics 
at least ultramontane catholics will never agree in judgment the task of eulogizing him may safely be left to those of his own way of thinking it is for us to regard him from the standpoint of secular history and first let us credit him with sincerity he believed firmly that the princes and rulers of this world ought to be subject to guidance and control at the hands of the pope the vicar of christ on earth but he himself was the pope's vicar and so far as the bounds of canada extended the holy father had clothed him with his own authority the glory of god demanded that this authority should suffer no abatement and he laval would be guilty before heaven if he did not uphold the supremacy of the church over the powers both of earth and hell of the faults which he owed to nature the principal seems to have been an arbitrary and domineering temper he was one of those who by nature leans always to the side of authority and in the english revolution he would inevitably have stood for the stuarts or in the american revolution for the crown but being above all things a catholic and a priest he was drawn by a constitutional necessity to the ultramontane party or the party of centralization he fought lustily in his way against the natural man and humility was the virtue to the culture of which he gave his chief attention but soil and climate were not favorable his life was one long assertion of the authority of the church and this authority was lodged in himself in his stubborn fight for ecclesiastical ascendancy he was aided by the impulses of a nature that loved to rule and could not endure to yield his principles and his instinct of domination were acting in perfect unison and his conscience was the handmaid of his fault austerities and mortifications playing at beggar sleeping in beds full of fleas or performing prodigies of gratuitous dirtiness in hospitals however fatal to self-respect could avail little against influences working so powerfully and so insidiously to stimulate the most subtle of human vices the history of the roman church is full of lavals the jesuits adepts in human nature had made a sagacious choice when they put forward this conscientious zealous dogged and pugnacious priest to fight their battles nor were they ill pleased that for the present he was not bishop of canada but only vicar apostolic for such being the case they could have him recalled if on trial they did not like him while an unacceptable bishop would be an evil past remedy canada was entering a state of transition hitherto ecclesiastical influence had been all in all the jesuits by far the most educated and able body of men in the colony had controlled it not alone in things spiritual but virtually in things temporal also and the governor may be said to have been little else than a chief of police under the direction of the missionaries the early governors were themselves deeply imbued with the missionary spirit champlain was earnest above all things for converting the indians montmagny was half monk for he was a knight of malta d'alaboust was so insanely pious that he lived with his wife like monk and nun a change was at hand from a mission and a trading station canada was soon to become in the true sense a colony and civil government had begun to assert itself on the banks of the st lawrence 
the epoch of the martyrs and apostles was passing away and the man of the sword and the man of the gown the soldier and the legist were threatening to supplant the paternal sway of priests or as laval might have said the hosts of this world were beleaguering the sanctuary and he was called of heaven to defend it his true antagonist though three thousand miles away was the great minister colbert as purely a statesman as the vicar apostolic was purely a priest laval no doubt could see behind the statesman's back another adversary the devil argenson was governor when the crozier and the sword began to clash which is merely another way of saying that he was governor when laval arrived he seems to have been a man of education moderation and sense and he was also an earnest catholic but if laval had his duties to god so had argenson his duties to the king of whose authority he was the representative and guardian if the first collisions seem trivial they were no less the symptoms of a grave antagonism argenson could have purchased peace only by becoming an agent of the church the vicar apostolic or as he was usually styled the bishop being as it may be remembered titular bishop of betraya in arabia presently fell into a quarrel with the governor touching the relative position of their seats in church a point which by the way was a subject of contention for many years and under several successive governors this time the case was referred to the ex-governor dalibust and a temporary settlement took place a few weeks after on the fate of st francis xavier when the jesuits were accustomed to ask the dignitaries of the colony to dine in their refectory after mass a fresh difficulty arose should the governor or the bishop have the higher seat at table the question defied solution so the fathers invited neither of them again on christmas at the midnight mass the deacon offered incense to the bishop and then in obedience to an order from him sent a subordinate to offer it to the governor instead of offering it himself laval further insisted that the priests of the choir should receive incense before the governor received it argenson resisted and a bitter quarrel ensued the late governor d'alaboust had been church warden ex officio and in this pious community the office was esteemed as an addition to his honours argenson had thus far held the same position but laval declared that he should hold it no longer argenson to whom the bishop had not spoken on the subject came soon after to a meeting of the wardens and being challenged denied laval's right to dismiss him a dispute ensued in which the bishop according to his jesuit friends used language not very respectful to the representative of royalty on occasion of the solemn catechism the bishop insisted that the children should salute him before saluting the governor argenson hearing of this declined to come a compromise was contrived it was agreed that when the rival dignitaries entered the children should be busied in some manual exercise which should prevent their saluting either nevertheless two boys enticed and set on by their parents saluted the governor first to the great indignation of laval they were whipped on the next day for breach of orders next there was a sharp quarrel about a sentence pronounced by laval against a heretic to which the governor good catholic as he was took exception 
Palm Sunday came, and there could be no procession and no distribution of branches, because the governor and the bishop could not agree on points of precedence. On the day of the fete due, however, there was a grand procession, which stopped from time to time at temporary altars, or reposoirs, replaced at intervals along its course. One of these was in the fort where the soldiers were drawn up, waiting the arrival of the procession. Laval demanded that they should take off their hats. Argenson assented, and the soldiers stood uncovered. Laval now insisted that they should kneel. The governor replied that it was their duty as soldiers to stand, whereupon the bishop refused to stop at the altar and ordered the procession to move on. The above incidents are set down in the private journal of the superior of the Jesuits, which was not meant for the public eye. The bishop, it will be seen, was, by the showing of his friends, in most cases the aggressor. The disputes in question, though of a nature to provoke a smile on irreverent lips, were by no means so puerile as they appear. It is difficult in a modern democratic society to conceive the substantial importance of the signs and symbols of dignity and authority at a time and among a people where they were adjusted with the most scrupulous precision and accepted by all classes as exponents of relative degrees in the social and political scale whether the bishop or the governor should sit in the higher seat at table thus became a political question for it defined to the popular understanding the position of church and state in their relations to government hence it is not surprising to find a memorial drawn up apparently by argenson and addressed to the council of state asking for instructions when and how a governor lieutenant general for the king ought to receive incense holy water and consecrated bread whether the said bread should be offered him with sound of drum and fife what should be the position of his seat at church and what place he should hold in various religious ceremonies whether in feasts assemblies ceremonies and councils of a purely civil character he or the bishop was to hold the first place and finally if the bishop could excommunicate the inhabitants or others for acts of a civil and political character when the said acts were pronounced lawful by the governor the reply to the memorial denies to the bishop the power of excommunication in civil matters assigns to him the second place in meetings and ceremonies of a civil character and is very reticent as to the rest argenson had a brother a councillor of state and a fast friend of the jesuits laval was in correspondence with him and apparently sure of sympathy wrote to him touching his relations with the governor your brother he begins received me on my arrival with extraordinary kindness but he proceeds to say that perceiving with sorrow that he entertained a groundless distrust of those good servants of god the jesuit fathers he the bishop thought it his duty to give him in private a candid warning which ought to have done good but which to his surprise the governor had taken amiss and had conceived in consequence a prejudice against his monitor argenson on his part writes to the same brother at about the same time the bishop of petraea is so stiff in opinion and so often transported by his zeal beyond the rights of his position that he makes no difficulty in encroaching on the functions of others 
and this with so much heat that he will listen to nobody a few days ago he carried off a servant girl and one of the inhabitants here and placed her by his own authority in the ursuline convent on the sole pretext that he wanted to have her instructed thus depriving her master of her services though he had been at great expense in bringing her from france this inhabitant is monsieur denis who not knowing who had carried her off came to me with a petition to get her out of the convent i kept the petition three days without answering it to prevent the affair from being noised abroad the reverend father lalemont with whom i communicated on the subject and who greatly blamed the bishop of betraya did all in his power to have the girl given up quietly but without the least success so that i was forced to answer the petition and permit monsieur denis to take his servant wherever he should find her and if i had not used means to bring about an accommodation and if monsieur denis on the refusal which was made him to give her up had brought the matter into court i should have been compelled to take measures which would have caused great scandal and all from the self-will of the bishop of petraea who says that a bishop can do what he likes and threatens nothing but excommunication in another letter he speaks in the same strain of this redundancy of zeal on the part of the bishop which often he says takes the shape of obstinacy and encroachment on the rights of others it is greatly to be wished he observes that the bishop of petraea would give his confidence to the reverend father lalemont instead of father ragueneau and he praises lalemont as a person of excellent sense it would be well he adds if the rest of their community were of the same mind for in that case they would not mix themselves up with various matters in the way they do and would leave the government to those whom god has given it in charge one of laval's modern admirers the worthy abbe ferland after confessing that his zeal may now and then have savoured of excess adds in his defence that a vigorous hand was needed to compel the infant colony to enter the good path meaning of course the straightest path of roman catholic orthodoxy we may hereafter see more of this stringent system of colonial education its success and the results that followed End of chapter 8。to assume the government a curious greeting had awaited him the jesuits asked him to dine vespers followed the repast and then they conducted him into a hall where the boys of their school disguised one as the genius of new france one as the genius of the forest and others as indians of various friendly tribes made him speeches by turn in prose and verse first pierre de Quet, who played the genius of new france presented his indian retinue to the governor in a complimentary harangue then four other boys personating french colonists made him four flattering addresses in french verse charles denis dressed as a huron followed bewailing the ruin of his people and appealing to argenson for aid jean francois bourdon in the character of an algonquin next advanced on the platform 
boasted his courage and declared that he was ashamed to cry like the huron the genius of the forest now appeared with a retinue of wild indians from the interior who being unable to speak french addressed the governor in their native tongues which the genius proceeded to interpret two other boys in the character of prisoners just escaped from the iroquois then came forward imploring aid in piteous accents and in conclusion the whole troop of indians from far and near laid their bows and arrows at the feet of argenson and hailed him as their chief besides these mock indians a crowd of genuine savages had gathered at quebec to greet the new onontio on the next day at his own cost as he writes to a friend he gave them a feast consisting of seven large kettles full of indian corn peas prunes sturgeons eels and fat which they devoured having first sung me a song after their fashion these festivities over he entered on the serious business of his government and soon learned that his path was a thorny one he could find he says but a hundred men to resist the twenty-four hundred warriors of the iroquois and he begs the proprietary company which he represented to send him a hundred more who could serve as soldiers or labourers according to the occasion the company turned a deaf ear to his appeals they had lost money in canada and were grievously out of humour with it in their view the first duty of a governor was to collect their debts which for more reasons than one was no easy task while they did nothing to aid the colony in its distress they beset argenson with demands for the thousand pounds of beaver skins which the inhabitants had agreed to send them every year in return for the privilege of the fur trade a privilege which the iroquois war made for the present worthless the perplexed governor vents his feelings in sarcasm they the company take no pains to learn the truth and when they hear of settlers carried off and burned by the iroquois they will think it a punishment for not settling old debts and paying over the beaver skins i wish he adds they would send somebody to look after their affairs here i would gladly give him the same lodging and entertainment as my own another matter gave him great annoyance this was the virtual independence of montreal and here if nowhere else he and the bishop were of the same mind on one occasion he made a visit to the place in question where he expected to be received as governor-general but the local governor maisonneuve declined or at least postponed to take his orders and give him the keys of the fort argenson accordingly speaks of montreal as a place which makes so much noise but which is of such small account he adds that besides wanting to be independent the montrealists want to monopolize the fur trade which would cause civil war and that the king ought to interpose to correct their obstinacy in another letter he complains of d'alaboust who had preceded him in the government though himself a montrealist argenson says that on going out to fight the iroquois he left d'alaboust at quebec to act as his lieutenant that instead of doing so he had assumed to govern in his own right that he had taken possession of his absent superior's furniture draw his pay and in other respects behaved as if he never expected to see him again when i returned continues the governor i made him director in the council without pay as there was none to give him it was this i think that made him remove to montreal for which i do not care provided the glory of our master 
suffer no prejudice thereby these extracts may perhaps give an unjust impression of argenson who from the general tenor of his letters appears to have been a temperate and reasonable person his patience and his nervous system seem however to have been taxed to the utmost his pay could not support him the costs of living here are horrible he writes i have only two thousand crowns a year for all my expenses and i have already been forced to run into debt to the company to an equal amount part of his scanty income was derived from a fishery of eels on which sundry persons had encroached to his great detriment i see no reason he adds for staying here any longer when i came to this country i hoped to enjoy a little repose but i am doubly deprived of it on one hand by enemies without and incessant petty disputes within and on the other by the difficulty i find in subsisting the profits of the fur trade have been so reduced that all the inhabitants are in the greatest poverty they are all insolvent and cannot pay the merchants their advances his disgust at length reached a crisis i am resolved to stay here no longer but to go home next year my horror of dissension and the manifest certainty of becoming involved in disputes with certain persons with whom i am unwilling to quarrel oblige me to anticipate these troubles and seek some way of living in peace these excessive fatigues are far too much for my strength i am writing to monsieur the president and to the gentlemen of the company of new france to choose some other man for this government and again if you take any interest in this country see that the person chosen to command here has besides the true piety necessary to a christian in every condition of life great firmness of character and strong bodily health i assure you that without these qualities he cannot succeed besides it is absolutely necessary that he should be a man of property and of some rank so that he will not be despised for humble birth or suspected of coming here to make his fortune for in that case he can do no good whatever his constant friction with the head of the church distressed the pious governor and made his recall doubly a relief according to a contemporary writer laval was the means of delivering him from the burden of government having written to the president la moignon to urge his removal be this as it may it is certain that the bishop was not sorry to be rid of him the baron dubois de avogour arrived to take his place he was an old soldier of forty years service blunt imperative and sometimes obstinate to perverseness but full of energy and of a probity which even his enemies confessed he served a long time in germany while you were there writes the minister colbert to the marquis de tracy and you must have known his talents as well as his bizarre and somewhat impracticable temper on landing he would have no reception being as father lalemont observes an enemy of all ceremony he went however to see the jesuits and took a morsel of food in our refectory laval was prepared to receive him with all solemnity at the church but the governor would not go he soon set out on a tour of observation as far as montreal whence he returned delighted with the country and immediately wrote to colbert in high praise of it observing that the st lawrence was the most beautiful river he had ever seen it was clear from the first that while he had a prepossession against the bishop he wished to be on good terms with the jesuits he began by placing some of them on the council but they and laval were too closely united and if avogour thought to separate them 
he signally failed a few months only had elapsed when we find it noted in father lalemont's private journal that the governor had dissolved the council and appointed a new one and that other changes and troubles had befallen the inevitable quarrel had broken out it was a complex one but the chief occasion of dispute was fortunate for the ecclesiastics since it placed them to a certain degree morally in the right the question at issue was not new it had agitated the colony for years and had been the spring of some of argenson's many troubles nor did it cease with avogur for we shall trace its course hereafter tumultuous as a tornado it was simply the temperance question not as regards the colonists though here too there was great room for reform but as regards the indians their inordinate passion for brandy had long been the source of excessive disorders they drank expressly to get drunk and when drunk they were like wild beasts crime and violence of all sorts ensued the priests saw their teachings despised and their flocks ruined on the other hand the sale of brandy was a chief source of profit direct or indirect to all those interested in the fur trade including the principal persons of the colony in argenson's time laval launched an excommunication against those engaged in the abhorred traffic for nothing less than total prohibition would content the clerical party and besides the spiritual penalty they demanded the punishment of death against the contumacious offender death in fact was decreed such was the posture of affairs when avogur arrived and willing as he was to conciliate the jesuits he permitted the decree to take effect though it seems with great repugnance a few weeks after his arrival two men were shot and one whipped for selling brandy to indians an extreme though partially suppressed excitement shook the entire settlement for most of the colonists were in one degree or another implicated in the events thus punished an explosion soon followed and the occasion of it was the humanity or good nature of the jesuit lalemant a woman had been condemned to imprisonment for the same cause and lalemant moved by compassion came to the governor to intercede for her avogur could no longer contain himself and answered the reverend petitioner with characteristic bluntness you and your brethren were the first to cry out against the trade and now you want to save the traders from punishment i will no longer be the sport of your contradictions since it is not a crime for this woman it shall not be a crime for anybody and in this posture he stood fast with an inflexible stubbornness henceforth there was full license to liquor dealers a violent reaction ensued against the past restriction and brandy flowed freely among french and indians alike the ungodly drank to spite the priests and revenge themselves for the constraint of consciences of which they loudly complained the utmost confusion followed and the principles on which the pious colony was built seemed upheaved from the foundation laval was distracted with grief and anger he outpoured himself from the pulpit in threats of divine wrath and launched fresh excommunications against the offenders but such was the popular fury that he was forced to yield and revoke them disorder grew from bad to worse men gave no heed to bishop preacher or confessor writes father charlevoix the french have despised the remonstrances of our prelate because they are supported by the civil power says the superior of the ursulines he is almost dead with grief and pines away before our eyes 
laval could bear it no longer but sailed for france to lay his complaints before the court and urge the removal of avagour he had besides two other important objects as will appear hereafter his absence brought no improvement summer and autumn passed and the commotion did not abate winter was drawing to a close when at length outraged heaven interposed an awful warning to the guilty colony scarcely had the bishop left his flock when the skies grew portentous with signs of the chastisement to come we beheld gravely writes father lalamont blazing serpents which flew through the air borne on wings of fire we beheld above quebec a great globe of flame which lighted up the night and threw out sparks on all sides this same meteor appeared above montreal where it seemed to issue from the bosom of the moon with a noise as loud as cannon or thunder and after sailing three leagues through the air it disappeared behind the mountain whereof this island bears the name still greater marvels followed first a christian algonquin squaw described as innocent simple and sincere being seated erect in bed wide awake by the side of her husband in the night between the fourth and fifth of february distinctly heard a voice saying strange things will happen to-day the earth will quake in great alarm she whispered the prodigy to her husband who told her that she lied this silenced her for a time but when the next morning she went into the forest with her hatchet to cut a faggot of wood the same dread voice resounded through the solitude and sent her back in terror to her hut these things were as nothing compared with the marvel that befell a nun of the hospital mother catherine de saint augustin who died five years later in the odour of sanctity on the night of the fourth of february sixteen sixty three she beheld in the spirit four furious demons at the four corners of quebec shaking it with a violence which plainly showed their purpose of reducing it to ruins and this they would have done says the story if a personage of admirable beauty and ravishing majesty christ whom she saw in the midst of them and who from time to time gave rein to their fury had not restrained them when they were on the point of accomplishing their wicked design she also heard the conversation of these demons to the effect that people were now well frightened and many would be converted but this did not last long and they the demons would have them in time let us keep on shaking they cried encouraging one another and do our best to upset everything now to pass from visions to facts at half past five o'clock on the morning of the fifth writes father lalamont a great roaring sound was heard at the same time through the whole extent of canada this sound which produced an effect as if the houses were on fire brought everybody out of doors but instead of seeing smoke and flame they were amazed to behold the walls shaking and all the stones moving as if they would drop from their places the houses seemed to bend first to one side and then the other bells sounded of themselves beams joists and planks cracked the ground heaved making the pickets of the palisades dance in a way that would have seemed incredible had we not seen it in diverse places everybody was on the streets animals ran wildly about children cried men and women seized with fright knew not where to take refuge expecting every moment to be buried under the ruins of the houses or swallowed up in some abyss opening under their feet some on their knees in the snow 
cried for mercy and others passed the night in prayer for the earthquake continued without ceasing with a motion much like that of a ship at sea insomuch that sundry persons felt the same qualms of stomach which they would feel on the water in the forests the commotion was far greater the trees struck one against the other as if there was a battle between them and you would have said that not only their branches but even their trunks started out of their places and leapt on one another with such noise and confusion that the indians said that the whole forest was drunk mary of the incarnation gives a similar account as does also francis juchereau de saint ignace and these contemporary records are sustained to some extent by the evidence of geology a remarkable effect was produced on the st lawrence which was so charged with mud and clay that for many weeks the water was unfit to drink considerable hills and large tracts of forest slid from their places some into the river and some into adjacent valleys a number of men in a boat near tadoussac stared aghast at a large hill covered with trees which sank into the water before their eyes streams were turned from their courses waterfalls were levelled springs were dried up in some places while in others new springs appeared nevertheless the accounts that have come down to us seem a little exaggerated and sometimes ludicrously so as when for example mother mary of the incarnation tells us of a man who ran all night to escape from a fissure in the earth which opened behind him and chased him as he fled it is perhaps needless to say that spectres and phantoms of fire bearing torches in their hands took part in the convulsion the fiery figure of a man vomiting flames also appeared in the air with many other apparitions too numerous to mention it is recorded that three young men were on their way through the forest to sell brandy to the indians when one of them a little in advance of the rest was met by a hideous spectre which nearly killed him with fright he had scarcely strength enough to rejoin his companions who seeing his terror began to laugh at him one of them however presently came to his senses and said this is no laughing matter we are going to sell liquor to the indians against the prohibitions of the church and perhaps god means to punish our disobedience on this they all turned back that night they had scarcely lain down to sleep when the earthquake aroused them and they ran out of their hut just in time to escape being swallowed up along with it with every allowance it is clear that the convulsion must have been a severe one and it is remarkable that in all canada not a life was lost the writers of the day see in this a proof that god meant to reclaim the guilty and not destroy them at quebec there was for the time an intense revival of religion the end of the world was thought to be at hand and everybody made ready for the last judgment repentant throngs beset confessionals and altars enemies were reconciled fasts prayers and penances filled the whole season of lent yet as we shall see the devil could still find wherewith to console himself it was midsummer before the shocks wholly eased and the earth resumed her wonted calm an extreme drought was followed by floods of rain and then nature began her sure work of reparation it was about this time that the thorn which had plagued the church was at length plucked out avogor was summoned home he took his recall with magnanimity and on his way wrote at gaspe a memorial to colbert in which he commends new france to the attention of the king the st lawrence he says is at the entrance to what may be the greatest state in the world 
and in his purely military way he recounts the means of realizing this grand possibility three thousand soldiers should be sent to the colony to be discharged and turned into settlers after three years of service during these three years they may make quebec an impregnable fortress subdue the iroquois build a strong fort on the river where the dutch have a miserable wooden redoubt called fort orange albany and finally open a way by that river to the sea thus the heretics will be driven out and the king will be master of america at a total cost of about four hundred thousand francs yearly for ten years he closes his memorial by a short allusion to the charges against him and to his forty years of faithful service and concludes speaking of the authors of his recall laval and the jesuits by reason of the respect i owe their cloth i will rest content monseigneur with assuring you that i have not only served the king with fidelity but also by the grace of god with very good success considering the means at my disposal he had in truth borne himself as a brave and experienced soldier and he soon after died a soldier's death while defending the fortress of zrin in croatia against the turks end of chapter nine chapter ten of the old regime in canada by francis parkman jr this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten sixteen sixty one to sixteen sixty four laval and dumesnil though the proposals of Ovogor's memorial were not adopted it seems to have produced a strong impression at court for this impression the minds of the king and his minister had already been prepared two years before the inhabitants of canada had sent one of their number pierre boucher to represent their many grievances and ask for aid boucher had been an audience of the young king who listened with interest to his statements and when in the following year he returned to quebec he was accompanied by an officer named dumont who had under his command a hundred soldiers for the colony and was commissioned to report its condition and resources the movement seemed to betoken that the government was wakening at last from its long inaction meanwhile the company of new france federal lord of canada had also shown signs of returning life its whole history had been one of mishap followed by discouragement and apathy and it is difficult to say whether its ownership of canada had been more hurtful to itself or to the colony at the eleventh hour it sent out an agent invested with powers of controller general intendant and supreme judge to inquire into the state of its affairs this agent perron dumesnil arrived early in the summer of sixteen sixty and set himself with great vigour to his work he was an advocate of the parliament of paris an active aggressive and tenacious person of a temper well fitted to rip up an old abuse or probe a delinquency to the bottom his proceedings quickly raised a storm at quebec it may be remembered that many years before the company had ceded its monopoly of the fur trade to the inhabitants of the colony in consideration of that annual payment in beaver skins which had been so tardily and so rarely made the direction of the trade had at that time been placed in the hands of a council composed of the governor the superior of the jesuits and several other members various changes had since taken place and the trade was now controlled by another council established without the consent of the company and composed of the principal persons in the colony the members of this council with certain prominent merchants in league with them engrossed all the trade 
so that the inhabitants at large profited nothing by the right which the company had ceded and as the councillors controlled not only the trade but all the financial affairs of canada while the remoteness of their scene of operations made it difficult to supervise them they were able with little risk to pursue their own profit to the detriment both of the company and the colony they and their allies formed a petty trading oligarchy as pernicious to the prosperity of canada as the iroquois war itself the company always anxious for its beaver skins made several attempts to control the proceedings of the councillors and call them to account but with little success till the vigorous dumesnil undertook the task when to their wrath and consternation they and their friends found themselves attacked by wholesale accusations of fraud and embezzlement that these charges were exaggerated there can be little doubt that they were unfounded is incredible in view of the effect they produced the councillors refused to acknowledge dumesnil's power as controller intendant and judge and declared his proceedings null he retorted by charging them with usurpation the excitement increased and dumesnil's life was threatened he had two sons in the colony one of them perron de Maze, was secretary to avogour then on his way up the st lawrence to assume the government the other perron de touche was with his father at quebec towards the end of august this young man was attacked in the street in broad daylight and received a kick which proved fatal he was carried to his father's house where he died on the twenty ninth dumesnil charges four persons all of whom were among those into whose affairs he had been prying with having taken part in the outrage but it is very uncertain who was the immediate cause of de touche's death dumesnil himself the supreme judicial officer of the colony made complaint to the judge in ordinary of the company but he says that justice was refused the complaint suppressed by authority his allegations torn in pieces and the whole affair hushed at the time of the murder dumesnil was confined to his house by illness an attempt was made to rouse the mob against him by reports that he had come to the colony for the purpose of laying taxes but he sent for some of the excited inhabitants and succeeded in convincing them that he was their champion rather than their enemy some indians in the neighborhood were also instigated to kill him and he was forced to conciliate them by presents he soon renewed his attacks and in his quality of intendant called on the councillors and their allies to render their accounts and settle the long arrears of debt due to the company they set his demands at naught the war continued month after month it is more than likely that when in the spring of sixteen sixty two Avogour dissolved and reconstructed the council his action had reference to these disputes and it is clear that when in the following august laval sailed for france one of his objects was to restore the tranquillity which dumesnil's proceedings had disturbed there was great need for what with these proceedings and the quarrel about brandy quebec was a little hell of discord the earthquake not having as yet frightened it into propriety the bishop's success at court was triumphant not only did he procure the removal of ovargour but he was invited to choose a new governor to replace him this was not all for he succeeded in effecting a complete change in the government of the colony the company of new france was called upon to resign its claims and by a royal edict of april sixteen sixty eight all power legislative judicial and executive was vested in a council composed of the governor whom laval had chosen of laval himself 
and of five councillors an attorney-general and a secretary to be chosen by laval and the governor jointly bearing them with blank commissions to be filled with the names of the new functionaries laval and his governor sailed for quebec where they landed on the fifteenth of september with them came one godes du pont a royal commissioner instructed to inquire into the state of the colony no sooner had they arrived than laval and mezy the new governor proceeded to construct the new council mezy knew nobody in the council and was at this time completely under laval's influence the nominations therefore were made virtually by the bishop alone in whose hands and not in those of the governor the blank commissions had been placed thus for the moment he had complete control of the government that is to say the church was mistress of the civil power laval formed his council as follows jean bourdon for attorney-general royer de villeray juchereau de la ferte rouette d'autoy les gardieux de tilly and matthew d'amours for councillors and Pouvet de Maisneau for secretary. The royal commissioner, Godet, also took a prominent place at the board. This functionary was on the point of marrying his niece to a son of Robert Giffard, who had a strong interest in suppressing Dumesnil's accusations. Dumesnil had laid his statements before the commissioner, who quickly rejected them and took part with the accused of those appointed to the new council their enemy dumesnil says that they were incapable persons and their associate godet in defending them against worse charges declares that they were unlettered of little experience and nearly all unable to deal with affairs of importance this was perhaps unavoidable for except among the ecclesiastics education was then scarcely known in canada but if Laval may be excused for putting incompetent men in office, nothing can excuse him for making men charged with gross public offences, the prosecutors and judges in their own cause, and his course in doing so gives colour to the assertion of Dumesnil that he made up the council expressly to shield the accused and smother the accusation the two persons under the heaviest charges received the two most important appointments bourdon attorney-general and villeray keeper of the seals la ferte was also one of the accused of villeray the governor argenson had written in sixteen fifty nine some of his qualities are good enough but confidence cannot be placed in him on account of his instability in the same year he had been ordered to france to purge himself of sundry crimes wherewith he stands charged he was not yet free of suspicion having returned to canada under an order to make up and render his accounts which he had not yet done dumesnil says that he first came to the colony in sixteen fifty one as valet of the governor Lauzon who had taken him from the jail at rochelle where he was imprisoned for a debt of seventy-one francs as appears by the record of the jail of date july eleventh in that year from this modest beginning he became in time the richest man in canada he was strong in orthodoxy and an ardent supporter of the bishop and the jesuits he is alternately praised and blamed according to the partisan leanings of the writer bourdon though of humble origin was perhaps the most intelligent man in the council he was chiefly known as an engineer but he had also been a baker a painter a syndic of the inhabitants chief gunner at the fort and collector of customs for the company whether guilty of embezzlement or not he was a jealous devotee and would probably have died for his creed. 
like villeray he was one of laval's staunchest supporters while the rest of the council were also sound in doctrine and sure in allegiance in virtue of their new dignity the accused now claimed exemption from accountability but this was not all the abandonment of canada by the company in leaving dumesnil without support and depriving him of official character had made his charges far less dangerous nevertheless it was thought best to suppress them altogether and the first act of the new government was to this end on the twentieth of september the second day after the establishment of the council bourdon in his capacity of attorney-general rose and demanded that the papers of jean perron du menil should be seized and sequestered the council consented and to complete the scandal villeray was commissioned to make the seizure in the presence of bourdon to colour the proceeding it was alleged that dumesnil had obtained certain papers unlawfully from the greffe or record office as he was thought says godet to be a violent man bourdon and villeray took with them ten soldiers well armed together with a locksmith and the secretary of the council thus prepared for every contingency they set out on their errand and appeared suddenly at dumesnil's house between seven and eight o'clock in the evening the aforesaid sieur dumesnil further said godet did not refute the opinion entertained of his violence for he made a great noise shouted robbers and tried to rouse the neighbourhood outrageously abusing the aforesaid sieur de villeray and the attorney-general in great contempt of the authority of the council which he even refused to recognise they tried to silence him by threats but without effect upon which they seized him and held him fast in a chair me writes the wrathful dominil who had lately been their judge the soldiers stood over him and stopped his mouth while the others broke open and ransacked his cabinet drawers and chest from which they took all his papers refusing to give him an inventory or to permit any witness to enter the house some of these papers were private among the rest were he says the charges and specifications nearly finished for the trial of bourdon and villeray together with the proofs of their peculations extortions and malversations the papers were enclosed under seal and deposited in a neighbouring house whence they were afterwards removed to the council chamber and dumesnil never saw them again it may well be believed that this the inaugural act of the new council was not allowed to appear on its records on the twenty first villeray made a formal report of the seizure to his colleagues upon which by reason of the insults violences and irreverences therein set forth against the aforesaid sieur de villeray commissioner as also against the authority of the council it was ordered that the offending dumesnil should be put under arrest but godet as he declares prevented the order from being carried into effect dumesnil who says that during the scene at his house he had expected to be murdered like his son now though unsupported and alone returned to the attack demanded his papers and was so loud in threats of complaint to the king that the council were seriously alarmed they again decreed his arrest and imprisonment but resolved to keep the decree silent till the morning of the day when the last of the returning ships was to sail for france in this ship dumesnil had taken his passage and they proposed to arrest him unexpectedly on the point of embarkation that he might have no time to prepare and dispatch a memorial to the court thus a full year must elapse before his complaints could reach the minister and seven or eight months more before a reply could be returned to canada 
During this long delay the affair would have time to cool. Dumanil received a secret warning of this plan, and accordingly went on board another vessel, which was to sail immediately. The council caused the six cannon of the battery in the lower town to be pointed at her, and threatened to sink her if she left the harbour, but she disregarded them and proceeded on her way. On reaching France, Dumenil contrived to draw the attention of the minister Colbert to his accusations, and the treatment they had brought upon him. On this, Colbert demanded of Godet, who had also returned in one of the autumn ships, why he had not reported these matters to him. Godet made a lame attempt to explain his silence, gave his statement of the seizure of the papers, answered in vague terms some of Dumenil's charges against the Canadian financiers, and said that he had nothing to do with the rest. In the following spring, Colbert wrote as follows to his relative Terron, intendant of Marine. I do not know what report Monsieur Godet has made to you, but family interests and the connections which he has at Quebec should cause him to be a little distrusted. On his arrival in that country, having constituted himself chief of the council, he despoiled an agent of the Company of Canada of all his papers, in a manner very violent and extraordinary. And this proceeding leaves no doubt whatever that these papers contained matters the knowledge of which it was wished absolutely to suppress. I think it will be very proper that you should be informed of the statements made by this agent, in order that through him an exact knowledge may be acquired of everything that has taken place in the management of affairs. Whether Terron pursued the inquiry does not appear. Meanwhile, new quarrels had arisen at Quebec and the questions of the past were obscured in the dust of fresh commotions. Nothing is more noticeable in the whole history of Canada, after it came under the direct control of the Crown, than the helpless manner in which this absolute government was forced to overlook and ignore the disobedience and rascality of its functionaries in this distant transatlantic dependency. As regards Dumenil's charges, the truth seems to be that the financial managers of the colony, being ignorant and unpractised, had kept imperfect and confused accounts, which they themselves could not always unravel, and that some, if not all of them, had made illicit profits under cover of this confusion. That their stealings approached the enormous sum at which Dumenil places them is not to be believed. But, even on the grossly improbable assumption of their entire innocence, there can be no apology for the means, subversive of all justice, by which Laval enabled his partisans and supporters to extricate themselves from embarrassment. End of chapter 10《ジャプター11》11の「The Old Regime in Canada」by Francis Parkman Jr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11, 1657-1665 Laval and Mézy We have seen that Laval, when at court, had been invited to choose a governor to his liking. He soon made his selection. There was a pious officer, Safre de Mézy, major of the town and citadel of Caen, whom he had well known during his long stay with Berniers at the Hermitage. Mézy was the principal member of the company of devotees formed at Caen under the influence of Berniers and his disciples. In his youth he had been headstrong and dissolute. Worse still, he had been, it is said, a Huguenot. But both in life and doctrine, his conversion had been complete. 
and the fervid mysticism of Bernier's acting on his vehement nature had transformed him into a red-hot zealot. Towards the hermits and their chief, he showed a docility in strange contrast with his past history, and followed their inspirations with an ardour which sometimes overleapt its mark. Thus a Jacobin monk, a doctor of divinity, once came to preach at the church of St. Paul at Caen, on which, according to their custom, the Brotherhood of the Hermitage sent two persons to make report concerning his orthodoxy. Mézy and another military zealot, who, says the narrator, hardly knows how to read, and assuredly does not know their catechism, were deputed to hear his first sermon, wherein this Jacobin, having spoken of the necessity of the grace of Jesus Christ in order to the doing of good deeds, these two wiseacres thought that he was preaching Jansenism, and thereupon, after the sermon, the Sieur de Mézy went to the proctor of the ecclesiastical court and denounced him. His zeal, though but moderately tempered with knowledge, sometimes proved more useful than on this occasion. The Jacobin convent at Caen was divided against itself. Some of the monks had embraced the doctrines taught by Bernier's, while the rest held dogmas which he declared to be contrary to those of the Jesuits, and therefore heterodox. A prior was to be elected, and with the help of Bernier's his partisans gained the victory, choosing one Father Louis, through whom the hermitage gained a complete control in the convent. But the adverse party presently resisted, and complained to the provincial of their order, who came to Caen to close the dispute by deposing Father Louis. Hearing of his approach, Berniers asked aid from his military disciple, and de Mézy sent him a squad of soldiers, who guarded the convent doors and barred out the provincial. Among the merits of Mézy, his humility and charity were especially admired, and the people of Cain had more than once seen the town major staggering across the street with a beggar mounted on his back, whom he was bearing dry-shod through the mud in the exercise of those virtues. In this he imitated his master Bernier's, of whom similar acts are recorded. However dramatic in manifestation, his devotion was not only sincere but intense. Laval imagined that he knew him well. Above all others, Mézy was the man of his choice, and so eagerly did he plead for him that the king himself paid certain debts which the pious major had contracted, and thus left him free to sail for Canada. His deportment on the voyage was edifying, and the first days of his accession were passed in harmony. He permitted Laval to form the new council, and supplied the soldiers for the seizure of Dumenil's papers. A question arose concerning Montreal, a subject on which the governors and the bishops rarely differed in opinion. The present instance was no exception to the rule. Mézy removed Maisonneuve, the local governor, and immediately replaced him, the effect being that whereas he had before derived his authority from the seigneurs of the island, he now derived it from the governor-general. It was a movement in the interest of centralized power, and as such was cordially approved by Laval. The first indication to the bishop and the Jesuits that the new governor was not likely to prove in their hands as clay in the hands of the potter is said to have been given on occasion of an interview with an embassy of Iroquois chiefs, to whom Mézy, aware of their duplicity, spoke with a decision and haughtiness that awed the savages and astonished the ecclesiastics. He seems to have been one of those natures that run with an engrossing vehemence along any channel into which they may have been turned. At the hermitage he was all devotee, but climate and conditions had changed, and he or his symptoms changed with them. 
he found himself raised suddenly to a pose of command or one which was meant to be such the town major of caen was set to rule over a region far larger than france the royal authority was trusted to his keeping and his honour and duty forbade him to break the trust but when he found that those who had procured for him his new dignities had done so that he might be an instrument of their will his ancient pride started again into life and his headstrong temper broke out like a long smothered fire laval stood aghast at the transformation his lamb had turned wolf what especially stirred the governor's dudgeon was the conduct of bourdon villeray and autoy those faithful allies whom laval had placed on the council and who as mezy soon found were wholly in the bishop's interest on the thirteenth of february he sent his friend angoville major of the fort to laval with a written declaration to the effect that he had ordered them to absent themselves from the council because having been appointed on the persuasion of the aforesaid bishop of petraea who knew them to be wholly his creatures they wished to make themselves masters in the aforesaid council and have acted in diverse ways against the interests of the king and the public for the promotion of personal and private ends and have formed and fomented cabals contrary to their duty and their oath of fidelity to his aforesaid majesty he further declares that advantage had been taken of the facility of his disposition and his ignorance of the country to surprise him into assenting to their nomination and he asks the bishop to acquiesce in their expulsion and join him in calling an assembly of the people to choose others in their place laval refused on which mezy caused his declaration to be placarded about quebec and proclaimed by sound of drum the proposal of a public election contrary as it was to the spirit of the government opposed to the edict establishing the council and utterly odious to the young autocrat who ruled over france gave laval a great advantage i reply he wrote to the request which monsieur the governor makes me to consent to the interdiction of the persons named in his declaration and proceed to the choice of other councillors or officers by an assembly of the people that neither my conscience nor my honour nor the respect and obedience which i owe to the will and commands of the king nor my fidelity and affection to his service will by any means permit me to do so mezy was dealing with an adversary armed with redoubtable weapons it was intimated to him that the sacraments would be refused and the churches closed against him this threw him into an agony of doubt and perturbation for the emotional religion which had become a part of his nature though overborne by gusts of passionate irritation was still full of life within him tossing between the old feeling and the new he took a course which reveals the trouble and confusion of his mind he threw himself for counsel and comfort on the jesuits though he knew them to be one with laval against him and though under cover of denouncing sin in general they had lashed him sharply in their sermons there is something pathetic in the appeal he makes to them for the glory of god and the service of the king he had come he says on laval's solicitation to seek salvation in canada and being under obligation to the bishop who had recommended him to the king he felt bound to show proofs of his gratitude on every occasion yet neither gratitude to a benefactor nor the respect due to his character and person should be permitted to interfere with duty to the king since neither conscience nor honour permit us to neglect the requirement of our office and betray the interests of his majesty after receiving orders from his lips and making oath of fidelity between his hands 
he proceeds to say that having discovered practices of which he felt obliged to prevent the continuance he had made a declaration expelling the offenders from office that the bishop and all the ecclesiastics had taken this declaration as an offence that regardless of the king's service they had denounced him as a calumniator an unjust judge without gratitude and perverted in conscience and that one of the chief among them had come to warn him that the sacraments would be refused and the churches closed against him this writes the unhappy governor has agitated our soul with scruples and we have none from whom to seek light save those who are our declared opponents pronouncing judgment on us without knowledge of cause yet as our salvation and the duty we owe to the king are the things most important to us on earth and as we hold them to be inseparable the one from the other and as nothing is so certain as death and nothing so uncertain as the hour thereof and as there is no time to inform his majesty of what is passing and to receive his commands and as our soul though conscious of innocence is always in fear we feel obliged despite their opposition to have recourse to the reverend father casuists of the house of jesus to tell us in conscience what we can do for the fulfilment of our duty at once to god and the king the jesuits gave him little comfort Lalemont, their superior, replied by advising him to follow the directions of his confessor, a Jesuit, so far as the question concerned spiritual matters, adding that in temporal matters he had no advice to give. The distinction was illusory. The quarrel turned wholly on temporal matters, but it was a quarrel with a bishop. To separate in such case the spiritual obligation from the temporal, was beyond the skill of Mézy, nor would the confessor have helped him. Perplexed and troubled as he was, he would not reinstate Bourdon and the two councillors. The people began to clamour at the interruption of justice, for which they blamed Laval, whom a recent imposition of tithes had made unpopular. Mézy thereupon issued a proclamation in which after mentioning his opponents as the most subtle and artful persons in canada he declares that in consequence of petitions sent him from quebec and the neighboring settlements he had called the people to the council chamber and by their advice had appointed the sieur de chatier as attorney-general in place of bourdon bourdon replied by a violent appeal from the governor to the remaining members of the council, on which Mézy declared him excluded from all public functions whatever, till the king's pleasure should be known. The church and state still frowned on each other, and new disputes soon arose to widen the breach between them. On the first establishment of the council, an order had been passed for the election of a mayor and two aldermen, Echevins, for Quebec, which it was proposed to erect into a city, though it had only seventy houses and less than a thousand inhabitants. Repentigny was chosen mayor, and Maidry and Charon aldermen, but the choice was not agreeable to the bishop, and the three functionaries declined to act influence having probably been brought to bear on them to that end the council now resolved that a mayor was needless and the people were permitted to choose a syndic in his stead these municipal elections were always so controlled by the authorities that the element of liberty which they seemed to represent was little but a mockery on the present occasion after an unaccountable delay of ten months twenty-two persons cast their votes in presence of the council and the choice fell on charon the real question was whether the new syndic should belong to the governor or the bishop 
Charon leaned to the governor's party. The ecclesiastics insisted that the people were dissatisfied, and a new election was ordered, but the voters did not come. The governor now sent messages to such of the inhabitants as he knew to be in his interest, who gathered in the council chamber, voted under his eye, and again chose a syndic agreeable to him. Laval's party protested in vain. The councillors held office for a year, and the year had now expired. The governor and the bishop, it will be remembered, had a joint power of appointment, but agreement between them was impossible. Laval was for replacing his partisans, Bourdon, Villeray, Autoy, and La Ferte. Mézy refused, and on the 18th of September he reconstructed the council by his sole authority, retaining of the old councillors only Amours and Tilly, and replacing the rest by Denis, La Tesserie, and Perron de Mazet, the surviving son of Dumenil. Again Laval protested, but Mézy proclaimed his choice by sound of drum and caused placards to be posted, full, according to Father Lallemant, of abuse against the bishop. On this he was excluded from confession and absolution. He complained loudly, but our reply was, says the father, that God knows everything. This unanswerable but somewhat irrelevant response failed to satisfy him and it was possibly on this occasion that an incident occurred which is recounted by the bishop's eulogist latour he says that mezy with some unknown design appeared before the church at the head of a band of soldiers while laval was saying mass the service over the bishop presented himself at the door on which, to the governor's confusion, all the soldiers respectfully saluted him. The story may have some foundation, but it is not supported by contemporary evidence. On the Sunday after Mézy's coup d'état, the pulpits resounded with denunciations. The people listened, doubtless with becoming respect, but their sympathies were with the governor, and he, on his part, had made appeals to them at more than one crisis of the quarrel. He now fell into another indiscretion. He banished Bourdon and Villery, and ordered them home to France. They carried with them the instruments of their revenge, the accusations of Laval and the Jesuits against the author of their woes. Of these accusations one alone would have sufficed. Mézy had appealed to the people. It is true that he did so from no love of popular liberty, but simply to make head against an opponent, yet the act alone was enough, and he received a peremptory recall. Again Laval had triumphed. He had made one governor, and unmade two, if not three. The modest Levite, as one of his biographers calls him in his earlier days, had become the foremost power in Canada. Laval had a threefold strength at court, his high birth, his reputed sanctity, and the support of the Jesuits. This was not all, for the permanency of his position in the colony gave him another advantage. The governors were named for three years, and could be recalled at any time. But the vicar apostolic owed his appointment to the Pope, and the Pope alone could revoke it. Thus he was beyond reach of the royal authority, and the court was in a certain sense obliged to conciliate him. As for Mézy, a man of no rank or influence, he could expect no mercy. Yet, though irritable and violent, he seems to have tried conscientiously to reconcile conflicting duties, or what he regarded as such. The governors and intendants, his successors, received during many years secret instructions from the court to watch Laval, and cautiously prevent him from assuming powers which did not belong to him. It is likely that similar instructions had been given to Mézy, and that the attempt to fulfil them had aided to embroil him 
with one who was probably the last man on earth with whom he would willingly have quarrelled an inquiry was ordered into his conduct but a voice more potent than the voice of the king had called him to another tribunal a disease the result perhaps of mental agitation seized upon him and soon brought him to extremity as he lay gasping between life and death fear and horror took possession of his soul hell yawned before his fevered vision peopled with phantoms which long and lonely meditations after the discipline of loyola made real and palpable to his thought he smelt the fumes of infernal brimstone and heard the howlings of the damned he saw the frown of the angry judge and the fiery swords of avenging angels hurling wretches like himself writhing in anguish and despair into the gulf of unutterable woe he listened to the ghostly counsellors who besieged his bed bowed his head in penitence made his peace with the church asked pardon of laval confessed to him and received absolution at his hands and his late adversaries now benign and bland soothed him with promises of pardon and hopes of eternal bliss before he died he wrote to the marquis de tracy newly appointed viceroy a letter which indicates that even in his penitence he could not feel himself wholly in the wrong he also left a will in which the pathetic and the quaint are curiously mingled after praying his patron saint augustine with saint john saint peter and all the other saints to intercede for the pardon of his sins he directs that his body shall be buried in the cemetery of the poor at the hospital as being unworthy of more honoured sepulture he then makes various legacies of piety and charity other bequests follow one of which is to his friend major angoville to whom he leaves two hundred francs his coat of english cloth his camlet mantle a pair of new shoes eight shirts with sleeve buttons his sword and belt and a new blanket for the major's servant felix aubert is to have fifty francs with a grey jacket a small coat of grey serge which says the testator has been worn for a while and a pair of long white stockings and in a codicil he further leaves to angoville his best black coat in order that he may wear mourning for him his earthly troubles closed on the night of the sixth of may he went to his rest among the paupers and the priests serenely triumphant sang requiems over his grave end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of the old regime in canada by francis parkman this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twelve sixteen sixty two to sixteen eighty laval and the seminary that memorable journey of laval to court which caused the dissolution of the company of new france the establishment of the supreme council the recall of avaugour and the appointment of mezy had yet other objects and other results laval vicar apostolic and titular bishop of petrea wished to become in title as in fact bishop of quebec thus he would gain an increase of dignity and authority necessary as he thought in his conflicts with the civil power for he wrote to the cardinals of the propaganda i have learned from long experience how little security my character of vicar apostolic gives me against those charged with political affairs i mean the officers of the crown perpetual rivals and contemners of the authority of the church the reason was for the pope and the cardinals it may well be believed that he held a different language to the king to him he urged that the bishopric was needed to enforce order suppress sin and crush 
heresy both louis the fourteenth and the queen mother favoured his wishes but difficulties arose and interminable disputes ensued on the question whether the proposed bishopric should depend immediately on the pope or on the archbishop of rouen it was a revival of the old quarrel of gallican and ultramontane laval weary of hope deferred at length declared that he would leave the colony if he could not be its bishop in title and in sixteen seventy four after eleven years of delay the king yielded to the pope's demands and the vicar apostolic became the first bishop of quebec if laval had to wait for his mitre he found no delay and no difficulty in attaining another object no less dear to him he wished to provide priests for canada drawn from the canadian population fed with sound and wholesome doctrine reared under his eye and moulded by his hand to this end he proposed to establish a seminary at quebec the plan found favour with the pious king and a decree signed by his hand sanctioned and confirmed it the new seminary was to be a corporation of priests under a superior chosen by the bishop and besides its functions of instruction it was vested with distinct and extraordinary powers laval an organizer and a disciplinarian by nature and training would fain subject the priests of his diocese to a control as complete as that of monks in a convent in france the cure or parish priest was with rare exceptions a fixture in his parish whence he could be removed only for grave reasons and through prescribed forms of procedure here he was to a certain degree independent of the bishop laval on the contrary demanded that the canadian cure should be removable at his will and thus placed in the position of a missionary to come and go at the order of his superior in fact the canadian parishes were for a long time so widely scattered so feeble in population and so miserably poor that besides the disciplinary advantages of this plan its adoption was at first almost a matter of necessity it added greatly to the power of the church and as the colony increased the king and the minister conceived an increasing distrust of it instructions for the fixation of the cure were repeatedly sent to the colony and the bishop while professing to obey repeatedly evaded them various fluctuations and changes took place but laval had built on strong foundations and at this day the system of removable cures prevails in most of the canadian parishes thus he formed his clergy into a family with himself at its head his seminary the mother who had reared them was further charged to maintain them nurse them in sickness and support them in old age under her maternal roof the tired priest found repose among his brethren and thither every year he repaired from the charge of his flock in the wilderness to freshen his devotion and animate his zeal by a season of meditation and prayer the difficult task remained to provide the necessary funds laval imposed a tithe of one-thirteenth on all products of the soil or as afterwards settled on grains alone this tithe was paid to the seminary and by the seminary to the priests the people unused to such a burden clamoured and resisted and Mézy, in his disputes with the bishop, had taken advantage of their discontent. It became necessary to reduce the tithe to a twenty-sixth, which, as there was little or no money among the inhabitants, was paid in kind. Nevertheless, the scattered and impoverished settlers grudged even this contribution to the support of a priest whom many of them rarely saw, 
and the collection of it became a matter of the greatest difficulty and uncertainty how the king came to the rescue we shall hereafter see besides the great seminary where young men were trained for the priesthood there was the lesser seminary where boys were educated in the hope that they would one day take orders this school began in sixteen sixty eight with eight french and six indian pupils in the old house of madame couillard but so far as the indians were concerned it was a failure sooner or later they all ran wild in the woods carrying with them as fruits of their studies a sufficiency of prayers offices and chants learned by rote along with a feeble smattering of latin and rhetoric which they soon dropped by the way there was also a sort of farm school attached to the seminary for the training of a humbler class of pupils it was established at the parish of saint joachim below quebec where the children of artisans and peasants were taught farming and various mechanical arts and thoroughly grounded in the doctrine and discipline of the church the great and lesser seminary still subsist and form one of the most important roman catholic institutions on this continent to them has recently been added the laval university resting on the same foundation and supported by the same funds whence were these funds derived laval in order to imitate the poverty of the apostles had divested himself of his property before he came to canada otherwise there is little doubt that in the fullness of his zeal he would have devoted it to his favourite object but if he had no property he had influence and his family had both influence and wealth he acquired vast grants of land in the best parts of canada some of these he sold or exchanged others he retained till the year sixteen eighty when he gave them with nearly all else that he possessed to his seminary at quebec the lands with which he thus endowed it included the seigneuries of the petite nation the island of jesus and beaupre the last is of great extent and at the present day of immense value beginning a few miles below quebec it borders the st lawrence for a distance of sixteen leagues and is six leagues in depth measured from the river from these sources the seminary still draws an abundant revenue though its seigneurial rights were commuted on the recent extinction of the feudal tenure in canada well did laval deserve that his name should live in that of the old university which a century and a half after his death owed its existence to his bounty this father of the canadian church who has left so deep an impress on one of the communities which form the vast population of north america belonged to a type of character to which an even justice is rarely done with the exception of the canadian garneau a liberal catholic those who have treated of him will have seen him through a medium intensely romanist colouring hiding and exaggerating by turns both his actions and the traits of his character tried by the romanist standard his merits were great though the extraordinary influence which he exercised in the affairs of the colony were as already observed by no means due to his spiritual graces alone to a saint sprung from the haute noblesse earth and heaven were alike propitious when the vicar-general colombier pronounced his funeral eulogy in the sounding periods of bossuet he did not fail to exhibit him on the ancestral pedestal where his virtues would shine with redoubled lustre the exploits of the heroes of the house of montmorency exclaimed the reverend orator form one of the fairest chapters in the annals of old france the heroic acts of charity humility and faith achieved by a montmorency form one of the fairest in the annals of new france the combats victories and conquests of the montmorency in europe would fill whole volumes 
and so too would the triumphs won by a montmorency in america over sin passion and the devil then he crowns the high-born prelate with a halo of fourfold saintship it was with good reason that providence permitted him to be called francis for the virtues of all the saints of that name were combined in him the zeal of saint francis xavier the charity of saint francis of sales the poverty of saint francis of assisi the self-mortification of saint francis borgia but poverty was the mistress of his heart and he loved her with incontrollable transports the stories which colombier proceeds to tell of laval's asceticism are confirmed by other evidence and are no doubt true nor is there any reasonable doubt that had the bishop stood in the place of brebeuf or charles lalemont he would have suffered torture and death like them but it was his lot to strive not against infidel savages but against countrymen and catholics who had no disposition to burn him and would rather have done him reverence than wrong to comprehend his actions and motives it is necessary to know his ideas in regard to the relations of church and state they were those of the extreme ultramontanes which a recent jesuit preacher has expressed with tolerable distinctness in a sermon uttered in the church of notre dame at montreal on the first of november eighteen seventy two he thus announced them the supremacy and infallibility of the pope the independence and liberty of the church the subordination and submission of the state to the church in case of conflict between them the church to decide the state to submit for whoever follows and defends these principles life and a blessing for whoever rejects and combats them death and a curse these were the principles which laval and the jesuits strove to make good christ was to rule in canada through his deputy the bishop and god's law was to triumph over the laws of man as in the halcyon days of champlain and montmagny the governor was to be the right hand of the church to wield the earthly sword at her bidding and the council was to be the agent of her high behests france was drifting toward the triumph of the party des Vaux, the sinister reign of petticoat and cassock the era of maintenon and tellier and the fatal atrocities of the dragonades yet the advancing tide of priestly domination did not flow smoothly the unparalleled prestige which surrounded the throne of the young king joined to his quarrels with the pope and divisions in the church itself disturbed though they could not check its progress in canada it was otherwise the colony had been ruled by priests from the beginning and it only remained to continue in her future the law of the past she was the fold of christ the wolf of civil government was among the flock and laval and the jesuits watchful shepherds were doing their best to chain and muzzle him according to argenson laval had said a bishop can do what he likes and his action answered reasonably well to his words he thought himself above human law in vindicating the assumed rights of the church he invaded the rights of others and used means from which a healthy conscience would have shrunk all his thoughts and sympathies had run from childhood in ecclesiastical channels and he cared for nothing outside the church prayer meditation and asceticism had leavened and moulded him during four years he had been steeped in the mysticism of the hermitage which had for its aim the annihilation of self and through self-annihilation the absorption into god he had passed from a life of visions to a life of action earnest to fanaticism he saw but one great object the glory of god on earth 
he was penetrated by the poisonous casuistry of the jesuits based on the assumption that all means are permitted when the end is the service of god and as laval in his own opinion was always doing the service of god while his opponents were always doing that of the devil he enjoyed in the use of means a latitude of which we have seen him avail himself End of chapter 12